This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Chapter 21 The first words, when we had taken our seats, were spoken by my lady. Sergeant Cuff, she said, there was perhaps some excuse for the inconsiderate manner in which I spoke to you half an hour since. I have no wish, however, to claim that excuse. I say, with perfect sincerity, that I regret it if I wronged you. The grace of voice and manner with which she made him that atonement had its due effect on the sergeant. He requested permission to justify himself, putting his justification as an act of respect to my mistress. It was impossible, he said, that he could be in any way responsible for the calamity which had shocked us all, for this sufficient reason, that his success in bringing his inquiry to its proper end depended on his neither saying nor doing anything that could alarm Rosanna Spearman. He appealed to me to testify whether he had or had not carried that object out. I could and did bear witness that he had. And there, as I thought, the matter might have been judiciously left to come to an end. Sergeant Cuff, however, took it a step further, evidently, as you shall now judge, with the purpose of forcing the most painful of all possible explanations to take place between her ladyship and himself. I have heard a motive assigned for the young woman's suicide, said the sergeant, which may possibly be the right one. It is a motive quite unconnected with the case which I am conducting here. I am bound to add, however, that my own opinion points the other way. Some unbearable anxiety in connection with the missing diamond has, I believe, driven the poor creature to her own destruction. I don't pretend to know what that unbearable anxiety may have been, but I think, with your ladyship's permission, I can lay my hand on a person who is capable of deciding whether I am right or wrong. Is the person now in the house? my mistress asked, after waiting a little. The person has left the house, my lady. That answer pointed as straight to Miss Rachel as straight could be. A silence dropped on us which I thought would never come to an end. Lord, how the wind howled and how the rain drove at the window as I sat there, waiting for one or the other of them to speak again. Be so good as to express yourself plainly, said my lady. Do you refer to my daughter? I do, said Sergeant Cuff, in so many words. My mistress had her cheque-book on the table when we entered the room, no doubt to pay the sergeant his fee. She now put it back in the drawer. It went to my heart to see how her poor hand trembled. The hand that had loaded her old servant with benefits. The hand that, I pray God, may take mine when my time comes, and I leave my place for ever. I had hoped, said my lady, very slowly and quietly, to have recompensed your services, and to have parted with you, without Miss Verinder's name having been openly mentioned between us, as it has been mentioned now. My nephew has probably said something of this before you came into the room. Mr. Blake gave his message, my lady, and I gave Mr. Blake a reason. It is needless to tell me your reason. After what you have just said, you know, as well as I do, that you have gone too far to go back. I owe it to myself, and I owe it to my child, to insist on your remaining here, and to insist on your speaking out. The sergeant looked at his watch. If there had been time, my lady, he answered, I should have preferred writing my report instead of communicating it by word of mouth. But if this inquiry is to go on, time is of too much importance to be wasted in writing. I am ready to go into the matter at once. It is a very painful matter for me to speak of, and for you to hear. There my mistress stopped him once more. 
I may possibly make it less painful to you and to my good servant and friend here, she said, if I set the example of speaking boldly on my side. You suspect Miss Verinder of deceiving us all by secreting the diamond for some purpose of her own. Is that true? Quite true, my lady. Very well. Now, before you begin, I have to tell you, as Miss Verinder's mother, that she is absolutely incapable of doing what you suppose her to have done. Your knowledge of her character dates from a day or two since. My knowledge of her character dates from the beginning of her life. State your suspicion of her as strongly as you please. It is impossible that you can offend me by doing so. I am sure beforehand that, with all your experience, the circumstances have fatally misled you in this case. Mind, I am in possession of no private information. I am as absolutely shut out of my daughter's confidence as you are. My one reason for speaking positively is the reason you have heard already. I know my child. She turned to me and gave me her hand. I kissed it in silence. You may go on, she said, facing the sergeant again as steadily as ever. Sergeant Cuff bowed. My mistress had produced but one effect on him. His hatchet face softened for a moment, as if he was sorry for her. As to shaking him in his own conviction, it was plain to see that she had not moved him by a single inch. He settled himself in his chair, and he began his vile attack on Miss Rachel's character in these words. "'I must ask your ladyship,' he said, to look at this matter in the face, from my point of view as well as from yours. Will you please to suppose yourself coming down here in my place and with my experience? And will you allow me to mention very briefly what that experience has been? My mistress signed to him that she would do this. The sergeant went on. For the last twenty years, he said, I have been largely employed in cases of family scandal, acting in the capacity of confidential man. The one result of my domestic practice, which has any bearing on the matter now in hand, is a result which I may state in two words. It is well within my experience that young ladies of rank and position do occasionally have private debts which they dare not acknowledge to their nearest relatives and friends. Sometimes the milliner and jeweller are at the bottom of it. Sometimes the money is wanted for purposes which I don't suspect in this case, and which I won't shock you by mentioning. Bear in mind what I have said, my lady, and now let us see how events in this house have forced me back on my own experience, whether I liked it or not. He considered with himself for a moment, and went on, with a horrid clearness that obliged you to understand him with an abominable justice that favoured nobody. My first information relating to the loss of the moonstone, said the sergeant, came to me from Superintendent Seagrave. He proved to my complete satisfaction that he was perfectly incapable of managing the case. The one thing he said which struck me as worth listening to was this, that Miss Verinder had declined to be questioned by him, and had spoken to him with a perfectly incomprehensible rudeness and contempt. I thought this curious, but I attributed it mainly to some clumsiness on the superintendent's part, which might have offended the young lady. After that I put it by in my mind, and applied myself single-handed to the case. It ended, as you are aware, in the discovery of the smear on the door, and in Mr. Franklin Blake's evidence satisfying me that this same smear and the loss of the diamond were pieces of the same puzzle. So far, if I suspected anything, I suspected that the moonstone had been stolen, and that one of the servants might prove to be the thief. Very good. In this state of things, what happens? Miss Verinder suddenly comes out of her room and speaks to me. I observe three suspicious appearances in that young lady. 
She is still violently agitated, though more than four and twenty hours have passed since the diamond was lost. She treats me as she has already treated Superintendent Seagrave, and she is mortally offended with Mr. Franklin Blake. Very good again. Here, I say to myself, is a young lady who has lost a valuable jewel, a young lady also, as my own eyes and ears inform me, who is of an impetuous temperament. Under these circumstances, and with that character, what does she do? She betrays an incomprehensible resentment against Mr. Blake, Mr. Superintendent and myself, otherwise the very three people who have all, in their different ways, been trying to help her to recover her lost jewel. Having brought my inquiry to that point, then, my lady, and not till then, I begin to look back in my own mind for my own experience. My own experience explains Miss Verinder's otherwise incomprehensible conduct. It associates her with those other young ladies that I know of. It tells me she has debts which she daren't acknowledge and that must be paid. And it sets me asking myself whether the loss of the diamond may not mean that the diamond must be secretly pledged to pay them. That is the conclusion which my experience draws from plain facts. What does your ladyship's experience say against it? What I have said already, answered my mistress. The circumstances have misled you. I said nothing on my side. Robinson Crusoe, God knows how, had got into my muddled old head. If Sergeant Cuff had found himself at that moment transported to a desert island without a man Friday to keep him company or a ship to take him off, he would have found himself exactly where I wished him to be. Nota bene, I am an average good Christian when you don't push my Christianity too far. And all the rest of you, which is a great comfort, are, in this respect, much the same as I am. Sergeant Cuff went on. Right or wrong, my lady, he said. Having drawn my conclusion, the next thing to do was to put it to the test. I suggested to your ladyship the examination of all the wardrobes in the house. It was a means of finding the article of dress which had, in all probability, made the smear, and it was a means of putting my conclusions to the test. How did it turn out? Your ladyship consented, Mr. Blake consented, Mr. Abelwhite consented. Miss Verinder alone stopped the whole proceeding by refusing point-blank. That result satisfied me that my view was the right one. If your ladyship and Mr. Betteridge persist in not agreeing with me, you must be blind to what has happened here before you this very day. In your hearing, I told the young lady that her leaving the house, as things were then, would put an obstacle in the way of my recovering her jewel. You saw yourselves that she drove off in the face of that statement. You saw yourself that, so far from forgiving Mr. Blake for having done more than all the rest of you to put the clue into my hands, she publicly insulted Mr. Blake on the steps of her mother's house. What do these things mean? If Miss Verinder is not privy to the suppression of the diamond, what do these things mean? This time he looked my way. It was downright frightful to hear him piling up proof after proof against Miss Rachel, and to know, while one was longing to defend her, that there was no disputing the truth of what he said. I am, thank God, constitutionally superior to reason. This enabled me to hold firm to my lady's view, which was my view also. This roused my spirit, and made me put a bold face on it before Sergeant Cuff. Prophet, good friends, I beseech you by my example. It will save you from many troubles of the vexing sort. Cultivate a superiority to reason, and see how you pare the claws of all the sensible people when they try to scratch you for your own good. Finding that I made no remark, and that my mistress made no remark, Sergeant Cuff proceeded. 
Lord, how it did enrage me to notice that he was not in the least put out by our silence. There is the case, my lady, as it stands against Miss Verinder alone, he said. The next thing is to put the case as it stands against Miss Verinder and the deceased Rosanna Spearman taken together. We will go back a moment, if you please, to your daughter's refusal to let her wardrobe be examined. My mind being made up after that circumstance, I had two questions to consider next. First, as to the right method of conducting my inquiry. Second, as to whether Miss Verinder had an accomplice among the female servants in the house. After carefully thinking it over, I determined to conduct the quarry in what we should call at our office a highly irregular manner. For this reason, I had a family scandal to deal with, which it was my business to keep within the family limits. The less noise made, and the fewer strangers employed to help me, the better. As to the usual course of taking people in custody on suspicion and going before the magistrate and all the rest of it, nothing of the sort was to be thought of when your ladyship's daughter was, as I believed, at the bottom of the whole business. In this case, I felt that a person of Mr. Betteridge's character and position in the house, knowing the servants as he did and having the honour of the family at heart, which would be safer to take as an assistant than any other person whom I could lay my hand on. I should have tried Mr. Blake as well, but for one obstacle in the way. He saw the drift of my proceedings at a very early date, and with his interest in Miss Verinder, any mutual understanding was impossible between him and me. I trouble your ladyship with these particulars, to show you that I have kept the family secret within the family circle. I am the only outsider who knows it, and my professional existence depends on holding my tongue. Here I felt that my professional existence depended on not holding my tongue. To be held up before my mistress in my old age as a sort of deputy policeman was once again more than my Christianity was strong enough to bear. I beg to inform your ladyship, I said, that I never, to my knowledge, helped this abominable detective business in any way, from first to last, and I summon Sergeant Cuff to contradict me if he dares. Having given vent in those words, I felt greatly relieved. Her ladyship honoured me by a little friendly pat on the shoulder. I looked with righteous indignation at the sergeant to see what he thought of such a testimony as that. The sergeant looked back like a lamb, and seemed to like me better than ever. My lady informed him that he might continue his statement. I understand, she said, that you have honestly done your best in what you believe to be my interest. I am ready to hear what you have to say next. What I have to say next, answered the sergeant, relates to Rosanna Spearman. I recognise the young woman, as your ladyship may remember, when she brought the washing-book into this room. Up to that time I was inclined to doubt whether Miss Verinder had trusted her secret to anyone. When I saw Rosanna, I altered my mind. I suspected her at once of being privy to the suppression of the diamond. The poor creature has met her death by a dreadful end, and I don't want your ladyship to think, now that she's gone, that I was unduly hard on her. If this had been a common case of thieving, I should have given Rosanna the benefit of the doubt, just as freely as I should have given it to any of the other servants in the house. Our experience of the reformatory woman is that, when tried in service, and when kindly and judiciously treated, they prove themselves in the majority of cases to be honestly penitent and honestly worthy of the pains taken with them. But this was not a common case of thieving. It was a case, in my mind, of a deeply planned fraud, with the owner of the diamond at the bottom of it. Holding this view, the first consideration which naturally presented itself to me in connection with Rosanna was this. Would Miss Verinder be satisfied, begging your ladyship's pardon, with leading us all to think that the moonstone was merely lost, 
Or would she go a step further and delude us into believing that the moonstone was stolen? In the latter event, there was Rosanna Spearman, with the character of a thief, ready to her hand. The person of all others to lead your ladyship off, and to lead me off, on a false scent. Was it possible, I asked myself, that he could put his case against Miss Rachel and Rosanna in a more horrid point of view than this? It was possible, as you shall now see. I had another reason for suspecting the deceased woman, he said, which appears to me to have been stronger still. Who would be the very person to help Miss Verinder in raising money privately on the diamond? Rosanna Spearman. No young lady in Miss Verinder's position could manage such a risky matter as that by herself. A go-between she must have, and who so fit, again, as Rosanna Spearman? Your ladyship's deceased housemaid was at the top of her profession when she was a thief. She had relations, to my certain knowledge, with one of the few men in London, in the money-lending line, who would advance a large sum on such a notable jewel as the Moonstone, without asking awkward questions or insisting on awkward conditions. Bear this in mind, my lady, and now let me show you how my suspicions have been justified by Rosanna's own acts, and by the plain inferences to be drawn on them. He thereupon passed the whole of Rosanna's proceedings under review. You are already well acquainted with those proceedings as I am, and you will understand how unanswerably this part of his report fixed the guilt of being concerned in the disappearance of the moonstone on the memory of the poor dead girl. Even my mistress was daunted by what he said now. She made him no answer when he had done. It didn't seem to matter to the sergeant whether he was answered or not. On he went, devil take him, just as steady as ever. Having stated the whole case as I understand it, he said, I have only to tell your ladyship now what I propose to do next. I see two ways of bringing this inquiry successfully to an end. One of those ways I look upon as a certainty. The other, I admit, is a bold experiment and nothing more. Your ladyship shall decide. Shall we take the certainty first? My mistress made him a sign to take his own way and choose for himself. Thank you, said the sergeant. We'll begin with a certainty, as your ladyship is so good as to leave it to me. Whether Miss Verinder remains at Fritzinghall, or whether she returns here, I propose in either case to keep a careful watch on all her proceedings, on all the people she sees, on the rides and walks she may take, and on the letters that she may write or receive. What next? asked my mistress. I shall next, answered the sergeant, request your ladyship's leave to introduce into the house, as a servant in the place of Rosanna Spearman, a woman accustomed to private inquiries of this sort, for whose discretion I can answer. What next? repeated my mistress. Next, proceeded the sergeant, and last, I propose to send one of my brother officers to make an arrangement with that money-lender in London, whom I mentioned just now as formerly acquainted with Rosanna Spearman, and whose name and address your ladyship may rely on it, have been communicated by Rosanna to Miss Verinder. I don't deny that the course of action that I'm now suggesting will cost money and consume time, but the result is certain. We run a line round the moonstone and draw that line closer and closer till we find it in Miss Verinder's possession, supposing she decides to keep it. If her debts press and she decides on sending it away, then we have our man ready and we meet the Moonstone on its arrival in London. To hear her own daughter made the subject of such a proposal as this stung my mistress into speaking angrily for the first time. Consider your proposal declined in every particular, she said, and go on to your other way of bringing this inquiry to an end. My other way, 
said the sergeant, going on as easy as ever, is to try that bold experiment to which I have alluded. I think I have formed a pretty correct estimate of Miss Verinder's temperament. She is quite capable, according to my belief, of committing a daring fraud, but she is too hot and impetuous in temper, and too little accustomed to deceit as a habit, to act the hypocrite in small things, and to restrain herself under all provocations. Her feelings in this case have repeatedly got beyond her control, and at the very time when it was plainly in her interest to conceal them. It is on this peculiarity in her character that I now propose to act, and want to give her a great shock suddenly, under circumstances that will touch her to the quick. In plain English, I want to tell Miss Verinder, without a word of warning, of Rosanna's death, on the chance that her own better feelings will hurry her into making a clean breast of it. Does your ladyship accept that alternative? My mistress astonished me beyond all measure of expression. She answered him on the instant. Yes, I do. The pony chase is ready, said the sergeant. I wish your ladyship good morning. My lady held up her hand and stopped him at the door. My daughter's better feelings shall be appealed to as you propose, she said, but I claim the right as her mother of putting her to the test myself. You will remain here, if you please, and I will go to Fretzinghall. For once in his life the great cuff stood speechless with amazement, like an ordinary man. My mistress rang the bell and ordered her waterproof things. It was still pouring with rain, and the close carriage was gone, as you know, with Miss Rachel to Fritzinghall. I tried to dissuade her ladyship from facing the severity of the weather. Quite useless. I asked leave to go with her and hold the umbrella. She wouldn't hear of it. The pony chase came round, with the groom in charge. You may rely on two things she said to Sergeant Cuff in the call. I will try the experiment on Miss Verinder as boldly as you could try it yourself, and I will inform you of the result, either personally or by letter, before the last train leaves for London tonight. With that, she stepped into the chase, and, taking the reins herself, drove off to Fritzinghall. End of chapter 21 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Chapter 22 My mistress having left us, I had leisure to think of Sergeant Cuff. I found him sitting in a snug corner of the hall, consulting his memorandum book and curling up viciously at the corners of the lips. "'Making notes of the case?' I asked. "'No,' said the sergeant, looking to see what my next professional engagement is. "'Oho!' Uh -huh, I said. "'You think it's all over, then, here?' "'I think,' answered Sergeant Cuff, "'that Lady Verinder is one of the cleverest women in England.' I also think a rose much better worth looking at than a diamond. Where is the gardener, Mr. Betteridge? There was no getting a word more out of him on the subject of the moonstone. He had lost all interest in his own inquiry, and he would persist in looking for the gardener. An hour afterwards I heard them at high words in the conservatory, with the dog rose once more at the bottom of the dispute. In the meantime, it was my business to find out whether Mr. Franklin persisted in his resolution to leave us by the afternoon train. After having been informed of the conference in my lady's room, and of how it had ended, he immediately decided on waiting to hear the news from Fritzinghall. This very natural alteration in his plans, which with ordinary people would have led to nothing in particular, proved in Mr. Franklin's case to have one objectionable result. It left him unsettled, with a legacy of idle time on his hands, and in so doing it let out all the foreign sides of his character, one on top of another, like rats out of a bag. Now as an Italian Englishman, now as a German Englishman, 
and now as a French Englishman, he drifted in and out of all the sitting rooms in the house, with nothing to talk of but, but Miss Rachel's treatment of him, and with nobody to address himself to but me. I found him, for example, in the library, sitting under the map of modern Italy, and quite unaware of any other method of meeting his troubles, except the method of talking about them. I have several worthy aspirations, Betteridge, but what am I to do with them now? I am full of dormant good qualities, if Rachel would only have helped me to bring them out. He was so eloquent in drawing the picture of his own neglected merits, and so pathetic in lamenting over it when it was done, that I felt quite at my wit's end how to console him, when it suddenly occurred to me that here was a case for the wholesome application of a bit of Robinson Crusoe. I hobbled out to my own room, and hobbled back with that immortal book. Nobody in the library. The map of modern Italy stared at me, and I stared at the map of modern Italy. I tried the drawing room. There was his handkerchief on the floor, to prove that he had drifted in, and there was the empty room to prove that he had drifted out again. I tried the dining room, and discovered Samuel with a biscuit and a glass of sherry, silently investigating the empty air. A minute since, Mr. Franklin had rung furiously for a little light refreshment. On its production, in a violent hurry by Samuel, Mr. Franklin had vanished before the bell downstairs had quite done ringing with the pull he had given to it. I tried the morning room, and found him at last. There he was at the window, drawing hieroglyphics with his finger in the damp on the glass. "'Your sherry is waiting for you, sir,' I said to him. I might as well have addressed myself to one of the four walls in the room. He was down in the bottomless deep of his own meditations, past all pulling up. "'How do you explain Rachel's conduct, Betteridge?' was the only answer I received. Not being ready with the needful reply, I produced Robinson Crusoe, in which I am firmly persuaded some explanation might have been found if we had only searched long enough for it. Mr. Franklin shut up Robinson Crusoe and floundered into his German-English gibberish on the spot. "'Why not look into it?' he said, as if I had personally objected to looking into it. "'Why the devil lose your patience, Betteridge, when patience is all that's wanted to arrive at the truth? Don't interrupt me. Rachel's conduct is perfectly intelligible. If you will only do her the common justice to take the objective view first and the subjective view next, and the objective-subjective view to wind up with. What do we know? We know that the loss of the Moonstone on Thursday morning last threw her into a state of nervous excitement, from which she was not recovered yet. Do you mean to deny the objective view so far? Very well, then. Don't interrupt me. Now, being in a state of nervous excitement, how are we to expect that she should behave as she would otherwise have behaved to any of the people about her. Arguing in this way, from within outwards, what do we reach? We reach the subjective view. I defy you to controvert the subjective view. Very well, then. What follows? Good heavens, the objective-subjective explanation follows, of course. Rachel, properly speaking, is not Rachel, but somebody else. Do I mind being cruelly treated by somebody else? You are unreasonable enough, Betteridge, but you can hardly accuse me of that. How does it end? It ends, in spite of your confounded English narrowness and prejudice, in me being perfectly happy and comfortable. Where's the sherry? My head was by this time in such a condition that I was not quite sure whether it was my own head or Mr. Franklin's. In this deplorable state, I contrived to do what I take to have been three objective things. I got Mr. Franklin his sherry, I retired to my own room, and I solaced myself with the most composing pipe of tobacco I ever remember to have smoked in my life. Don't suppose, however, that I was quit of Mr. Franklin on such easy terms as these. Drifting again out of the morning room into the hall, he found his way to the offices next, smelt my pipe, and was instantly reminded that he had been simple enough to give up smoking for Miss Rachel's sake. In the twinkling of an eye he burst in on me with his cigar case, and came out strong on the one everlasting subject, in his neat, witty, unbelieving French way. "'Give me a light, Betteridge. Is it conceivable that a man can have smoked as long as I have, 
without discovering that there is a complete system for the treatment of women at the bottom of his cigar case. Follow me carefully, and I'll prove it in two words. You choose a cigar. You try it, and it disappoints you. What do you do upon that? You throw it away and try another. Now observe the application. You choose a woman, you try her, and she breaks your heart. Fool, take a lesson from your cigar case. Throw her away and try another. I shook my head at that. Wonderfully clever, I dare say, but my own experience was dead against it. In the time of the late Mrs. Betteridge, I said, I felt pretty often inclined to try your philosophy, Mr. Franklin, but the law insists on your smoking your cigar, sir, once you have chosen it. I pointed that observation with a wink. Mr. Franklin burst out laughing, and we were as merry as crickets until the next new side of his character turned up in due course. So things went on with my young master and me, and so, while the sergeant and the gardener were wrangling over the roses, we too spent the interval before the news came back from Fritzinghall. The pony chase returned a good half hour before I had ventured to expect it. My lady had decided to remain, for the present, at her sister's house. The groom brought two letters from his mistress, one addressed to Mr. Franklin and the other to me. Mr. Franklin's letter I sent to him in the library, into which refuge his driftings had now taken him for the second time. My own letter I read in my own room. A cheque, which dropped out when I opened it, informed me, before I had mastered the contents, that Sergeant Cuff's dismissal from the inquiry after the moonstone was now a settled thing. I sent to the conservatory to say that I wished to speak to the sergeant directly. He appeared with his mind full of the gardener and the dog rose, declaring that the equal of Mr. Begbie for obstinacy never had existed yet and never would exist again. I requested him to dismiss such wretched trifling as this from our conversation and to give his best attention to a really serious matter. Upon that he exerted himself sufficiently to notice the letter in my hand. Ah, he said in a weary way, you have heard from her ladyship. Have I anything to do with it, Mr. Betteridge? You shall judge for yourself, Sergeant. I thereupon read him the letter, with my best emphasis and discretion, in the following words. My good Gabriel, I request that you will inform Sergeant Cuff that I have performed the promise I made to him, with this result. So far as Rosanna Spearman is concerned, Miss Verinda solemnly declares that she has never spoken a word in private to Rosanna since that unhappy woman first entered my house. They never met, even accidentally, on the night when the diamond was lost, and no communication of any sort took place between them, from the Thursday morning when the alarm was first raised in the house, to this present Saturday afternoon when Miss Verinder left us. After telling my daughter suddenly, and in so many words, of Rosanna Spearman's suicide, this is what has come of it. Having reached that point, I looked up and asked Sergeant Cuff what he thought of the letter so far. I should only offend you if I expressed my opinion, answered the sergeant. Go on, Mr. Betteridge, he said with the most exasperating resignation. Go on. When I remembered that this man had had the audacity to complain of our gardener's obstinacy, my tongue itched to go on in other words than my mistress's. At this time, however, my Christianity held firm. I proceeded steadily with her ladyship's letter. Having appealed to Miss Verinder in the manner which the officer thought most desirable, I spoke to her next in the manner which I myself thought most likely to impress her. On two different occasions before my daughter left my roof, I privately warned her that she was exposing herself to suspicion of the most unendurable and most degrading kind. I have now told her, in the plainest terms, that my apprehensions have been realised. Her answer to this, on her own solemn affirmation, is as plain as words can be. In the first place, she owes no money, privately, to any living creature. In the second place, the diamond is not now, and never has been, in her possession, since she put it into the cabinet on Wednesday night. The confidence which my daughter has placed in me goes no further than this. 
She maintains an obstinate silence when I ask her if she can explain the disappearance of the diamond. She refuses with tears when I appeal to her to speak out for my sake. The day will come when you will know why I am careless about being suspected, and why I am silent even with you. I have done much to make my mother pity me, nothing to make my mother blush for me. Those are my daughter's own words. After what has passed between the officer and me, I think, stranger as he is, that he should be made acquainted with what Miss Verinder has said as well as you. Read my letter to him, and then place in his hands the cheque which I enclose. In resigning all further claim on his services, I have only to say that I am convinced of his honesty and his intelligence, but I am more firmly persuaded than ever that the circumstances in this case have fatally misled him. There the letter ended. Before presenting the cheque, I asked Sergeant Cuff if he had any remark to make. "'It's no part of my duty, Mr. Betteridge,' he answered, "'to make remarks on a case when I have done with it.' I tossed the cheque across the table to him. "'Do you believe in that part of her ladyship's letter?' I said indignantly. The sergeant looked at the cheque, and lifted up his dismal eyebrows in acknowledgment of her ladyship's liberality. "'This is such a generous estimate of the value of my time,' he said, that I feel bound to make some return for it. I'll bear in mind the amount of this cheque, Mr. Betteridge, when the occasion comes round for remembering it. What do you mean? I asked. Her ladyship has smoothed matters over for the present very cleverly, said the sergeant, but this family scandal is of the sort that bursts up again when you least expect it. We shall have more detective business on our hands, sir, before the moonstone is many months older. If those words meant anything, and if the manner in which he spoke them meant anything, it came to this. My mistress's letter had proved, to his mind, that Miss Rachel was hardened enough to resist the strongest appeal that could be addressed to her, and that she had deceived her own mother, good God, under what circumstances, by a series of abominable lies. How other people in my place might have replied to the sergeant, I don't know. I answered what he said in these plain terms. Sergeant Cuff, I consider your last observation an insult to my lady and her daughter. Mr. Betteridge, consider it as a warning to yourself, and you'll be nearer the mark. Hot and angry as I was, the infernal confidence with which he gave me that answer closed my lips. I walked to the window to compose myself. The rain had given over, and who should I see in the courtyard but Mr. Begby, the gardener, waiting outside to continue the dog-rose controversy with Sergeant Cuff. "'My compliments to the sergeant,' said Mr. Begby, the moment he set eyes on me. "'If he's minded to walk to the station, I'm agreeable to go with him.' "'What?' cries the sergeant behind me. "'Are you not convinced yet?' "'The devil a bit I'm convinced,' answered Mr. Begby. "'Then I'll walk to the station,' says the sergeant. "'Then I'll meet you at the gate,' says Mr. Begby. "'I was angry enough, as you know. "'But how was any man's anger to hold out against such an interruption as this?' "'Sergeant Cuff noticed the change in me, "'and encouraged it by a word in season. "'Come, come,' he said. "'Why not treat my view of the case as her ladyship treats it? "'Why not say... The circumstances have fatally misled me. To take anything as her ladyship took it was a privilege worth enjoying, even with the disadvantage of it having been offered to me by Sergeant Cuff. I cooled slowly down to my customary level. I regarded any other opinion of Miss Rachel than my lady's opinion or mine with a lofty contempt. The only thing I could not do was to keep off the subject of the moonstone. My own good sense ought to have warned me, I know, to let the matter rest. But there, the virtues which distinguish the present generation were not invented in my time. Sergeant Cuff had hit me on the raw, and, though I did look down upon him with contempt, the tender place still stings for all that. The end of it was that I perversely led him back to the subject of her ladyship's letter. I am quite satisfied myself, I said, 
but never mind that. Go on as if I was still open to conviction. You think Miss Rachel is not to be believed on her word, and you say we shall hear of the Moonstone again. Back your opinion, Sergeant, I concluded in an airy way. Back your opinion. Instead of taking offence, Sergeant Cuff seized my hand and shook it till my fingers ached again. I declare to heaven, says this strange officer solemnly, I would take to domestic service tomorrow, Mr. Betteridge, if I had a chance of being employed along with you. To say you are as transparent as a child, sir, is to pay the children a compliment which nine out of ten of them don't deserve. There, there, we won't begin to dispute again. You shall have it out of me on easier terms than that. I won't say a word more about her ladyship or about Miss Verinder. I'll only turn profit for once in a way and for your sake. I have warned you already that you haven't done with the Moonstone yet. Very well. Now I'll tell you, at parting, of three things which will happen in the future and which I believe will force themselves on your attention whether you like it or not. Go on, I said, quite unabashed and just as airy as ever. First, says the sergeant, you will hear something from the Yollands when the postman delivers Rosanna's letter at Cobb's Hole on Monday next. If he had thrown a bucket of cold water over me, I doubt if I could have felt it much more unpleasantly than I felt those words. Miss Rachel's assertion of her innocence had left Rosanna's conduct, the making of the new nightgown, the hiding of the smeared nightgown and all the rest of it, entirely without explanation, and this had never occurred to me till Sergeant Cuff forced it on my mind all in a moment. In the second place, proceeded the sergeant, you will hear of the three Indians again. You will hear of them in the neighbourhood, if Miss Rachel remains in the neighbourhood. You will hear of them in London, if Miss Rachel goes to London. Having lost all interest in the three jugglers, and having thoroughly convinced myself of my young lady's innocence, I took this second prophecy easily enough. So much for two of the three things that are going to happen, I said. Now for the third. Third and last, said Sergeant Cuff, you will, sooner or later, hear something of that money-lender in London, whom I have twice taken the liberty of mentioning already. Give me your pocket-book, and I'll make a note for you of his name and address, so that there may be no mistake about it if, if the thing really happens. He wrote accordingly on a blank leaf, Mr. Septimus Luca, Middlesex Place, Lambeth, London. There, he said, pointing to the address, are the last words on the subject of the Moonstone which I shall trouble you with for the present. Time will show whether I am right or wrong. In the meanwhile, sir, I carry away with me a sincere personal liking for you which I think does honour to both of us. If we don't meet again before my professional retirement takes place, I hope you will come and see me in a little house near London which I have got my eye on. There will be grass walks, Mr. Betteridge, I promise you, in my garden. And as for the white moss rose... The dale a bit you get the white moss rose to grow, unless you bud him on the dog rose first, cried a voice at the window. We both turned round. There was the everlasting Mr. Begbie, too eager for the controversy to wait any longer at the gate. The sergeant wrung my hand, and darted out into the courtyard, hotter still on his side. Ask him about the white moss rose when he comes back, and see if I have left him a leg to stand on, cried the great cuff, hailing me through the window in his turn. Gentlemen both, I answered, moderating them again, as I had moderated them once already. In the matter of the moss rose there is a great deal to be said on both sides. I might as well, as the Irish say, have whistled jigs to a milestone. Away they went together, fighting the battle of the roses, without asking or giving quarter on either side. The last I saw of them, Mr. Begby was shaking his obstinate head, and Sergeant Cuff had got him by the arm like a prisoner in charge. Ah, well, well. I own I couldn't help liking the sergeant, though I hated him all the time. 
Explain that state of mind if you can. You will soon be rid now of me and my contradictions. When I have reported Mr Franklin's departure, the history of Saturday's events will be finished at last. And when I have next described certain strange things that happened in the course of the new week, I shall have done my part of the story, and shall hand over the pen to the person who is appointed to follow my lead. If you are as tired of reading this narrative as I am of writing it, Lord, how shall we enjoy ourselves on both sides a few pages further on? End of chapter 22 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Chapter 23 I had kept the pony chase ready, in case Mr Franklin persisted in leaving us by the train that night. The appearance of the luggage, followed downstairs by Mr Franklin himself, informed me, plainly enough, that he had held firm to a resolution for once in his life. "'So you have really made up your mind, sir,' I said as we met in the hall. "'Why not wait a day or two longer and give Miss Rachel another chance?' The foreign varnish appeared to have all worn off Mr Franklin, now that the time had come for saying good-bye. Instead of replying to me in words, he put the letter which her ladyship had addressed to him into my hand. The greater part of it said over again what had been said already in the other communication received by me. But there was a bit about Miss Rachel, added at the end, which will account for the steadiness of Mr Franklin's determination, if it accounts for nothing else. "'You will wonder, I dare say,' her ladyship wrote, at my allowing my own daughter to keep me perfectly in the dark. A diamond worth twenty thousand pounds has been lost, and I am left to infer that the mystery of its disappearance is no mystery to Rachel, and that some incomprehensible obligation of silence has been laid on her by some person or persons utterly unknown to me, with some object in view which I cannot even guess. Is it conceivable that I should allow myself to be trifled with in this way? It is quite conceivable in Rachel's present state. She is in a condition of nervous agitation, pitiable to see. I dare not approach the subject of the moonstone again until time has done something to quiet her. To help this end, I have not hesitated to dismiss the police officer. The mystery which baffles us baffles him too. This is not a matter in which any stranger can help us. He adds to what I have to suffer, and he maddens Rachel if she only hears his name. My plans for the future are as well settled as they can be. My present idea is to take Rachel to London, partly to relieve her mind by a complete change, partly to try what may be done by consulting the best medical advice. Can I ask you to meet us in town? My dear Franklin, you, in your way, must imitate my patience and wait as I do for a fitter time. The valuable assistance which you have rendered to the inquiry after the lost jewel is still an unpardoned offence in the present dreadful state of Rachel's mind. Moving blindfold in this matter, you have added to the burden of anxiety which she has had to bear by innocently threatening her secret with discovery through your exertions. It is impossible for me to excuse the perversity that holds you responsible for consequences which neither you nor I could imagine or foresee. She is not to be reasoned with, she can only be pitied. I am grieved to have to say it, but for the present you and Rachel are better apart. The only advice I can offer you is to give her time. I handed the letter back, sincerely sorry for Mr Franklin, for I knew how fond he was of my young lady, and I saw that her mother's account of her had cut him to the heart. "'You know the proverb, sir,' was all I said to him. "'When things are at the worst, they're sure to mend. Things can't be much worse, Mr. Franklin, than they are now.' Mr. Franklin folded up his aunt's letter, without appearing to be much comforted by the remark that I had ventured on addressing to him. 
When I came here from London with that horrible diamond, he said, I don't believe there was a happier household in England than this. Look at the household now. Scattered, disunited, the very air of the place poisoned with mystery and suspicion. Do you remember that morning at the Shivering Sand when we talked about my Uncle Herncastle and his birthday gift? The Moonstone has served the Colonel's vengeance, Betteridge, by means which the Colonel himself never dreamt of. With that he shook me by the hand and went out to the pony chase. I followed him down the steps. It was very miserable to see him leaving the old place, where he had spent the happiest years of his life, in this way. Penelope, sadly upset by all that had happened in the house, came round crying to bid him good-bye. Mr. Franklin kissed her. I waved my hand as much as to say, You're heartily welcome, sir. Some of the other female servants appeared, peeping after him round the corner. He was one of those men whom all the women like. At the last moment I stopped the pony chase and begged as a favour that he would let us hear from him by letter. He didn't seem to heed what I said. He was looking round from one thing to another, taking a sort of farewell of the old house and grounds. "'Tell us where you're going to, sir,' I said, holding on by the chase, and trying to get at his future plans that way. Mr. Franklin pulled his hat down suddenly over his eyes. "'Going?' says he, echoing the word after me. I'm going to the devil. The pony started at the word as if it had felt a Christian horror of it. God bless you, sir. Go where you may, was all I had time to say before he was out of sight and hearing. A sweet and pleasant gentleman. With all his faults and follies, a sweet and pleasant gentleman. He left a sad gap behind him when he left my lady's house. It was dull and dreary enough when the long summer evening closed in on that Saturday night. I kept my spirits from sinking by sticking fast to my pipe and my Robinson Crusoe. The women, excepting Penelope, beguiled the time by talking of Rosanna's suicide. They were all obstinately of the opinion that the poor girl had stolen the moonstone, and that she had destroyed herself in terror of being found out. My daughter, of course, privately held fast to what she had said all along. Her notion of the motive, which was really at the bottom of the suicide, failed, oddly enough, just where my young lady's assertion of her innocence failed also. It left Rosanna's secret journey to Fritzinghall, and Rosanna's proceedings in the matter of the nightgown, entirely unaccounted for. There was no use in pointing this out to Penelope. The objection made about as much impression on her as a shower of rain on a waterproof coat. The truth is, my daughter inherits my superiority to reason, and in respect to that accomplishment has got a long way ahead of her own father. On the next day, Sunday, the close carriage which had been kept at Mr. Abelwhite's came back to us empty. The coachman brought a message for me and written instructions for my lady's own maid and for Penelope. The message informed me that my mistress had determined to take Miss Rachel to her house in London on the Monday. The written instructions informed the two maids of the clothing that was wanted, and directed them to meet their mistresses in town at the given hour. Most of the other servants were to follow. My lady had found Miss Rachel so unwilling to return to the house, after what had happened in it, that she had decided on going to London direct from Fritzing Hall. I was to remain in the country, until further orders, to look after things indoors and out. The servants left with me, were to be put on board wages. Being reminded by all this of what Mr. Franklin had said about our being a scattered and disunited household, my mind was led naturally to Mr. Franklin himself. The more I thought of him, the more uneasy I felt about his future proceedings. It ended in my writing by the Sunday's post to his father's valet, Mr. Jeffco, whom I had known in former years to beg he would let me know what Mr. Franklin had settled to do on arriving in London. The Sunday evening was, if possible, duller even than the Saturday evening. We ended the day of rest, as hundreds of thousands of people end it regularly, once a week in these islands. That is to say, we all anticipated bedtime, and fell asleep in our chairs. 
How the Monday affected the rest of the household, I don't know. The Monday gave me a good shake-up. The first of Sergeant Cuff's prophecies of what was to happen, namely that I should hear from the Yollands, came true on that day. I had seen Penelope and my lady's maid off in the railway with the luggage for London, and was pottering about the grounds when I heard my name called. Turning round, I found myself face to face with the fisherman's daughter, limping Lucy. Baiting her lame foot and her leanness, the last a horrid drawback in a woman, in my opinion, the girl had some pleasing qualities in the eye of a man. A dark, keen, clever face, and a nice, clear voice, and a beautiful brown head of hair counted among her merits. A crutch appeared in the list of her misfortunes, and a temper reckoned high in the sum total of her defects. "'Well, my dear,' I said, "'what do you want with me?' "'Where's the man you call Franklin Blake?' says the girl, fixing me with a fierce look as she rested herself on her crutch. "'That's not a respectful way to speak of any gentleman,' I answered. "'If you wish to inquire for my lady's nephew, you will please mention him as Mr. Franklin Blake.' She limped a step nearer to me, and looked as if she could have eaten me alive. "'Mr. Franklin Blake,' she repeated after me. "'Murderer Franklin Blake would be a fitter name for him.' My practice with the late Mrs. Betteridge came in handy here. Whenever a woman tries to put you out of temper, turn the tables and put her out of temper instead. They are generally prepared for every effort you can make in your defence, but that. One word does it as well as a hundred, and one word did it with limping Lucy. I looked her pleasantly in the face, and I said, Pooh! The girl's temper flamed out directly. She poised herself on her sound foot, and she took her crutch and beat it furiously three times on the ground. He's a murderer! He's a murderer! He's a murderer! He has been the death of Rosanna Spearman! She screamed out that answer at the top of her voice. One or two of the people at work in the grounds near us looked up, saw it was limping Lucy, knew what to expect from that quarter, and looked away again. "'He has been the death of Rosanna Spearman,' I repeated. "'What makes you say that, Lucy?' "'What do you care? What does any man care? Oh, if she had only thought of the men as I think, she might have been living now.' "'She always thought kindly of me, poor soul,' I said. And, to the best of my ability, I have always tried to act kindly by her. I spoke these words in as comforting manner as I could. The truth is, I hadn't the heart to irritate the girl by another of my smart replies. I had only noticed her temper at first. I noticed her wretchedness now. And wretchedness is not uncommonly insolent, you will find, in humble life. My answer melted limping Lucy. She bent her head down and laid it on the top of her crutch. I loved her, the girl said softly. She had lived a miserable life, Mr. Betteridge. Vile people had ill-treated her and led her wrong, and it hadn't spoiled her sweet temper. She was an angel. She might have been happy with me. I had a plan for our going to London together, like sisters, and living by our needles. That man came here and spoilt it all. He bewitched her. Don't tell me he didn't mean it and didn't know it. He ought to have known it. He ought to have taken pity on her. I can't live without him. And, oh, Lucy, he never even looks at me. That's what she said. Cruel, 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 I said. No man is worth fretting for in that way. And she said, there are men worth dying for, Lucy. And he is one of them. I had saved up a little money. I had settled things with father and mother. I meant to take her away from the mortification she was suffering here. We should have had a little lodging in London and lived together, like sisters. She had a good education, sir, as you know, and she wrote a good hand. She was quick at her needle. I have a good education, and I write a good hand. I am not as quick at my needle as she was, but I could have done. We might have got our living nicely. And what happens this morning? What happens this morning? Her letter comes and tells me that she is done with the burden of her life. Her letter comes and bids me good-bye forever. 
Where is he? cries the girl, lifting her head from the crutch and flaming out again through her tears. Where is this gentleman that I mustn't speak of except with respect? Ha, Mr. Betteridge, the day is not far off when the poor will rise against the rich. I pray heaven they may begin with him. I pray heaven they may begin with him. Here was another of your average good Christians, and here was the usual breakdown, consequent of that same average Christianity being pushed too far. The parson himself, though I own this is saying a great deal, could hardly have lectured the girl in the state she was in now. All I ventured to do was to keep her to the point, in the hope of something turning up which might be worth hearing. "'What do you want with Mr. Franklin Blake?' I asked. I want to see him. For anything particular? I have got a letter to give him. From Rosanna Spearman? Yes. Sent to you in your own letter? Yes. Was the darkness going to lift? Were all the discoveries that I was dying to make coming and offering themselves to me of their own accord? I was obliged to wait a moment. Sergeant Cuff had left his infection behind him. Certain signs and tokens, personal to myself, warned me that the detective fever was beginning to set in again. "'You can't see, Mr. Franklin,' I said. "'I must and will see him. He went to London last night.' Limping Lucy looked me hard in the face and saw that I was speaking the truth. Without a word more, she turned about again instantly towards Cobb's Hole. Stop, I said. I expect news of Mr. Franklin Blake tomorrow. Give me your letter and I'll send it on to him by the post. Limping Lucy steadied herself on her crutch and looked back at me over her shoulder. I am to give it from my hands into his hands, she said, and I am to give it to him in no other way. Shall I write and tell him what you have said? Tell him I hate him, and you will tell him the truth. Yes, yes, but about the letter. If he wants the letter, he must come back here and get it from me. With those words, she limped off on the way to Cobb's Hole. The detective fever burnt up all my dignity on the spot. I followed her and tried to make her talk. All in vain. It was my misfortune to be a man and Limping Lucy enjoyed disappointing me. Later in the day, I tried my luck with her mother. Good Mrs. Yolland could only cry and recommend a drop of comfort out of the Dutch bottle. I found the fisherman on the beach. He said it was a, a bad job and went on mending his net. Neither father nor mother knew more than I knew. The only way left was to try the chance, which might come with the morning, of writing to Mr. Franklin Blake. I leave you to imagine how I watched for the postman on Tuesday morning. He brought me two letters, one from Penelope, which I had hardly the patience enough to read, announced that my lady and Miss Rachel were safely established in London. The other, from Mr. Jeffco, informed me that his master's son had left England already. On reaching the metropolis, Mr. Franklin had, it appeared, gone straight to his father's residence. He arrived at an awkward time. Mr. Blake the Elder was up to his eyes in the business of the House of Commons and was amusing himself at home that night with the favourite parliamentary plaything which they call a private bill. Mr. Jeffco himself showed Mr. Franklin into his father's study. My dear Franklin, why do you surprise me in this way? Anything wrong? Yes, something wrong with Rachel. I am dreadfully distressed about it. Grieved to hear it, but I can't listen to you now. When can you listen? My dear boy, I won't deceive you. I can listen at the end of the session, not a moment before. Good night. Thank you, sir, and good night. Such was the conversation inside the study, as reported to me by Mr. Jeffco. The conversation outside the study was shorter still. Jeffco, see what time the tidal train starts tomorrow morning. At 6.40, Mr. Franklin. Have me called at five. Going abroad, sir? Going, Jeffco, wherever the railway chooses to take me. Shall I tell your father, sir? Yes, tell him at the end of the session. 
The next morning Mr. Franklin had started for foreign parts. To what particular place he was bound, nobody, himself included, could presume to guess. We might hear of him next in Europe, Asia, Africa or America. The chances were as equally divided as possible, in Mr. Jeffco's opinion, among the four quarters of the globe. This news, by closing up all prospects of my bringing Limping Lucy and Mr. Franklin together, at once stopped any further progress of mine on the way to discovery. Penelope's belief that her fellow servant had destroyed herself through unrequited love for Mr. Franklin Blake was confirmed, and that was all. Whether the letter which Rosanna had left to be given to him after her death did or did not contain the confession which Mr. Franklin had suspected her of trying to make to him in her lifetime, it was impossible to say. It might only be a farewell word, telling nothing but the secret of her unhappy fancy for a person beyond her reach. Or it might own the whole truth about the strange proceedings in which Sergeant Cuff had detected her from the time when the moonstone was lost to the time when she rushed to her own destruction at the shivering sand. A sealed letter it had been placed in Limping Lucy's hand, and a sealed letter it remained to me and to everyone about the girl, her own parents included. We all suspected her of having been in the dead woman's confidence. We all tried to make her speak. We all failed. Now one, and now another of the servants still holding to the belief that Rosanna had stolen the diamond and had hidden it, peered and poked about the rocks to which she had been traced, and peered and poked in vain. The tide ebbed and the tide flowed, the summer went on and the autumn came, and the quicksand which hid her body hid her secret too. The news of Mr. Franklin's departure from England on the Sunday morning, and the news of my lady's arrival in London with Miss Rachel on the Monday afternoon, had reached me, as you are aware, by the Tuesday's post. The Wednesday came and brought nothing. The Thursday produced a second budget of news from Penelope. My girl's letter informed me that some great London doctor had been consulted about her young lady, and had earned a guinea by remarking that she had better be amused. Flower shows, operas, balls, there was a whole round of gaieties in prospect, and Miss Rachel, to her mother's astonishment, eagerly took to it all. Mr. Godfrey had called, evidently as sweet as ever on his cousin, in spite of the reception he had met with when he had tried his luck on the occasion of the birthday. To Penelope's great regret, he had been most graciously received, and had added Miss Rachel's name to one of his lady's charities on the spot. My mistress was reported to be out of spirits, and to have held two long interviews with her lawyer. Certain speculations followed, referring to a poor relation of the family. One Miss Clack, whom I have mentioned in my account of the birthday dinner, as sitting next to Mr. Godfrey, and having a pretty taste in champagne. Penelope was astonished to find that Miss Clack had not called yet. She would surely not be long before she fastened herself on my lady as usual. And so forth and so forth, in the way that women have of girding at each other on and off paper. This would not have been worth mentioning, I admit, but for one reason. I hear that you are likely to be turned over to Miss Clack after parting with me. In that case, do me the favour of not believing a word she says if she speaks of your humble servant. On Friday nothing happened, except that one of the dogs showed signs of a breaking out behind the ears. I gave him a dose of syrup of buckhorn and put him on a diet of pot liquor and vegetables, until further orders. Uh, excuse my mentioning this. It has slipped in somehow. Pass over it, please. I am fast coming to the end of my offences against your cultivated modern taste. Besides, the dog was a good creature and deserved a good physicking, so he did indeed. Saturday, the last day of the week, is also the last day in my narrative. The morning's post brought me a surprise in the shape of a London newspaper. The handwriting in the direction puzzled me. I compared it with the moneylender's name and address as recorded in my pocket book, and identified it as once as being the writing of Sergeant Cuff. Looking through the paper, eagerly enough, after this discovery, I found an ink mark 
drawn round one of the police reports. Here it is at your service. Read it as I read it, and you will set the right value on the sergeant's polite attention in sending me the news of the day. Lambeth. Shortly before the closing of the court, Mr. Septimus Luca, the well-known dealer in ancient gems, carvings, intagli, etc., etc., applied to the sitting magistrate for advice. The applicant stated that he had been annoyed at intervals throughout the day by the proceedings of some of those strolling Indians who infest the streets. The persons complained of were three in number. After having been sent away by the police, they had returned again and again, and had attempted to enter the house on pretense of asking for charity. Warned off in the front, they had been discovered again at the back of the premises. Besides the annoyance complained of, Mr. Luca expressed himself as under some apprehension that robbery might be contemplated. His collection contained many unique gems, both classical and oriental, of the highest value. He had, only the day before, been compelled to dismiss a workman in ivory from his employment, a native of India, as we understood, on suspicion of attempted theft, and he felt by no means sure that this man and the street jugglers of whom he complained might not be acting in concert. It might be their object to collect a crowd and create a disturbance in the street, and, in the confusion thus caused, to obtain access to the house. In reply to the magistrate, Mr. Luca admitted that he had no evidence to produce of any attempt at robbery being, being in contemplation. He could speak positively to the annoyance and interruption caused by the Indians, but not to anything else. The magistrate remarked that, if the annoyance were repeated, the applicant could summon the Indians to that court, where they might easily be dealt with under the Act. As to the valuables in Mr. Luca's possession, Mr. Luca himself must take best measures for their safe custody. He would do well, perhaps, to communicate with the police, and to adopt such additional precautions as their experience might suggest. The applicant thanked his worship and withdrew. One of the wise ancients is reported, I forget on what occasion, as having recommended his fellow creatures to look to the end, looking to the end of these pages of mine, and wondering for some days past how I should manage to write it, I find my plain statement of facts coming to a conclusion most appropriately of its own self. We have gone on in this manner of the moonstone, from one marvel to another, and here we end with the greatest marvel of all, namely the accomplishment of Sergeant Cuff's three predictions, in less than a week from the time when he had made them. After hearing from the Yollands on the Monday, I had now heard of the Indians and heard of the moneylender in the news from London, Miss Rachel herself, remember, being also in London at the time. You see, I put things at their worst, even when they tell dead against my own view. If you desert me and side with the sergeant on the evidence before you, if the only rational explanation you can see is that Miss Rachel and Mr. Luca must have got together, and that the moonstone must now be in pledge in the moneylender's house, I own I can't blame you for arriving at that conclusion. In the dark, I have brought you thus far. In the dark, I am compelled to leave you, with my best respects. Why compelled, it may be asked? Why not take the persons who have gone along with me so far up into those regions of superior enlightenment in which I sit myself? In answer to this, I can only state that I am acting under orders, and that those orders have been given to me, as I understand, in the interests of truth. I am forbidden to tell more in this narrative than I knew myself at the time. Or, to put it plainer, I am to keep strictly within the limits of my own experience, and am not to inform you of what other persons told me, for the very sufficient reason that you are to have the information from those other persons themselves at first hand. In this matter of the Moonstone, the plan is not to present reports, but to produce witnesses. I picture to myself a member of the family reading these pages fifty years hence. Lord, what a compliment he will feel it to be asked to take nothing on hearsay, and to be treated in all respects like a judge on the bench. At this place, then, we part, for the present at least, after long journeying together with companionable feeling, I hope, on both sides. 
the devil's dance of the Indian diamond has threaded its way to London, and to London you must go after it, leaving me at the country house. Please to excuse the faults of this composition, my talking so much of myself and being too familiar, I'm afraid, with you. I mean no harm, and I drink most respectfully, having just done dinner, to your health and prosperity, in a tankard of her ladyship's ale. May you find in these leaves of my writing what Robinson Crusoe found in, in his experience on the desert island, namely, something to comfort yourself from and to set in the description of good and evil on the credit side of the account. Farewell. End of chapter 23. End of the first period. The Moonstone, Part 24. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone, by Wilkie Collins. Read by Christina Becker. Second Period. The Discovery of the Truth. 1848 till 1849. The events related in several narratives. First narrative. Contributed by Miss Cluck, niece of the late Sir John Verinda. Chapter 1. I am indebted to my parents, both now in heaven, for having had habits of order and regularity instilled into me at a very early age. In that happy bygone time, I was taught to keep my hair tidy at all, all hours of the day and night, and to fold up every article of my clothing carefully, in the same order, on the same chair, in the same place, at the foot of the bed, before retiring to rest. An entry of the day's events in my little diary invariably preceded the folding up. The evening hymn, repeated in bed, invariably followed the folding up, and the sweet sleep of childhood invariably followed the evening hymn. In later life, alas, the hymn has been succeeded by sad and bitter meditations, and the sweet sleep has been but ill exchanged for the broken slumbers which haunt the uneasy pillow of care. On the other hand, I have continued to fold my clothes and to keep my little diary. The former habit links me to, the, to my happy childhood before Papa was ruined. The latter habit is so mainly useful in helping me to discipline the fallen nature which we all inherit from Adam, has unexpectedly proved important to my humble interests in quite another way. It has enabled poor me to serve the caprice of a wealthy member of the family into which my late uncle married. I am fortunate enough to be useful to Mr. Franklin Blake. I have been cut off from all news of my relatives by marriage for some time past. When we are isolated and poor, we are not infrequently forgotten. I am now living, for economy's sake, in a little town in Brittany, inhabited by a select circle of serious English friends, and possessed of the inestimable advantages of a Protestant clergyman and a cheap market. In this retirement, a Patmos amid the howling ocean of popery that surrounds us, a letter from England has reached me at last. I find my insignificant existence suddenly remembered by Mr. Franklin Blake. My wealthy relative, would that I could add my spiritually wealthy relative, writes without even an attempt at disguising that he wants something of me. The whim has seized him to stir up the deplorable scandal of the Moonstone, and I am to help him by writing the account of what I myself witnessed while visiting at Aunt Verinder's house in London. Peculiarly remuneration is offered to me with the want of feeling peculiar to the rich, I am to reopen wounds that time has barely closed. I am to recall the most intensely painful remembrances, 
and this done I am to feel myself compensated by a new lacceration in the shape of Mr. Blake's check. My nature is weak. It cost me a hard struggle before Christian humility conquered sinful pride and self-denial accepted the check. Without my diary, I doped, pray, let me express it in the grossest terms, if I could have honestly earned my money. With my diary, the poor laborer who forgives Mr. Blake for insulting her is worthy of her hire. Nothing escaped me at the time I was visiting dear Aunt Verinda. Everything was entered, thanks to my early training, day by day as it happened, and everything down to the smallest particular shall be told here. My sacred regard for truth is, thank God, far above my respect for persons. It will be easy for Mr. Blake to suppress what may not prove to be sufficiently flattering in these pages to the person chiefly concerned in them. He has purchased my time, but not even his wealth can purchase my conscience too. Note, added by Franklin Blake. Miss Cluck may make her mind quite easy on this point. Nothing will be added, altered or removed in her manuscript or in any of the other manuscripts which pass through my hands. Whatever opinions any of the writers may express, whatever peculiarities of treatment men may mark, and perhaps in a literary sense disfigure the narratives which I am now collecting, not a line will be tampered with anywhere, from first to last. As genuine documents they are sent to me, and as genuine documents I shall preserve them endorsed by the attestations of witnesses who can speak to the facts. It only remains to be added that the person chiefly concerned in Mrs. Clark's narrative is happy enough at the present moment not only to brave the smartest exercise of Miss Clark's pen, but even to recognize its unquestionable value and as an instrument for the exhibition of Miss Clark's character. End of the note my diary informs me that I was accidentally passing Aunt Verinder's house in Montagu Square on Monday, 3rd of July, 1848. Seeing the shutters opened and the blinds drawn up, I felt that it would be an act of polite attention to knock and make inquiries. The person who answered the door informed me that my aunt and her daughter, I really cannot call her my cousin, had arrived from the country a week since, and meditated making some stay in London. I sent up a message at once, declining to disturb them, and only begging to know whether I could be of any use. The person who answered the door took my message in insolent silence, and left me standing in the hall. She is the daughter of a heathen old man, named Betteridge, long too long tolerated in my aunt's family. I sat down in the hall to wait for my answer, and, having always a few tracts in my bag, I selected one which proved to be quite providentially applicable to the person who answered the door. The hall was dirty, and the chair was hard, but the blessed consciousness of returning good for evil raised me quite above any trifling considerations of that kind. The tract was one of a series addressed to young women on the sinfulness of dress. In style it was devoutly familiar. Its title was A Word With You On Your Cap Ribbons. My lady is much obliged and begs you will come and lunch tomorrow at two. I passed over the manner in which she gave her message and the dreadful boldness of her look. I thanked this young castaway and I said, in a tone of Christian interest, Will you favor me by accepting a tract? She looked at the title. Is it written by a man or a woman, miss? If it's written by a woman, I had rather not read it on that account. If it's written by a man, I beg to inform him that he knows nothing about it. She handed me back the tract and opened the door. We must sow the good seed somehow. I waited till the door was shut on me and slipped the tract into the letter box. When I had dropped another tract, through the area railings, I felt relieved, in some small degree, of a heavy responsibility towards others. We had a meeting that evening 
of the select committee of the Mother's Small Clothes Conversion Society. The object of this excellent charity is, as all serious people know, to rescue unredeemed father's trousers from the pawnbroker, and to prevent their resumption on the part of the irreclaimable parent, by abridging them immediately to suit the proportions of the innocent son. I was a member at that time of the select committee, and I mention the society here because my precious and admirable friend, Mr. Godfrey Ablevite, was associated with her work of moral and natural usefulness. I had expected to see him in the boardroom on the Monday evening, of which I am now writing, and had proposed to tell him, when we met, of dear Aunt Verinder's arrival in London. To my great disappointment, he never appeared. On my expressing a feeling of surprise at his absence, my sisters of the committee all looked up together from their trousers. We had a great pressure of business that night, and asked in amazement, if I had not heard the news. I acknowledged my ignorance, and was then told for the first time of an event which forms, so to speak, the starting point of this narrative. On the previous Friday, two gentlemen, occupying widely different positions in society, had been the victims of an outrage which had startled all London. One of the gentlemen was Mr. Septimus Luca of Lambeth, the other was Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. Living in my present isolation, I have no means of introducing the newspaper account of the outrage into my narrative. I was also deprived at the time of the inestimable advantage of hearing the events related by the fervid eloquence of Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. All I can do is to state the facts as they were stated on that Monday evening to me. Proceeding on the plan which I have been taught from infancy, to adopt in folding of my clothes. Everything shall be put neatly, and everything shall be put in its place. These lines are written by a poor weak woman, from a poor weak woman who will be cruel enough to expect more. The date thanks to my dear parents, no dictionary that ever was written can be more particular that I am about dates, was Friday, June the 13th, 1848. Early on that memorable day, our gifted Mr. Godfrey happened to be cashing a check at a banking house in Lombard Street. The name of the firm is accidentally blotted in my diary, and my sacred regard for truth forbids me to hazard a guess in a matter of this kind. Fortunately, the name of the firm doesn't matter. What does matter is a circumstance that occurred when Mr. Godfrey had transacted his business. On gaining the door, he encountered a gentleman, a perfect stranger to him, who was accidentally leaving the office exactly at the same time as himself. A momentary contest of politeness ensued between them as to who should be the first to pass through the door of the bank. The stranger insisted on making Mr. Godfrey's precede him. Mr. Godfrey said a few civil words. They bowed and parted in the street. Thoughtless and superficial people may say, here is surely a very trumpery little incident related in an absurdly circumstantial manner. Oh, my young friends and fellow sinners, beware of presuming to exercise your poor carnal reason. Oh, be morally tidy. Let your face be as your stockings and your stockings as your face. Both ever spotless and both ready to put on at a moment's notice. I beg a thousand pardons. I have fallen insensibly into my Sunday school style, most inappropriate in such a record as this. Let me try to be worldly. Let me say that trifles in this case as in many others led to terrible results. Merely premising that the polite stranger was Mr. Luca of Lambeth, we will now follow Mr. Godfrey home to his residence at Kilbourne. He found, waiting for him in the hall, a poorly clad but delicate and interesting-looking little boy. The boy handed him a letter, merely in mentioning that he had been entrusted with it by an old lady whom he did not know, and who had given him no instructions to wait for an answer. Such incidents as these were not uncommon in Mr. Godfrey's large experience as a promoter of public charities. 
he let the boy go and opened the letter. The handwriting was entirely unfamiliar to him. It requested his attendance within an hour's time at a house in Northumberland Street, Strand, which he had never had occasion to enter before. The object sought was to obtain from the worthy manager certain details on the subject of Mother's Small Clothes Convention Society, and the information was wanted by an elderly lady who proposed adding largely to the resources of the charity, if her questions were met by satisfactory replies. She mentioned her name, and she added that the shortness of her stay in London prevented her from giving any longer notice to the eminent philanthropist whom she addressed. Ordinary people might have hesitated before setting aside their own engagements to suit the convenience of a stranger. The Christian hero never hesitates where good is to be done. Mr. Godfrey instantly turned back and proceeded to the house in Northumberland Street. A most respectable, though somewhat corpulent man answered the door, and, on hearing Mr. Godfrey's name, immediately conducted him into an empty apartment at the back, on the driving-room floor. He noticed two unusual things on entering the room. One of them was a faint odor of musk and camphor. The other was an ancient oriental manuscript, richly illuminated with Indian figures and devices that lay open to inspection on a table. He was looking at the book, the position of which caused him to stand with his back turned towards the closed folding doors communicating with the front room, when, without the slightest previous noise to warn him, he felt himself suddenly seized round the neck from behind. He had just time to notice that the arm round his neck was naked and of a tawny brown color. Before his eyes were bandaged, his mouth was gauged, and he was thrown helpless on the floor by, as he judged, two men. A third riffled his pockets, and if, as a lady, I may venture to use such an expression, searched him without ceremony, throw and throw to his skin. Here I should greatly enjoy saying a few cheering words on the devout confidence which could alone have sustained Mr. Godfrey in an emergency so terrible as this. Perhaps, however, the position and appearance of my admirable friend at the culminating period of the outrage, as above described, are hardly within the proper limits of female discussion. Let me pass over the next few moments, and return to Mr. Godfrey at the time when the odious search of his person had been completed. The outrage had been perpetrated throughout in dead silence. At the end of it some words were exchanged among the invisible virtues, in a language which he did not understand, but in tones which were plainly expressive, to his cultivated ear, of disappointment and rage. He was suddenly lifted from the ground, placed in a chair, and bound there hand and foot. The next moment he felt the air flowing in from the open door, listened, and concluded that he was alone again in the room. An interval elapsed, and he heard a sound below, like the rustling sound of a woman's dress. It advanced up the stairs and stopped. A female scream rent the atmosphere of guilt. A man's voice below exclaimed, Hullo! A man's feet ascended the stairs. Mr. Godfrey felt Christian fingers unfastening his bandage and extracting his gag. He looked in amazement at two respectable strangers and faintly articulated. What does it mean? The two respectable strangers looked back and said, Exactly the question we were going to ask you. The inevitable explanation followed. No, let me be scrupulously particular. Sal volatile and water followed to compose dear Mr. Godfrey's nerves. The explanation came next. It appeared from the statement of the landlord and landlady of the house, persons of good repute in the neighborhood, that their first and second floor apartments had been engaged on the previous day, for a week certain, by a most respectable looking gentleman, the same who has been already described as answering the door to Mr. Godfrey's knock. The gentleman had paid the week's rent and all the week's extras in advance, 
stating that the apartments were wanted for three oriental noblemen, friends of his, who were visiting England for the first time. Early in the morning of the outrage, two of the oriental strangers, accompanied by their respectable English friend, took possession of the apartments. The third was expected to join them shortly, and the luggage, reported as very bulky, was announced to follow when it had passed through the custom house, late in the afternoon. Not more than ten minutes previous to Mr. Gottfried's visit, the third foreigner had arrived. Nothing out of the common had happened, to the knowledge of the landlord and landlady downstairs, until within the last five minutes, when they had seen the three foreigners, accompanied by their respectable English friend, all leave the house together, walking quietly in the direction of the stand. Remembering that a visitor had called, and not having seen the visitor also leave the house, the landlady had thought it rather strange that the gentleman should be left by himself upstairs. After a short discussion with her husband, she had considered it advisable to ascertain whether anything was wrong. The result had followed, as I have already attempted to describe it, and there the explanation of the landlord and the landlady came to an end. An investigation was next made in the room. Dear Mr. Godfrey's property was found scattered in all directions. When the articles were collected, however, nothing was missing. His watch, chain, purse, keys, pocket handkerchief, notebook, and all his loose papers had been closely examined, and had then been left unharmed to be resumed by the owner. In the same way, not the smallest morsel of property belonging to the proprietors of the house had been abstracted. The oriental noblemen had removed their own illuminated manuscript and had removed nothing else. What did it mean? Taking the worldly point of view, it appeared to mean that Mr. Godfrey had been the victim of some incomprehensible error committed by certain unknown men. A dark conspiracy was on foot in the midst of us, and our beloved and innocent friend had been entangled in its meshes. When the Christian hero of a hundred charitable victories plunges into a pitfall that has been dug for him by mistake, oh, what a warning it is to the rest of us to be unceasingly on our guard! How soon may our own evil passions prove to be oriental noblemen who pounce on us unawares! I could write pages of affectionate warning on this one theme, but, alas, I am not permitted to improve, I am condemned to narrate. My wealthy relatives check, henceforth, the incubus of my existence, warns me that I have not done with this record of violence yet. We must leave Mr. Godfrey to recover in Northumberland Street, and must follow the proceedings of Mr. Luca at a later period of the day. After leaving the bank, Mr. Luca had visited various parts of London on business errands. Returning to his own residence, he found a letter waiting for him, which was described as having been left a short time previously by a boy. In this case, as in Mr. Gottfried's case, the handwriting was strange, but the name mentioned was the name of one of Mr. Luca's customers. His correspondent announced, writing in the third person apparently by the hand of a deputy, that he had been unexpectedly summoned to London. He had just established himself in lodgings in Alfred Place, Tottenham Court Road, and he desired to see Mr. Luca immediately, on the subject of a purchase which he contemplated making. The gentleman was an enthusiastic collector of oriental antiquities, and had been for many years a liberal patron of the establishment in Lambeth. Oh, when shall we wean ourselves from the worship of mammon? Mr. Luker called a cab and drove off instantly to his liberal patron. Exactly what had happened to Mr. Godfrey in Northumberland Street now happened to Mr. Luker in Alfred Place. Once more the respectable man answered the door and showed the visitor upstairs into the back drawing room. There again lay the illuminated manuscript on a table. Mr. Luker's attention was absorbed, as Mr. Godfrey's attention had been absorbed, by this beautiful work of Indian art. 
He, too, was aroused from his studies by a tawny naked arm round his throat, by a bandage over his eyes, and by a gag in his mouth. He, too, was thrown prostrate and searched to the skin. A longer interval had then elapsed than had passed in the experience of Mr. Godfrey, but it had ended as before, in the persons of the house suspecting something wrong, and going upstairs to see what had happened. Precisely the same explanation which the landlord in Northumberland Street had given to Mr. Godfrey, the landlord in Alfred Place now gave to Mr. Luca. Both had been imposed on in the same way by the plausible address and well-filled purse of the respectable stranger, who introduced himself as acting for his forking friends. The one point of difference between the two cases occurred when the scattered contents of Mr. Luca's pockets were being collected from the floor. His watch and purse were safe, but, less fortunate than Mr. Godfrey's, one of the loose papers that he carried about him had been taken away. The paper in question acknowledged the receipt of a valuable of great price, which Mr. Luca had that day left in the care of his bankers. This document would be, unless for purposes of fraud, inasmuch as it provided that the valuable should only be given up on the personal application of the owner. As soon as he recovered himself, Mr. Luca hurried to the bank, on the chance that the thieves who had robbed him might ignorantly present themselves with the receipt. Nothing had been seen of them when he arrived at the establishment, and nothing was seen of them afterwards. Their respectable English friend had, in the opinion of the bankers, looked the receipt over before they attempted to make use of it, and had given them the necessary warning in good time. Information of both outrages was communicated to the police, and the needful investigations were pursued, I believe with great energy. The authorities held that a robbery had been planned, on insufficient information received by the thieves. They had been plainly not sure whether Mr. Luca had, or had not, trusted the transmission of his precious gem to another person, and poor polite Mr. Godfrey had paid the penalty of having been seen, accidentally speaking to him. Add to this that Mr. Godfrey's absence from our Monday evening meeting had been occasioned by a consultation of the authorities, at which he was requested to assist, and all the explanations required being now given, I may proceed with the simpler story of my own little personal experiences in Montagu Square. I was punctual to the luncheon hour on Tuesday. Reference to my diary shows this to have been a checkered day, much in it to be devoutly regretted much in it to be devoutly thankful for. Dear Aunt Verinder received me with her usual grace and kindness, but I noticed after a little while that something was wrong. Certain anxious looks escaped my aunt, all of which took the direction of her daughter. I never see Russell myself without wondering how it can be that so insignificant-looking a person should be the child of such distinguished parents as Sir John and Lady Verinder. On this occasion, however, she not only disappointed, she really shocked me. There was an absence of all ladylike restraint in her language and manner, most painful to see. She was possessed by some feverish excitement which made her distressingly loud when she laughed, and sinfully wasteful and capricious in what she ate and drank at lunch. I felt deeply for her poor mother, even before the true state of the case had been confidentially made known to me. Luncheon over, my aunt said, Remember what the doctor told you, Rachel, about quieting yourself with a book after taking your meals. I'll go into the library, Mama, she answered. But if Godfrey calls, mind I am told of it. I am dying for more news of him, after his adventure in Northumberland Street. She kissed her mother on the forehead and looked my way. Good boy, Clark, she said carelessly. Her insolence roused no angry feeling in me. I only made a private memorandum to pray for her. When we were left by ourselves, my aunt told me the whole horrible story of the Indian diamond, which I am happy to know it is not necessary to repeat here. 
she did not conceal from me that she would have preferred keeping silence on the subject. But when her own servants all knew of the loss of the moonstone, and when some of the circumstances had actually found their way into the newspapers, when strangers were speculating whether there was any connection between what had happened at Lady Warinder's country house and what had happened in Northumberland Street and Alfred Place, concealment was not to be thought of, and perfect frankness became a necessity as well as a virtue. Some persons, hearing what I now heard, would have been probably overwhelmed with astonishment. For my own part, knowing Rachel's spirit to have been essentially unregenerate from her childhood upwards, I was prepared for whatever my aunt could tell me on the subject of her daughter. It might have gone on from bad to worse till it ended in murder, and I should still have said to myself, the natural result. Oh dear, dear, the natural result. The one thing that did shock me was the course my aunt had taken under the circumstances. Here surely was a case for a clergyman, if ever there was one yet. Lady Verinder had thought it a case for a physician. All my poor aunt's early life had been passed in her father's godless household. The natural result again. Oh, dear, dear, the natural result again. The doctors recommended plenty of exercise and amusement for Rachel, and strongly urged me to keep her mind as much as possible from dwelling on the past, said Lady Verinder. Oh, what heathen advice, I thought to myself, in this Christian country, what heathen advice. My aunt went on. I do my best to carry out my instructions, but the strange adventure of Godfrey's happens at a most unfortunate time. Rachel has been incessantly restless and excited since she first heard of it. She left me no peace till I had written and asked my nephew, Abelwhite, to come here. She even feels an interest in the other person who was roughly used, Mr. Luker, or some such name, though the man is, of course, a total stranger to her. Your knowledge of the world, dear aunt, is superior to mine, I suggested diffidently. But there must be a reason, surely, for this extraordinary conduct of Rachel's part. She is keeping a sinful secret from you and from everybody. May there not be something in these recent events which threatens her secret with discovery? Discovery, repeated my aunt. What can you possibly mean? Discovery through Mr. Luca? Discovery through my nephew? As the word passed her lips, a special providence occurred. The servant opened the door and announced Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. End of part 24「The Moonstone」Part 25 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Read by Christina Betier The Discovery of the Truth First Narrative Chapter 2 Mr. Godfrey followed the announcement of his name, as Mr. Godfrey does everything else, exactly at the right time. He was not so close on the servant's heels as to startle us. He was not so far behind as to cause us the double inconvenience of a pause and an open door. It is in the completeness of his daily life that the true Christian appears. This dear man was very complete. Go to Miss Verinder, said my aunt, addressing the servant, and tell her Mr. Abelwhite is here. We both inquired after his health. We both asked him together whether he felt like himself again after his terrible adventure of the past week. With perfect tact, he contrived to answer us at the same moment. Lady Verinder had his reply in words. I had his charming smile. What, he cried with infinite tenderness, have I done to deserve all this sympathy? My dear aunt, my dear Miss Cluck, I have merely been mistaken for somebody else. I have only been blindfolded. 
I have only been strangled. I have only been thrown flat on my back on a very thin carpet covering a particularly hard floor. Just think how much worse it might have been. I might have been murdered. I might have been robbed. What have I lost? Nothing but nervous force, which the law doesn't recognize as property, so that, strictly speaking, I have lost nothing at all. If I could have had my own way, I would have kept my adventure to myself. I shrink from all this fuss and publicity. But Mr. Luker made his injuries public, and my injuries, as a necessary consequence, have been proclaimed in their turn. I have become the property of the newspapers, until the gentle reader gets sick of the subject. I am very sick indeed of it myself. May the gentle reader soon be like me. And how is dear Rachel? Still enjoying the gaieties of London? So glad to hear it. Miss Clack, I need all your indulgence. I am sadly behindhand with my committee work and my dear ladies. But I really do hope to look in at the mother's small clothes next week. Did you make cheering progress at Monday's committee? Was the board hopeful about future prospects? And are we nicely off for trousers? The heavenly gentleness of his smile made his apologies irresistible. The richness of his deep voice added its own indescribable charm to the interesting business question which he had just addressed to me. In truth, we were almost too nicely off for trousers. We were quite overwhelmed by them. I was just about to say so when the door opened again, and an element of worldly disturbance entered the room in the person of Miss Verinder. She approached dear Mr. Godfrey at a most unladylike rate of speed, with her hair shockingly untidy and her face, what I should call, unbecomingly flushed. "'I am charmed to see you, Godfrey,' she said, addressing him, I grieve to add, in the off-hand manner of one young man talking to another. "'I wish you had brought Mr. Luca with you. You and he, as long as our present excitement lasts, are the two most interesting men in all London. It's morbid to say this. It's unhealthy. It's all that a well-regulated mind, like Miss Clack's, most instinctively shudders at. Never mind that. Tell me the whole of the Northumberland Street story directly. I know the newspapers have let some of it out. Even dear Mr. Godfrey partakes of the fallen nature which we all inherit from Adam. It is a very small share of our human legacy, but alas, he has it. I confess it grieved me to see him take Rachel's hand in both of his own hands and lay it softly on the left side of his waistcoat. It was a direct encouragement to her reckless way of talking, and her insolent reference to me. Dearest Rachel, he said in the same voice, which had thrilled me when he spoke of our prospects and our trousers. The newspapers have told you everything, and they have told it much better than I can. Godfrey thinks we all make too much of the matter, my aunt remarked. He has just been saying that he doesn't care to speak of it. Why? She put the question with a sudden flush in her eyes, and a sudden look up into Mr. Godfrey's face. On his side he looked down at her, with an indulgence so injudicious and so ill-deserved that I really felt called on to interfere. "'Rachel, darling,' I remonstrated gently, "'true greatness and true courage are ever modest.' "'You are a very good fellow in your way, Godfrey,' she said, not taking the smallest notice, observe of me and still speaking to her cousin as if she was one young man addressing another. But I am quite sure you are not great. I don't believe you possess any extraordinary courage, and I am firmly persuaded, if you ever had any modesty, that your lady worshippers relieved you of that virtue a good many years since. You have some private reason for not talking of your adventure in Northumberland Street, and I mean to know it. My reason is the simplest imaginable and the most easily acknowledged, he answered, still bearing with her, I am tired of the subject. You are tired of the subject? My dear Godfrey, I am going to make a remark. What is it? You live a great deal too much in the society of women, and you have contracted two very bad habits in consequence. You have learned to talk nonsense seriously, and you have got into a way of telling fibs for the pleasure of telling them. 
You can't go straight with your lady worshippers. I mean to make you go straight with me. Come and sit down. I am brimful of downright questions, and I expect you to be brimful of downright answers. She actually dragged him across the room to a chair by the window, where the light would fall in his face. I deeply feel being obliged to report such language and to describe such conduct, but hemmed in as I am between Mr. Franklin's Blake's check on one side and my own sacred regard for truth on the other, what am I to do? I looked at my aunt. She sat and moved, apparently in no way disposed to interfere. I had never noticed this kind of torpor in her before. It was perhaps the reaction after the trying time she had had in the country. Not a pleasant symptom to remark, be it what it might, at dear Lady Verinder's age, and with dear Lady Verinder's autumnal exuberance of figure. In the meantime, Rachel had settled herself at the window with our amiable and forbearing, our too forbearing, Mr. Godfrey. She began the string of questions with which she had threatened him, taking no more notice of her mother or of myself than if we had not been in the room. Have the police done anything, Godfrey? Nothing whatever. It is certain, I suppose, that the three men who laid the trap for you were the same three men who afterwards laid the trap for Mr. Luca. Humanly speaking, my dear Rachel, there can be no doubt of it. And not a trace of them has been discovered. Not a trace. It is so, is it not, that these three men are the three Indians who came to our house in the country? Some people think so. Do you think so? My dear Rachel, they blindfolded me before I could see their faces. I know nothing whatever of the matter. How can I offer an opinion on it? Even the angelic gentleness of Mr. Godfrey was, you see, beginning to give way at last under the persecution inflicted on him. Whether unbridled curiosity or ungovernable dread dictated Miss Verinder's questions, I do not presume to inquire. I only report that, on Mr. Godfrey's attempting to rise, after giving her the answer just described, she actually took him by the two shoulders and pushed him back into his chair. Oh, don't say this was immodest. Don't even hint that the recklessness of guilty terror could alone account for such conduct as I have described. We must not judge others. My Christian friends, indeed, 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 we must not judge others. She went on with her questions unabashed. Earnest biblical students will perhaps be reminded, as I was reminded, of the blinded children of the devil, who went on with their orgies, ambushed, in the time before the flood. I want to know something about Mr. Luca, Godfrey. I am again unfortunate, Rachel. No man knows less of Mr. Luca than I do. You never saw him before you and he met accidentally at the bank? Never. You have seen him since? Yes, we have been examined together, as well as separately, to assist the police. Mr. Luca was robbed of a receipt which he had got from his bankers, was he not? What was the receipt for? For a valuable gem, which he had placed in the safekeeping of the bank. That's what the newspapers say. It may be enough for the general reader, but it is not enough for me. The banker's receipt must have mentioned what the gem was. The banker's receipt, Rachel, as I have heard it described, mentioned nothing of the kind. A valuable gem, belonging to Mr. Luca, deposited by Mr. Luca, sealed with Mr. Luca's seal, and only to be given up on Mr. Luca's personal application. That was the form, and that is all I know about it. She waited a moment after he had said that. She looked at her mother and sighed. She looked back again at Mr. Godfrey and went on. Some of our private affairs at home, she said, seem to have got into the newspapers. I grieve to say it is so. And some idle people, perfect strangers to us, are trying to trace a connection between what happened at our house in Yorkshire and what has happened since here in London. The public curiosity in certain quarters is... I fear taking that turn. The people who say that the three unknown men who ill-used you and Mr. Luca are the three Indians also say that the valuable gem... There she stopped. 
she had become gradually, within the last few moments, whiter and whiter in her face. The extraordinary blackness of her hair made this paleness, by contrast, so ghastly to look at, that we all thought she would faint, at the moment when she checked herself in the middle of her question. Dear Mr. Godfrey made a second attempt to leave his chair. My aunt entreated her to say no more. I followed my aunt with a modest medicinal peace offering, in the shape of a bottle of salts. We none of us produced the slightest effect on her. Godfrey, stay where you are. Mamma, there is not the least reason to be alarmed about me. Cluck, you're dying to hear the end of it. I won't faint expressly to oblige you. Those were the exact words she used, taken down in my diary the moment I got home. But, oh, don't let us judge, my Christian friends, don't let us judge. She turned once more to Mr. Godfrey. With an obstinacy dreadful to see, she went back again to her place, where she had checked herself and completed her question in these words. I spoke to you a minute since about what people were saying in certain quarters. Tell me plainly, Godfrey, do they any of them say that Mr. Lucas' valuable gem is the moonstone? As the name of the Indian diamond passed her lips, I saw a change come over my admirable friend. His complexion deepened. He lost the genial suavity of manner, which is one of his greatest charms. A noble indignation inspired his reply. They do say it, he answered. There are people who don't hesitate to accuse Mr. Luker of telling a falsehood to serve some private interests of his own. He has over and over again solemnly declared that, until this scandal assailed him, he had never even heard of the Moonstone. And these wild people reply, without a shadow of proof to justify them, he has his reasons for concealment. We decline to believe him on his oath. Shameful, shameful. Rachel looked at him very strangely. I can't well describe how, while he was speaking. When he had done, she said, Considering that Mr. Luca is only a chance acquaintance of yours, you take up his cause, Godfrey, rather warmly. My gifted friend made her one of the most truly evangelical answers I ever heard in my life. I hope, Rachel, I take up the cause of all oppressed people rather warmly, he said. The tone in which those words were spoken might have melted a stone. But, oh dear, what is the hardness of stone? Nothing compared to the hardness of the unregenerate human heart. She sneered. I blushed to record it. She sneered at him to his face. Keep your noble sentiments for your ladies' committees, Godfrey. I am certain that the scandal which has assailed Mr. Luca has not spared you. Even my aunt's torpor was roused by those words. My dear Rachel, she remonstrated, you have really no right to say that. I mean no harm, Mamma. I mean good. Have a moment's patience with me, and you will see. She looked back at Mr. Godfrey, with what appeared to be a sudden pity for him. She went the length, the very unladylike length, of taking him by the hand. I am certain, she said, that I have found out the true reason of your unwillingness to speak of this matter before my mother and before me. An unlucky accident has associated you in people's minds with Mr. Luca. You have told me what scandal says of him. What does scandal say of you? Even at the eleventh hour, dear Mr. Godfrey, always ready to return good for evil, tried to spur her. Don't ask me, he said. It's better forgotten, Rachel. It is indeed. I will hear it, she cried out fiercely at the top of her voice. Tell her, Godfrey, entreated my aunt, Nothing can do her such harm as your silence is doing now. Mr. Godfrey's fine eyes filled with tears. He cast one last appealing look at her, and then he spoke the fatal words. If you will have it, Rachel, scandal says that the moonstone is in pledge to Mr. Luca, and that I am the man who has pawned it. She started to her feet with a scream. She looked backwards and forwards from Mr. Godfrey to my aunt, and from my aunt to Mr. Godfrey, in such a frantic manner that I really thought she had gone mad. "'Don't speak to me! Don't touch me!' she exclaimed, shrinking back from all of us. 
I declare like some hunted animal, into a corner of the room. This is my fault. I must set it right. I have sacrificed myself. I had a right to do that if I liked. But to let an innocent man be ruined, to keep a secret which destroys his character of for life. Oh, good God, it's too horrible. I can't bear it. My aunt half rose from her chair, then suddenly sat down again. She called to me faintly, and pointed to a little phial in her workbox. Quick, she whispered, six drops in water, don't let Rachel see. Under other circumstances, I should have thought this strange. There was no time now to think there was only time to give the medicine. Dear Mr. Godfrey unconsciously assisted me in concealing what I was about from Rachel by speaking composing words to her at the other end of the room. Indeed, indeed, you exaggerate, I heard him say. My reputation stands too high to be destroyed by a miserable passing scandal like this. It will be all forgotten in another week. Let us never speak of it again. She was perfectly inaccessible, even to such generosity as this. She went on from bad to worse. I must and will stop it, she said. Mamma, hear what I say, Miss Clark. Hear what I say. I know the hand that took the moonstone. I know. She laid a strong emphasis on the words. She stamped her foot in the rage that possessed her. I know that Godfrey Abelwhite is innocent. Take me to the magistrate, Godfrey. Take me to the magistrate and I will swear it. My aunt caught me by the hand and whispered, Stand between us for a minute or two. Don't let Rachel see me. I noticed a blush tinge in her face, which alarmed me. She thought I was startled. The drops will put me right in a minute or two, she said, and so closed her eyes and waited a little. While this was going on, I heard dear Mr. Godfrey still gently remonstrating. You must not appear publicly in such a thing as this, he said. Your reputation, dearest Rachel, is something too pure and too sacred to be trifled with. My reputation, she burst out laughing. Why, I am accused, Godfrey, as well as you. The best detective officer in England declares that I have stolen my own diamond. Ask him what he thinks, and he will tell you that I have pledged the moonstone to pay my private debts. She stopped, ran across the room, and fell on her knees at her mother's feet. Oh, mamma, 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 I must be mad, mustn't I? Not to own the truth, no. She was too vehement to notice her mother's condition. She was on her feet again and back with Mr. Godfrey in an instant. I won't let you, I won't let any innocent man be accused and disgraced through my fault. If you won't take me before the magistrate, drawn out a declaration of your innocence on paper, and I will sign it. Do as I tell you, Godfrey, or I will write it to the newspapers, I'll go out and cry it in the streets. We will not say this was the language of remorse. We will say it was the language of hysterics. Indulgent Mr. Godfrey pacified her by taking a sheet of paper and drawing out the declaration. She signed it in a feverish hurry. Show it everywhere. Don't think of me, she said, as she gave it to him. I'm afraid, Godfrey, I have not done you justice. He says so in my thoughts. You are more unselfish. You are a better man than I believed you to be. Come here when you can, and I will try to repair the wrong I have done you. She gave him her hand, alas, for her fallen nature, alas, for Mr. Godfrey. He not only forgot himself so far as to kiss her hand, he adopted a gentleness of tone in answering her, which, in such a case, was little better than a compromise with sin. I will come, dearest he said, on conditions that we don't speak of this hateful subject again. Never had I seen and heard our Christian hero to less advantage than on this occasion. Before another word could be said by anybody, a thundering knock at the street door startled us all. I looked through the window and saw the world, the flesh, and the devil waiting before the house, as typified in a carriage and horses, a powdered footman, and three of the most audaciously dressed women I ever beheld in my life. 
Rachel started and composed herself. She crossed the room to her mother. "'They have come to take me to the flower show,' she said. "'One word, Mamma, before I go. I have not distressed you, have I?' Is the bluntness of moral feeling which could ask such a question as that after what had just happened to be pitied or condemned? I like to lean towards mercy. Let us pity it. The drops had produced their effect. My poor aunt's complexion was like itself again. No, no, my dear, she said. Go with our friends and enjoy yourself. Her daughter stopped and kissed her. I had left the window and was near the door when Rachel approached it to go out. Another change had come over her. She was in tears. I looked with interest at the momentary softening of that obdurate heart. I felt inclined to say a few earnest words. Alas, my well-meant sympathy only gave offence. What do you mean by pitying me? She asked in a bitter whisper as she passed to the door. Don't you see how happy I am? I am going to the flower show, Clark, and I've got the prettiest bonnet in London. She completed the hollow mockery of that address by blowing me a kiss, and so left the room. I wish I could describe in words the compassion I felt for this miserable and misguided girl, but I am almost as poorly provided with words as with money. Permit me to say my heart bled for her. Returning to my aunt's chair, I observed dear Mr. Godfrey searching for something softly, here and there in different parts of the room. Before I could offer to assist him, he had found what he wanted. He came back to my aunt and me with his declaration of innocence in one hand and with a box of matches in the other. Dear aunt, a little conspiracy, he said. Dear Miss Clack, a pious fraud, which even your high moral rectitude will excuse. Will you leave Rachel to suppose that I accept the generous self-sacrifice which has signed this paper? And will you kindly bear witness that I destroy it in your presence before I leave the house? He kindled a match, and lighting the paper, led it to burn in a plate on the table. Any trifling inconvenience that I must suffer is a nothing, he remarked, compared with the importance of preserving that pure name from the contaminating contact of the world. There! We have reduced it to a little harmless heap of ashes, and our dear impulsive Rachel will never know what we have done. How do you feel? My precious friends, how do you feel? For my poor part, I am as light-hearted as a boy. He beamed on us with his beautiful smile. He held out a hand to my aunt and a hand to me. I was too deeply affected by his noble conduct to speak. I closed my eyes. I put his hand in a kind of spiritual self-forgetfulness to my lips. He murmured a soft remonstrance. Oh, the ecstasy, the pure, unearthly ecstasy of that moment! I sat, I uh, hardly know on what, quite lost in my own exalted feelings. When I opened my eyes again, it was like descending from heaven to earth. There was nobody but my aunt in the room. He had gone. I should like to stop here. I should like to close my narrative with a record of Mr. Godfrey's noble conduct. Unhappily there is more, much more, which the unrelenting pecuniary pressure of Mr. Blake's check obliges me to tell. The painful disclosures, which were to reveal themselves in my presence during that Tuesday's visit to Montagu Square, were not at an end yet. Finding myself alone with Lady Verinder, I turned naturally to the subject of her health touching delicately on the strange anxiety which she had shown to conceal her indisposition and the remedy applied to it from the observation of her daughter. My aunt's reply greatly surprised me. Drusilla, she said. If I have not already mentioned that my Christian name is Drusilla, permit me to mention it now. You are touching quite innocently, I know, on a very distressing subject. I rose immediately. Delicacy left me but one alternative, the alternative after first making my apologies of taking my leave. Lady Verinder stopped me and insisted on my sitting down again. You have surprised a secret, she said, which I had confided to my sister Mrs. Abelwhite and to my lawyer Mr. Bruff, and to no one else. I can trust in their discretion, and I am sure 
When I tell you the circumstances, I can trust in yours. Have you any pressing engagement, Drusilla, or is your time your own this afternoon? It is needless to say that my time was entirely at my own disposal. Keep me company, then, she said, for another hour. I have something to tell you which I believe you will be sorry to hear. And I shall have a service to ask of you afterwards, if you don't object to assist me. It is again needless to say that, so far from objecting, I was all eagerness to assist her. You can wait here, she went on, till Mr. Brough comes at five, and you can be one of the witnesses, Jasilla, when I sign my will. Her will! I thought of the drops which I had seen in her work-box. I thought of the bluish tinge which I had noticed in her complexion. A light which was not of this world, a light shining prophetically from an unmade grave, downed on my mind. My aunt's secret was a secret no longer. End of part 25「The Moonstone」Part 26 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Read by Christina Becher The Discovery of the Truth First Narrative Chapter 3 Consideration for poor Lady Verinder forbade me even to hint that I had guessed the melancholy truth before she opened her lips. I waited her pleasure in silence, and, having privately arranged to say a few sustaining words at the first convenient opportunity, felt prepared for any duty that could claim me, no matter how painful it might be. I have been seriously ill, Drasilla, for some time past my aunt began, and, strange to say, without knowing it myself. I thought of the thousands and thousands of perishing human creatures who were all at that moment spiritually ill, without knowing it themselves, and I greatly feared that my poor aunt might be one of the number. Yes, dear, I said sadly, yes. I brought Rachel to London, as you know, for a medical advice, she went on, I thought it right to consult two doctors. Two doctors! And, oh me, in Rachel's state, not one clergyman. Yes, dear, I said once more, yes. One of the two medical men, proceeded my aunt, was a stranger to me. The other had been an old friend of my husband's, and had always felt a sincere interest in me for my husband's sake. After prescribing for Rachel, he said he wished to speak to me privately in another room. I expected, of course, to receive some special directions for the management of my daughter's health. To my surprise, he took me gravely by the hand and said, I have been looking at you, Lady Verinder, with a professional as well as a personal interest. You are, I am afraid, far more urgently in need of medical advice than your daughter. He put some questions to me, which I was at first inclined to treat lightly enough, until I observed that my answers distressed him. It ended in his making an appointment to come and see me, accompanied by a medical friend, on the next day, at an hour when Rachel would not be at home. The result of that visit, most kindly and gently conveyed to me, satisfied both the physicians that there had been precious time lost, which could never be regained, and that my case had no past beyond the reach of their art. For more than two years I have been suffering under an insidious form of heart disease, which, without any symptoms to alarm me, has, by little and little, fatally broken me down. I may live for some months, or I may die before another day has passed over my head. The doctors cannot, and dare not, speak more positively than this. It would be vain to say, my dear, that I have not had some miserable moments since my real situation has been made known to me. But I am more resigned than I was, and I am doing my best to set my worldly affairs in order. My one great anxiety is that Rachel should be kept in ignorance of the truth. 
If she knew it, she would at once attribute my broken health to anxiety about the diamond, and would reproach herself bitterly, poor child, for what is in no sense her fault. Both the doctors agree that the mischief began two, if not three years since. I am sure you will keep my secret, Drusilla, for I am sure I see sense sorrow and sympathy for me in your face. Sorrow and sympathy, oh, what pagan emotions to expect from a Christian Englishwoman, anchored firmly on her faith. Little did my poor aunt imagine what a gush of devoid thankfulness thrilled through me as she approached the close of her melancholy story. Here was a career of usefulness open before me. Here was a beloved relative and perishing fellow creature, on the eve of the great change, utterly unprepared, and led, providentially led, to reveal her situation to me. How can I describe the joy with which I now remembered that the precious clerical friends on whom I could rely were to be counted, not by ones or twos, but by tens and twenties? I took my aunt in my arms. My overflowing tenderness was not to be satisfied, now, without anything less than an empress. Oh, I said to her fervently, the indescribable interest with which you inspire me. Oh, the good I mean to do you, dear, before we part. After another word or two of earnest prefatory warning, I gave her her choice of three precious friends, all plying the work of mercy from morning to night in her own neighborhood all equally inexhaustible in exhortation, all affectionately ready to exercise their gifts at a word from me. Alas, the result was far from encouraging. Poor Lady Verinder looked puzzled and frightened, and met everything I could say to her with a purely worldly objection, that she was not strong enough to face strangers. I yielded, for the moment only, of course. My large experience, as reader and visitor, under not less first and last than fourteen beloved clerical friends, informed me that this was another case for preparation by books. I possessed a little library of works, all suitable to the present emergency, all calculated to arouse, convince, prepare, enlighten, and fortify my aunt. You will read, dear, won't you? I said in my most winning way. You will read if I bring you my own precious books, turned down at all the right places, aunt, and mark it in pencil where you are to stop and ask yourself, does it apply to me? Even that simple appeal, so absolutely heathening in the influence of the world, appeared to startle my aunt. She said, I will do what I can, Drasilla, to please you, with a look of surprise, which was at once instructive and terrible to see. Not a moment was to be lost. The clock on the mantelpiece informed me that I had just time to hurry home, to provide myself with a first series of selected readings, say a um, dozen only, and to return in time to meet the lawyer and witness Lady Verinder's will. Promising faithfully to be back by five o'clock, I left the house on my errand of mercy. When no interests but my own are involved, I am humbly content to get from place to place by the omnibus. Permit me to give an idea of my devotion to my aunt's interests by recording that, on this occasion, I committed the prodigality of taking a cab. I drove home, selected and marked my first seri series of readings, and drove back to Montagu Square, with a dozen works in a carpet bag, the like of which, I firmly believe, are not to be found in the literature of any other country of Europe. I paid the cabman exactly his fare. He received it with an oath, upon which I instantly gave him a tract. If I had presented a pistol at his head, this abandoned wretch could hardly have exhibited greater consternation. He jumped up on his box and, with profane exclamations of dismay, drove off furiously. Quite useless, I am happy to say. I sowed the good seed, in spite of him, by throwing a second tract in at the window of the cab. The servant who answered the door, not the person with the cap ribbons to my great relief, but the footman, informed me that the doctor had called and was still shut up with Lady Verinder. Mr. Brough, the lawyer, had arrived a minute since, and was waiting in the library. I was shown into the library to wait, too. Mr. Brough looked surprised to see me. He is the family solicitor, 
and we had met more than once on previous occasions under Lady Verinder's roof. A man, I grieve to say, grown old and grizzled in the service of the world, a man who, in his hours of business, was the chosen prophet of love and mammon, and who, in his hours of leisure, was equally capable of reading a novel and of tearing up a tract. "'Have you come to stay here, Miss Clark? he asked with a look at my carpet-bag. To reveal the contents of my precious bag to such a person as this would have been simply to invite an outburst of profanity. I lowered myself to his own level and mentioned my business in the house. "'My aunt has informed me that she is about to sign her will,' I answered. "'She has been so good as to ask me to be one of the witnesses.' "'Aye, aye. Well, Miss Gluck, you will do. You are over twenty-one, and you have not the slightest pecuniary interest in Lady Verinder's will.' "'Not the slightest pecuniary interest in Lady Verinder's will.' Oh, how thankful I felt when I heard that, if my aunt, possessed of thousands, had remembered poor me, to whom five pounds is an object, if my name had appeared in the will, with a little comforting legacy attached to it, my enemies might have doped it, the motive which had loaded me with the choicest treasures of my library, and had drawn upon my failing resources for the prodigal expenses of a cab. Not the cruelest scoffer of them all could doubt now. Much better as it was. Oh, surely, surely, much better as it was. I was arousen from these consoling reflections by the voice of Mr. Bruff. My meditative silence appeared to weigh upon spirits of this worldling, and to force him, as it were, into talking to me against his own will. Well, Miss Clack, what's the last news in the charitable circles? How is your friend Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite, after the mauling he got from the rags in Northumberland Street? Hey, God, they're telling a pretty story about that charitable gentleman at my club. I had passed over the manner in which this person had remarked that I was more than twenty-one, and that I had no pecuniary interest in my aunt's will, but the tone in which he alluded to dear Mr. Godfrey was too much for my forbearance. Feeling bound after what had passed in my presence that afternoon, to assert the innocence of my admirable friend, Whenever I found it called in question, I own to having also felt bound to include in the accomplishment of this righteous purpose a stinging castigation in the case of Mr. Bruff. "'I live very much out of the world,' I said, "'and I don't possess the advantage, sir, of belonging to a club, but I happen to know the story to which you allude, and I also know that a viler falsehood than that story never was told.' "'Yes, yes, Miss Clark, you believe in your friend. Natural enough, Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite won't find the world in general quite so easy to convince as a committee of charitable ladies. Appearances are dead against him. He was in the, ca he was in the house when the diamond was lost, and he was the first person in the house to go to London afterwards. Those are ugly circumstances, madam, viewed from the light of later events.' I ought, I know, to have set him right before he went any farther. I ought to have told him that he was speaking in ignorance of a testimony to Mr. Godfrey's innocence, offered by the only person who was undeniably competent to speak from a positive knowledge of the subject. Alas, the temptation to lead the lawyer artfully on to his own discomfiture was too much for me. I asked what he meant by later events, with an appearance of the utmost innocence. "'By later events, Miss Clark, I mean events in which the Indians are concerned,' proceeded Mr. Bruff, getting more and more superior to poor me, the longer he went on. "'What do the Indians do, the moment they are let out of the prison at Frisinghall? They go straight to London and fix on Mr. Luca. What follows? Mr. Luca feels alarm for the safety of a valuable of great price, which he has got in the house. He lodges it privately.' under a general description, in his banker's strong-room. Wonderfully clever of him, but the Indians are just as clever on their side. They have their suspicions that the valuable of great price is being shifted from one place to another, and they hit on a singularly bold and complete way of clearing those suspicions up. Whom do they seize and search? Not Mr. Luker only, which would be intelligible enough, but Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite as well. Why? 
Mr. Abelwhite's explanation is that they acted on blind suspicion after seeing him accidentally speaking to Mr. Luca. Absurd! Half a dozen other people spoke to Mr. Luca that morning. Why were they not followed home to and decoyed into the trap? No, no. The plain inference is that Mr. Abelwhite had his private interest in the valuable, as well as Mr. Luca, and that the Indians were so uncertain as to which of the two had the disposal of it, that there was no alternative but to search them both. Public opinion says that, mi public opinion says that, Miss Clark, and public opinion on this occasion is not easily refuted. He said those last words looking so wonderfully wise in his own worldly conceit, that I really, to my shame be it spoken, could not resist leading him a little further still, before I overwhelmed him with the truth. "'I don't presume to argue with a clever lawyer like you,' I said, "'but it is quite fair, sir, to Mr. Abelwhite to pass over the opinion of the famous London police officer, who investigated this case. Not the shadow of a suspicion rested upon anybody but Miss Verinda in the mind of Sergeant Cuff.' "'Do you mean to tell me, Miss Clark, that you agree with the sergeant?' I judge nobody, sir, and I offer no opinion. And I commit both those enormities, madam. I judge the surgeon to have been utterly wrong, and I offer the opinion that, if he had known Rachel's character as I know it, he would have suspected everybody in the house but her. I admit that she has her faults. She is secret and self-willed, odd and wild, and unlike other girls of her age but true as steel and high-minded and generous to a fault. If the plainest evidence in the world pointed the one way, and if nothing but Rachel's word of honor pointed to the other, I would take her word before the evidence, lawyer as I am. Strong language, Miss Clark, but I mean it. Would you object to illustrate your meaning, Mr. Bruff, so that I may be sure I understand it? Suppose you found Miss Verinder quite unaccountably interested in what has happened to Mr. Abelwhite and Mr. Luca. Suppose she asked the strangest questions about this dreadful scandal, and displayed the most ungovernable agitation, when she found out the turn it was taking. Suppose anything you please, Miss Clark. It wouldn't shake my belief in Rachel Verinder by a hair's breadth. She is so absolutely to be relied on as that? so absolutely to be relied on as that. Then permit me to inform you, Mr. Bruff, that Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite was in this house not two hours since, and that his entire innocence of all concern in the disappearance of the moonstone was proclaimed by Miss Verinder herself, in the strongest language I ever heard used by a young lady in my life. I enjoyed the triumph, the unholy triumph, I fear I must admit, of seeing Mr. Bruff utterly confounded and overthrown by a few plain words from me. He started to his feet and stared at me in silence. I kept my seat and disturbed and related the whole scene as it had occurred. "'And what do you say about Mr. Abelwhite now?' I asked, with the utmost possible gentleness as soon as I had done. "'If Rachel has testified to his innocence, Miss Cluck, I don't scruple to say— that I believe in his innocence as firmly as you do. I have been misled by appearances, like the rest of the world, and I will make the best atonement I can by publicly contradicting the scandal which has assailed your friend wherever I meet with it. In the meantime, allow me to congratulate you on the masterly manner in which you have opened the full fire of your batteries on me at the moment when I least expected it. You would have done great things in my profession, madam, if you had happened to be a man. With those words he turned away from me and began walking irritably up and down the room. I could see plainly that the new light I had thrown on the subject had greatly surprised and disturbed him. Certain expressions dropped from his lips as he became more and more absorbed in his own thoughts, which suggested to my mind the abominable view that he had hitherto taken of the mystery of the lost moonstone. He had not scrappled to suspect dear Mr. Godfrey of the infamy of stealing the diamond, and to attribute Rachel's conduct to a generous resolution to conceal the crime. On Miss Verinder's own authority, a perfectly unaccessible authority, as you are aware, in the estimation of Mr. Bruff, 
that explanation of the circumstances was now shown to be utterly wrong. The perplexity into which I had plunged this high legal authority was so overwhelming that he was quite unable to conceal it from notice. What a case! I heard him say to himself, stopping at the window in his walk and drumming on the glass with his fingers. It not only defies explanation, it's even beyond conjecture. There was nothing in these words which made any reply at all needful on my part, and yet I answered them. It seems hardly credible that I should not have been able to let Mr. Bruff alone even know. It seems almost beyond mere mortal perversity that I should have discovered, in what he had just said, a new opportunity of making myself personally disagreeable to him. But, ah, my friends, nothing is beyond mortal perversity, and anything is credible when our fallen natures get the better of us. Pardon me for intruding on your reflections, I said to the unsuspecting Mr. Bruff, but surely there is a conjecture to make which has not occurred to us yet. Maybe, Miss Cluck, I own I don't know what it is. Before I was so fortunate, sir, as to convince you of Mr. Abloid's innocence, you mentioned in a case of the reasons for suspecting him, that he was in the house at the time when the diamond was lost. Permit me to remind you that Mr. Franklin Blake was also in the house at the time when the diamond was lost. The old worldling left the window, took a chair exactly opposite to mine, and looked at me steadily, with a hard and vicious smile. "'You are not so good a lawyer, Miss Clark,' he remarked, in a meditative manner, "'as I supposed. You don't know how to let well alone.' "'I am afraid I failed to follow you, Mr. Bruff,' I said modestly. "'It won't do, Miss Clark. It really won't do a second time. Franklin Blake is a prime favorite of mine, as you are well aware. But that doesn't matter. I'll adopt your view, on this occasion, before you have time to turn round on me.' "'You're quite right, madam. I have suspected Mr. Abelwhite on grounds which abstractly justify suspecting Mr. Blake, too. "'Very good. Let's suspect them together. It's quite in his character, we will say, to be capable of stealing the moonstone. The only question is whether it was his interest to do so.' "'Mr. Franklin Blake's debts,' I remarked, are matters of family notoriety. "'And Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite's debts have not arrived at that stage of development yet.' quite true. But there happen to be two difficulties in the way of your theory, Miss Clark. I manage Franklin Blake's affairs, and I beg to inform you that the vast majority of his creditors, knowing his father to be a rich man, are quite content to charge interest on their debts and to wait for their money. There is the first difficulty, which is tough enough. You will find the second tougher still. I have it on the authority of Lady Verinder herself, that her daughter was ready to marry Franklin Blake. Therefore, that infernal Indian diamond disappeared from the house. She had drawn him on and put him off again, with the coquetry of a young girl. But she had confessed to her mother that she loved cousin Franklin, and her mother had trusted cousin Franklin with the secret. So there he was, Miss Clark, with his creditors content to wait, and with a certain prospect before him of marrying an heiress. By all means consider him a scoundrel, but tell me, if you please, why he should steal the moonstone? The human heart is unsearchable, I said gently. Who is to fathom it? In other words, madam, though he hadn't the shadow of a reason for taking the diamond, he might have taken it nevertheless through natural depravity. Very well. Say he did. Why the devil... I beg your pardon, Mr. Bruff. If I hear the devil referred to in that manner, I must leave the room. I beg your pardon, Miss Clark. I'll be more careful in my choice of language for the future. All I meant to ask was this. Why, even supposing he did take the diamond, should Franklin Blake make himself the most prominent person in the house in trying to recover it? You may tell me he cunningly did that to divert suspicion from himself. I answer that he had no need to divert suspicion, because nobody suspected him. He first steals the moonstone, without the slightest reason, through natural depravity, and he then acts a part in relation to the loss of the jewel, which there is not the slightest necessity to act, and which leads to his mortally offending the young lady, who would otherwise have married him. That is the monstrous proposition which you are driven to assert, 
if you attempt to associate the disappearance of the moonstone with Franklin Lake. No, no, Miss Clark, after what has passed here today, between us two the deadlock, in this case, is complete. Rachel's own innocence is, as her mother knows, and as I know, beyond a doubt. Mr. Abelwatt's innocence is equally certain, or Rachel would have never testified to it. And Franklin Blake's innocence, as you have just seen, unanswerably asserts itself. On the one hand, we are morally certain of all these things, and on the other hand, we are equally sure that somebody has brought the moonstone to London, and that Mr. Luger or his banker is in private possession of it at this moment. What is the use of my experience? What is the use of any person's experience in such a case as that? It baffles me. It baffles you. It baffles everybody. No, not everybody. It had not baffled Sergeant Cuff. I was about to mention this with all possible mildness and with every necessary protest against being supposed to cast a slur upon Rachel, when the servant came in to say that the doctor had gone and that my aunt was waiting to receive us. This stopped the discussion. Mr. Brough collected his papers, looking a little exhausted by the demands which our conversation had made on him. I took up my bag full of precious publications, feeling as if I could have gone on talking for hours. We proceeded in silence to Lady Verinder's room. Permit me to add here, before my narrative advances to other events, that I have not described what passed between the lawyer and me, without having a definite object in view. I am ordered to include in my contribution to the shocking story of the Moonstone a plain disclosure, not only of the turn which suspicion took, but even of the names of the persons on whom suspicion rested, at the time when the Indian diamond was believed to be in London. A report of my conversation in the library with Mr. Brough appeared to me to be exactly what was wanted to answer for this purpose, while, at the same time, it possessed the great moral advantage of rendering a sacrifice of sinful self-esteem essentially necessary on my part. I have been obliged to acknowledge that my fallen nature got the better of me. In making that humiliating confession, I get the better of my fallen nature. The moral balance is restored. The spiritual atmosphere feels clear once more. Dear friends, we may go on again. End of part 26「The Moonstone」Part 27 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Read by Christine The Discovery of the Truth First Narrative Chapter the signing of the will was a much shorter matter than I had anticipated. It was hurried over to my thinking in indecent haste. Samuel, the footman, was sent for to act as second witness, and the pen was put at once into my aunt's hand. I felt strongly urged to say a few appropriate words on this solemn occasion, but Mr. Brough's manner convinced me that it was wisest to check the impulse while he was in the room. In less than two minutes it was all over, and Samuel, unbenefited by what I might have said, had gone downstairs again. Mr. Brough folded up the will and then looked my way, apparently wondering whether I did or did not mean to leave him alone with my aunt. I had my mission of mercy to fulfill, and my bag of precious publications ready on my lap. He might as well have expected to move St. Paul's Cathedral by looking at it as to move me. There was one merit about him, due no doubt to his worldly training, which I have no wish to deny. He was quick at setting things. I appeared to produce almost the same impression on him which I had produced on the cabman. He, too, uttered a profane expression and withdrew in a violent hurry and left me mistress of the field. As soon as we were alone, my aunt reclined on the sofa, and then alluded, with some appearance of confusion, to the subject of her will. 
"'I hope you won't think yourself neglected, Drusilla,' she said. "'I mean to give you your little legacy, my dear, with my own hand.' Here was a golden opportunity. I seized it on the spot. In other words, I instantly opened my bag and took out the top publication. It proved to be an early edition, only the twenty-fifth, of the famous anonymous work, believed to be by precious Miss Bellows, entitled The Serpent at Home. The design of the book, with which the worldly reader may not be acquainted, is to show how the evil one lies in wait for us in all the most apparently innocent actions of our daily lives. The chapters best adapted to female perusal are Saturn in the hairbrush, Saturn behind the looking glass, Saturn under the tea table, Saturn out of the window, and many others. Give your attention, my dear aunt, to this precious book, and you will give me all I ask. With those words I handed it to her open, at a market passage, one continuous burst of burning eloquence. Subject, Saturn among the sofa cushions. Poor Lady Verinder, reclining thoughtlessly on her own sofa cushions, glanced at the book and handed it back to me looking more confused than ever. I am afraid, Drusilla, she said, I must wait till I am a little better before I can read that. The doctor... The moment she mentioned the doctor's name, I knew what was coming. Over and over again, in my past experience among my perishing fellow creatures, the members of the notoriously infidel profession of medicine had stepped between me and my mission of mercy, on the miserable pretense that the patient wanted quiet, and that the disturbing influence of all others, which they most dreaded, was the influence of Miss Cluck and her books. Precisely the same blended materialism, working treacherously behind my back, no so to rob me of the only right of property that my poverty could claim, my right of spiritual property in my perishing aunt. The doctor tells me, my poor misguided relative went on, that I am not so well today. He forbids me to see any strangers, and he orders me, if I read at all, only to read the lightest and most amusing books. Do nothing, Lady Verinder, to bury your head or to quicken your pulse. Those were his last words, Drusilla, when he left me today. There was no help for it but to yield again, for the moment only, as before. Any open assertion of the infinitely superior importance of such a ministry as mine, compared with the ministry of the medical man, would only have provoked the doctor to practice on the human weakness of his patient, and to threaten to throw up the case. Happily, there are more ways than one of sowing the good seed, and few persons are better versed in those ways than myself. You might feel stronger, dear, in an hour or two, I said, or you might wake tomorrow morning with a sense of something wanting, and even this unpretending volume might be able to supply it. You will let me leave the book, aunt. The doctor can hardly object to that. I slept it under the sofa cushions, half in and half out, close by her handkerchief and her smelling bottle. Every time her hand searched for either of these, it would touch the book, and, sooner or later, who knows, the book might touch her. After making this arrangement, I thought it wise to withdraw. Let me leave you to repose, dear aunt. I will call again tomorrow. I looked accidentally towards the window, as I said that. It was full of flowers in boxes and pots. Lady Verinder was extravagantly fond of these perishable treasures, and had a habit of rising every now and then, and going to look at them and smell them. A new idea flashed across my mind. Oh, may I take a flower? I said, and got to the window unsuspected in that way. Instead of taking away a flower, I added one, in the shape of another book from my bag, which I left to surprise my aunt among the geraniums and roses. The happy thought followed. Why not do the same for her, poor dear, in every other room that she enters? I immediately said good-bye, and, crossing the hall, slipped into the library. Samuel, coming up, let me out, and, supposing I had gone, went downstairs again. On the library table I noticed two of the amusing books which the infidel doctor had recommended. I instantly covered them from sight with two of my own precious publications. 
In the breakfast room I found my aunt's favorite canary singing in his cage. She was always in the habit of feeding the bird herself. Some groundsel was strewed on a table which stood immediately under the cage. I put a book among the groundsel. In the drawing room I found more cheering opportunities of emptying my bag. My aunt's favorite musical pieces were on the piano. I slipped in two more books among the music. I disposed of another in the back drawing room under some unfinished embroidery which I knew to be of Lady Verinder's working. A third little room opened out of the back drawing room from which it was shut off by curtains instead of a door. My aunt's plain old-fashioned fan was on the chimney piece. I opened my ninth book at a very special passage and put the fan in as a marker to keep the place. The question then came whether I should go higher still and try the bedroom floor at the risk and doubtly of being insulted if the person with the cap ribbons happened to be in the upper reg regions of the house and to find me put. But, oh, what of that? It is a poor Christian that is afraid of being insulted. I went upstairs prepared to bear anything. All was silent and solitary. It was the servant's tea time, I suppose. My aunt's room was in front. The miniature of my late dear uncle, Sir John, hung on the wall opposite the bed. It seemed to smile at me. It seemed to say, Drasilla, deposit a book. There were tables on either side of my aunt's bed. She was a bed sleeper and wanted or thought she wanted many things at night. I put a book near the matches on one side and a book under the box of chocolate drops on the other. Whether she wanted a light or whether she wanted a drop, there was a precious publication to meet her eye, or to meet her hand, and to say with silent eloquence, in either case, Come, try me, try me. But one book was now left at the bottom of my bag, and but one apartment was still unexplored, the bathroom, which opened out of the bedroom. And I peeped in, and the holy inner voice that never deceives whispered to me, you have met her, Drasilla, everywhere else. Meet her at the bath, and the work is done. I observed a dressing gown thrown across a chair. It had a pocket in it, and in that pocket I put my last book. Can words express my exquisite sense of duty done, when I had slipped out of the house, unsuspected by any of them, and when I found myself in the street with my empty bag under my arm? Oh, my worldly friends! Pursuing the phantom, pleasure through the guilty mazes of dissipation, how easy it is to be happy, if you will only be good. When I folded up my things that night, when I reflected on the true riches which I had scattered with such a lavish hand from top to bottom of the house of my wealthy aunt, I declare I felt as free from all anxiety as if I had been a child again. I was so light-hearted that I sang a verse of the evening hymn. I was so light-hearted that I fell asleep before I could sing another. Quite like a child again, quite like a child again. So I passed that blissful night. On rising the next morning, how young I felt. I might add, how young I looked, if I were capable of dwelling on the corners of my own perishable body. But I am not capable, and I add nothing. Towards luncheon time, not for the sake of the creature comforts, but for the certainty of finding dear aunt, I put on my bonnet to go to Montagu Square. Just as I was ready, the maid at the lodgings in which I then lived looked in at the door and said, Lady Verinder's servant to see Miss Clough. I occupied the parlor floor at that period of my residence in London. The front parlor was my sitting room, very small, very low in the ceiling, very poorly furnished, but, oh, so neat. I looked into the passage to see which of Lady Verinder's servants had asked for me. It was the young footman, Samuel, a civil fresh-coloured person with a teachable look and a very obliging manner. I had always felt a spiritual interest in Samuel, and I wished to try him with a few serious words. On this occasion I invited him into my sitting-room. He came in with a large parcel under his arm. When he put the parcel down, it appeared to frighten him. My lady's love, miss, and I was to say that you would find a letter inside. Having given that message, the fresh-coloured young footman surprised me by looking as if he would have liked to run away. I detained him to make a few kind inquiries. 
Could I see my aunt if I called in Montego Square? No, she had gone out for a drive. Miss Rachel had gone with her, and Mr. Abelwhite had taken a seat in the carriage too. Knowing how sadly dear Mr. Godfrey's charitable work was in arrear, I thought it odd that he should be going out driving like an idle man. I stopped Samuel at the door and made a few more kind inquiries. Miss Rachel was going to a ball that night, and Mr. Abelwhite had arranged to come to coffee and go with her. There was a morning concert advertised for tomorrow, and Samuel was ordered to take places for a large party, including a place for Mr. Abelwhite. All the tickets may be gone, miss, said this innocent youth, if I don't run and get them at once. He ran as he said the words, and I found myself alone again, with some anxious thoughts to occupy me. We had a special meeting of the Mother's Small Clothes Conversion Society that night, summoned expressly with a view to obtaining Mr. Godfrey's advice and assistance. Instead of sustaining our sisterhood under an overwhelming flow of trousers which quite prostrated our little community, he had arranged to take coffee in Montagu Square and to go to a ball afterwards. The afternoon of the next day had been selected for the festival of the British Ladies' Servant Sunday Sweetheart's Supervision Society. Instead of being present, the life and soul of that struggling institution he had engaged to make one of a party of worldlings at a morning concert. I asked myself what did it mean. Alas, it meant that our Christian hero was to reveal himself to me in a new character and to become associated in my mind with one of the most awful backslidings of modern times. To return, however, to the history of the passing day. On finding myself alone in my room, I naturally turned my attention to the parcel which appeared to have so strangely intimidated the fresh-colored young footman. Had my aunt sent me my promised legacy, and had it taken the form of cast-off clothes or worn-out silver spoons, or on fashionable jewelry or anything of that sort, prepared to accept all and to resent nothing, I opened the parcel, and what met my view? The twelve precious publications which I had scattered through the house on the previous day, all returned to me by the doctor's orders. Well might the youthful Samuel shrink when he brought this parcel into my room, well might he run when he had performed his miserable errand, as to my aunt's letter, it simply amounted, poor soul, to this, that she dare not disobey her medical man. What was to be done now? With my training and my principles, I never had a moment doubt. Once self-supported by conscience, once embarked on a career of manifest usefulness, the true Christian never yields. Neither public nor private influences produce the slightest effect on us when we have once get our mission. Taxation may be the consequence of mission, riots may be the consequence of mission, wars may be the consequence of a mission. We go on with our work, irrespective of every human consideration which moves the world outside us. We are above reason, we are beyond ridicule. We see with nobody's eyes, we hear with nobody's ears, we feel with nobody's hearts but our own. Glorious, glorious privilege! And how is it earned? Ah, my friends, you may spare yourselves the useless inquiry. We are the only people who can earn it, for we are the only people who are always right. In the case of my misguided aunt, the form which Pius preservance was next to take revealed itself to me plainly enough. Preparation by clerical friends had failed, owing to Lady Verinder's own reluctance. Preparation by books had failed, owing to the doctor's infidel obstinacy. So be it. What was the next thing to try? The next thing to try was preparation by little notes. In other words, the books themselves having been sent back, select extracts from the books copied by different hands, and all addressed as letters to my aunt, were some to be sent by post, and some to be distributed about the house on the plan I had adopted the previous day. As letters they would excite no suspicion, as letters they would be opened and once opened, might be read. Some of them I wrote myself. Dear aunt, may I ask your attention to a few lines? Etc. Dear aunt, I was reading last night and I chanced on the following passage, etc. Other letters were written for me by my valued fellow workers, the sisterhood at the mother's small clothes. 
Dear madam, pardon the interest taken in you by a true, so humble friend. Dear madam, may a serious person surprise you by saying a few cheering words? Using these and other similar forms of courteous appeal, we introduced all my precious passages, under a form which not even the doctor's watchful materialism could suspect. Before the shades of evening had closed around us, I had a dozen awakening letters for my aunt, instead of a dozen awakening books. Six I made immediate arrangements for sending through the post, and six I kept in my pocket for personal distribution in the house the next day. Soon after two o'clock I was again on the field of Pio's conflict, addressing more kind inquiries to Samuel at Lady Verinder's door. My aunt had had a bad night. She was again in the room in which I had witnessed her will, resting on the sofa, and trying to get a little sleep. I said I would wait in the library on the chance of seeing her. In the fervor of my zeal to distribute the letters, it never occurred to me to inquire about Rachel. The house was quiet, and it was past the hour at which the musical performance began. I took it for granted that she and her party of pleasure-seekers, Mr. Godfrey, alas, included, were all at the concert, and eagerly devoted myself to my good work, while time and opportunity were still at my own disposal. My aunt's correspondence of the morning, including the six awakening letters which I had posted overnight, was lying unopened on the library table. She had evidently not felt herself equal to dealing with a large mass of letters, and she might be daunted by the number of them if she entered the library later in the day. I put one of my second set of the six letters on the chimney-piece by itself, leaving it to attract her curiosity, by means of its solitary position apart from the rest. A second letter I put purposely on the floor in the breakfast room. The first servant who went in after me would conclude that my aunt had dropped it, and would be specially careful to restore it to her. The field thus sown on the basement story I ran lightly upstairs, to scatter my mercies next over the drawing-room floor. Just as I entered the front room, I heard a double knock at the street door, a soft, fluttering, considerate little knock. Before I could think of slipping back to the library, in which I was supposed to be waiting, the active young footman was in the hall, answering the door. It mattered little, as I thought. In my own state of health, visitors in general were not admitted. To my horror and amazement, the performer of the soft little knock proved to be an exception to general rules. Samuel's voice below me, after apparently asking some questions which I did not hear, said unmistakably, Upstairs, if you please, sir. The next moment I heard footsteps, a man's footsteps, approaching the drawing-room floor. Who could this favored male visitor possibly be? Almost as soon as I asked myself the question, the answer occurred to me. Who could it be but the doctor? In the case of any other visitor, I should have allowed myself to be discovered in the drawing room. There would have been nothing out of the common in my having got tired of the library and having gone upstairs for a change. But my own self-respect stood in the way of my meeting the person who had insulted me by sending me back my books. I slipped into the little third room, which I have mentioned as communicating with the back drawing room, and dropped the curtains which closed the open doorway. If I only waited there for a minute or two, the usual result in such cases would take place. That is to say, the doctor would be conducted to his patient's room. I waited a minute or two, and more than a minute or two. I heard the visitor walking restlessly backwards and forwards. I also heard him talking to himself. I even thought I recognized the voice. Had I made a mistake? Was it not the doctor, but somebody else? Mr. Bruff, for instance? No, an unhearing instinct told me it was not Mr. Bruff. Whoever he was, he was still talking to himself. I parted the heavy curtains the least little morsel in the world, and listened. The words I heard were, I'll do it today and the voice that spoke them was Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite's. End of Part 27
Part twenty-eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, read by Christine. The Discovery of the Truth, First Narrative, Chapter Five. My hand dropped from the curtain. But don't suppose, oh, don't suppose, that the dreadful embarrassment of my situation was the uppermost idea in my mind. So fervent still was the sisterly interest I felt in Mr. Godfrey, that I never stopped to ask myself why he was not at the concert. No, I thought only of the words, the startling words, which had just fallen from his lips. He would do it today. He had said in a tone of terrible resolution he would do it today. What, oh, what would he do? Something even more deplorably unworthy of him than what he had done already? Would he apostatize from the face? Would he abandon us at the mother's small clothes? Had we seen the last of his angular smile in the committee's room? Had we heard the last of his unrivaled eloquence at Exeter Hall? I was so wrought up by the bare idea of such awful eventualities as these, in connection with such a man, that I believe I should have rushed from my place of concealment, and implored him in the name of all the ladies' committees in London to explain himself, when I suddenly heard another voice in the room. It penetrated through the curtains, it was loud, it was bold, it was wanting in every female charm, the voice of Rachel Veranda. "'Why have you come up here, Godfrey?' she asked. "'Why didn't you go into the library?' He laughed softly and answered, "'Miss Clark is in the library.' "'Clark in the library!' She instantly seated herself on the ottoman in the back drawing-room. "'You are quite right, Godfrey. We had much better stop here.' I had been in a burning fever a moment since, and in some doubt what to do next. I became extremely cold now and felt no doubt whatever. To show myself after what I had heard was impossible. To retreat, except into the fireplace, was equally out of the question. A martyr dome was before me. In justice to myself, I noiselessly arranged the curtains so that I could both see and hear, and then I met my martyrdom with the spirit of a primitive Christian. "'Don't sit on the ottoman,' the young lady proceeded. "'Bring a chair, Godfrey.' I like people to be opposite to me when I talk to them. He took the nearest seat. It was a low chair. He was very tall, and many sizes too large for it. I never saw his legs to such disadvantage before. Well, she went on, what did you say to them? Just as you said, dear Rachel, to me. That Mamma was not at all well today, and that I didn't quite like leaving her to go to the concert. Those were the words. They were grieved to lose you at the concert, but they quite understood. All sent their love, and all expressed a cheering belief that Lady Verinder's indisposition would soon pass, pass away. You don't think it serious, do you, Godfrey? Far from it. In a few days I feel quite sure all will be well again. I think so, too. I was a little frightened at first, but I think so, too. It was very kind to go and make my excuses for me to people who are almost strangers to you. But why not have gone with them to the concert? It seems very hard that you should miss the music too. Don't say that, Rachel. If you only knew how much happier I am here with you. He clasped his hands and looked at her. In the position which he occupied, when he did that he turned my way. Can words describe how I sickened when I noticed exactly the same pathetic expression on his face, which had charmed me when he was pleading for destitute millions of his fellow creatures on the platform at Exeter Hall? It's hard to get over one's bad habits, Godfrey, but do try to get over the habit of paying compliments. Do to please me. I never paid you a compliment, Rachel, in my life. Successful love may sometimes use the language of flattery, I admit. But hopeless love, dearest, always speaks the truth. He drew his chair close and took her hand, when he said, Hopeless love. There was a momentary silence. 
He, who thrilled everybody, had doubtless thrilled her. I thought I now understood the words which had dropped from him when he was alone in the drawing-room. I'll do it to-day. Alas, the most rigid propriety could hardly have failed to discover that he was doing it now. Have you forgotten what we agreed on, Godfrey, when you spoke to me in the country? We agreed that we were to be cousins and nothing more. I break the arrangement, Rachel, every time I see you. Then don't see me. Quite useless. I break the arrangement every time I think of you. Oh, Rachel, how kindly you told me, only the other day, that my place in your estimation was a higher place than it had ever been yet. Am I mad to build the hopes I do on those dear words? Am I mad to dream of some future day when your heart may soften to me? Don't tell me so if I am. Leave me my delusion, dearest. I must have that to cherish and to comfort me, if I have nothing else. His voice trembled, and he put his white handkerchief to his eyes. Exeter Hall again. Nothing wanting to complete the parallel but the audience, the cheers, and the glass of water. Even her obdurate nature was touched. I saw her lean a little nearer to him. I heard a new tone of interest in her next words. Are you really sure, Godfrey, that you are so fond of me as that? Sure. You know what I was, Rachel. Let me tell you what I am. I have lost every interest in life but my interest in you. A transformation has come over me which I can't account for myself. Would you believe it? My charitable business is an unendurable nuisance to me. And when I saw a ladies' committee now, I wish myself at the uttermost ends of the earth. If the annals of apostasy offer anything comparable to such a declaration as that, I can only say that the case in point is not producible from the stores of my reading. I thought of the mother's small clothes. I thought of the Sunday sweetheart's Parisian. I thought of the other societies, too numerous to mention, all built up on this man as on a tower of strength. I thought of the struggling female boards, who, so to speak, draw the breath of their business life through the nostrils of Mr. Godfrey, of that same Mr. Godfrey, who had just reviled our good work as a nuisance, and just declared that he wished he was at the uttermost ends of the earth when he found himself in our company. My young female friends will feel encouraged to preserve, when I mention that it tried even my discipline before I could devour my own righteous indignation in silence. At the same time, it's only justice to myself to add that I didn't lose a syllable of the conversation. Rachel was the next to speak. You have made your confession, she said. I wonder whether it would cure you of your unhappy attachment to me if I made mine. He started. I confess I started too. He thought, and I thought, that she was about to divulge the mystery of the moonstone. Would you think to look at me, she went on, that I am the richest girl living? It's true, Godfrey. What greater wretchedness can there be than to live degraded in your own estimation? That is my life now. My dear Rachel, it's impossible you can have any reason to speak of yourself in that way. How do you know I have no reason? Can you ask me the question? I know it, because I know you. Your silence, dearest, has never lowered you in the estimation of your true friends. The disappearance of your precious birthday gift may seem strange. Your unexplained connection with that even may seem stranger still. Are you speaking of the moonstone, Godfrey? I certainly thought that you referred. I referred to nothing of the sort. I can hear of the loss of the moonstone. Let who will speak of it, without feeling degraded in my own estimation. If the story of a diamond ever comes to light, it will be known that I accepted a dreadful responsibility. It will be known that I involved myself in the keeping of a miserable secret. But it will be as clear as the sun at noonday that I did nothing mean. You have misunderstood me, Godfrey. It's my fault for not speaking more plainly. Cost me what it may, I will be plainer now. Suppose you were not in love with me. Suppose you were in love with some other woman. Yes. Suppose you discovered that woman to be utterly unworthy of you. Suppose you were quite convinced 
that it was a disgrace to you to waste another thought of her. Suppose the bare idea of ever marrying such a person made your face burn only with thinking of it. Yes. And suppose, in spite of all that, you couldn't tear her from your heart. Suppose the feeling she had roused in you, in the time when you believed in her, was not a feeling to be hidden. Suppose the love this wretch had inspired in you. Oh, how can I find words to say it in? How can I make a man understand that a feeling which horrifies me at myself can be a feeling that fascinates me at the same time? It's the breath of my life, Godfrey, and it's the poison that kills me. Both in one. Go away. I must be out of my mind to talk as I am talking now. No, you mustn't leave me. You mustn't carry away a wrong impression. I must say what is to be said in my own defense. Mind this. He doesn't know, he never will know what I have told you. I will never see him. I don't care what happens. I will never, never, never see him again. Don't ask me his name. Don't ask me any more. Let's change the subject. Are you doctor enough, Godfrey, to tell me why I feel as if I was stifling for want of breath? Is there a form of hysterics that bursts into words instead of tears? I dare say. What does it matter? You will get over any trouble I have caused you, easily enough now. I have dropped to my right place in your estimation, haven't I? Don't notice me. Don't pity me. For God's sake, go away. She turned round on the sudden, and beat her hands wildly on the back of the ottoman. Her head dropped on the cushions, and she burst out crying. Before I had time to feel shocked at this, I was horror-struck by an entirely unexpected proceeding on the part of Mr. Godfrey. Will it be credited that he fell on his knees and at her feet? On both knees, I solemnly declare. May modesty mention that he put his arms round her next, and may reluctant admiration acknowledge that he electrified her with two words. Noble creature! No more than that but he did it with one of the bursts which have made his fame as a public speaker. She sat, either quite thunderstruck or quite fascinated, I don't know which, without even making an effort to put his arms back where his arms ought to have been. As for me, my sense of propriety was completely bewildered. I was so painfully uncertain whether it was my first duty to close my eyes or to stop my ears, that I did neither. I attribute my being still able to hold the curtain in the right position for looking and listening entirely to suppressed hysterics. In suppressed hysterics it is admitted, even by the doctors, that one must hold something. Yes, he said, with all the fascination of his evangelical voice and manner, you are a noble creature, a woman who can speak the truth for the truth's own sake. A woman who will sacrifice her pride, rather than sacrifice an honest man who loves her, is the most priceless of all treasures. When such a woman marries, if her husband only wins her esteem and regard, he wins enough to ennoble his whole life. You have spoken, dearest, of your place in my estimation. Judge what that place is, when I implore you on my knees to let the cure of your poor wounded heart be my care. Rachel! Will you honor me? Will you bless me by being my wife? By this time I should certainly have decided on stopping my ears, if Rachel had not encouraged me to keep them open, by answering him in the first sensible words I had ever heard fall from her lips. Godfrey, she said, you must be mad. I never spoke more reasonably, dearest, in your interests as well as in mine. Look for a moment to the future. Is your happiness to be sacrificed to a man who has never known how you feel towards him, and whom you are resolved never to see again? Is it not your duty to yourself to forget this ill-fated attachment, and is forgetfulness to be found in the life you are leading now? You have tried that life, and you are wearying of it already. Surround yourself with nobler interests than the wretched interests of the world, a heart that loves and honors you, a home whose peaceful claims and happy duties went gently on you, day by day. Try the consolation, Rachel, which is to be found there. I don't ask you for your love. I will be content with your affection and regard. 
Let the rest be left, confidently left, to your husband's devotion, and to time that heals even wounds as deep as yours. She began to yield already. Oh, what a bringing up she must have had! Oh, how differently I should have acted in her place! Don't tempt me, Godfrey, she said. I am wretched enough and reckless enough as it is. Don't tempt me to be more wretched and more reckless still. One question, Rachel. Have you any personal objection to me? I, I always liked you. After what you have just said to me, I should be insensible indeed if I didn't respect and admire you as well. Do you know many wives, my dear Rachel, who respect and admire their husbands? And yet they and their husbands get on very well. How many brides go to the altar with hearts that would bear inspection by the man who takes them there? And yet it doesn't end unhappily. Somehow or other the nuptial establishment jogs on. The truth is that women try marriage as a refuge, far more numerously than they are willing to admit. And, what is more, they find that marriage has justified their confidence in it. Look at your own case once again. At your age, and with your attractions, is it possible for you to sentence yourself to a single life? Trust my knowledge of the world. Nothing is less possible. It's merely a question of time. You may marry some other man, some years hence. Or you may marry the man, dearest, who is now at your feet, and who prizes your respect and admiration above the love of any other woman on the face of the earth. Gently, Godfrey, you are putting something into my head which I never thought of before. You are tempting me with a new prospect, when all my other prospects are closed before me. I tell you again, I am miserable enough and desperate enough, if you say another word, to marry you on your own terms. Take the warning and go. I won't even rise from my knees till you have said yes. If I say yes, you will repent, and I shall repent, when it is too late. We shall both bless the day, darling, when I pressed and when you yield. Do you feel as confidently as you speak? You shall judge for yourself. I speak from what I have seen in my own family. Tell me what you think of our household at Frizinghall. Do my father and mother live unhappily together? Far from it, so far as I can see. When my mother was a girl, Rachel, it is no secret in the family. She had loved as you love. She had given her heart to a man who was unworthy of her. She married my father, respecting him, admiring him, but nothing more. Your own eyes have seen the result. Is there no encouragement in it for you and for me? Note. See Betteridge's Narrative, Chapter 8. End of the note. You won't hurry me, Godfrey. My time shall be yours. You won't ask me for more than I can give? My angel, I only ask you to give me yourself. Take me. In those two words she accepted him. He had another burst, a burst, of unholy rapture this time. He drew her nearer and nearer to him till her face touched his, and then, no, I really cannot prevail upon myself to carry the shocking disclosure any farther. Let me only say that I tried to close my eyes before it happened, and that I was just one moment too late. I had calculated, you see, on her resisting. She submitted. To every right-feeling person of my own sex, volumes could say no more. Even my innocence in such matters began to see its way to the end of the interview now. They understood each other so thoroughly by this time that I fully expected to see them walk off together, arm in arm, to be married. There appeared, however, judging by Mr. Godfrey's next words, to be one more trifling formality, which it was necessary to observe. He seated himself, unforbidden this time, on the ottoman by her side. "'Shall I speak to your dear mother?' he asked, or will you? She declined both alternatives. "'Let my mother hear nothing from either of us until she is better.' I wish it to be kept a secret for the present, Godfrey. Go now, and come back this evening. We have been here alone, together quite long enough. She rose, and, in rising, looked for the first time towards the little room in which my martyrdom was going on. 
"'Who has drawn those curtains?' she exclaimed. "'The room is close enough as it is without keeping the air out of it in that way.' She advanced to the curtains. At the moment when she laid her hand on them, at the moment when the discovery of me appeared to be quite inevitable, the voice of the fresh-colored young footman on the stairs suddenly suspended any further proceedings on her side or on mine. It was unmistakably the voice of man in great alarm. "'Miss Rachel!' he called out. "'Where are you, Miss Rachel?' She sprang back from the curtains and ran to the door. The footman came just inside the room. His ruddy color was all gone. He said, "'Please to come downstairs, miss. My lady has fainted, and we can't bring her to again.' In a moment more I was alone, and free to go downstairs in my turn, quite unobserved. Mr. Godfrey passed me in the hall, hurrying out to fetch the doctor. "'Go in and help them,' he said, pointing to the room. I found Rachel on her knees by the sofa, with her mother's head on her bosom. One look at my aunt's face, knowing what I knew, was enough to warn me of the dreadful truth. I kept my thoughts to myself till the doctor came in. It was not long before he arrived. He began by sending Rachel out of the room, and then he told the rest of us that Lady Verinder was no more. Serious persons, in search of proofs of hardened skepticism, may be interested in hearing that he showed no signs of remorse when he looked at me. At a later hour I peeped into the breakfast room and the library. My aunt had died without opening one of the letters which I had addressed to her. I was so shocked at this that it never occurred to me until some days afterwards that she had also died without giving me my little legacy. End of Part 28 The Moonstone, Part 29. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone, by Wilkie Collins. Read by Christine. The Discovery of the Truth. First Narrative. Chapter 6. Letter 1. Miss Clack presents her compliments to Mr. Franklin Blake, and, in sending him the fifth chapter of her humble narrative, begs to say that she feels quite unequal to enlarge, as she could wish, on an event so awful under the circumstances as Lady Verinder's death. She has, therefore, attached to her own manuscripts copious extracts from precious publications in her possession, all bearing on this terrible subject, and may those extracts, Miss Clark fervently hopes, sound as the blast of a trumpet in the ears of her respected kinsman, Mr. Franklin Blake. Letter 2 Mr. Franklin Blake presents his compliments to Miss Clark, and begs to thank her for the fifth chapter of her narrative. In returning the extract sent with it, he will refrain from mentioning any personal objection which he may entertain to this species of literature, and will merely say that the proposed additions to the manuscript are not necessary to the fulfillment of the purpose that he has in view. Letter 3 Miss Clegg begs to acknowledge the return of her extracts. She affectionately reminds Mr. Franklin Blake that she is a Christian, and that it is, therefore, quite impossible for him to offend her. Miss Clark persists in feeling the deepest interest in Mr. Blake, and pledges herself, on the first occasion, when sickness may lay him low, to offer him the use of her extracts for the second time. In the meanwhile, she would be glad to know, before beginning the final chapters of her narrative, whether she may be permitted to make her humble contribution complete, by availing herself of the light which later discoveries have thrown on the mystery of the moonstone. Letter 4 Mr. Franklin Blake is sorry to disappoint Miss Clark. He can only repeat the instructions which he had the honor of giving her when she began her narrative. She is requested to limit herself to her own individual experience of persons and events, as recorded in her diary. Later discoveries she will be good enough to leave to the pens of those persons who can write in the capacity of actual witnesses. Letter 5 
Miss Clegg is extremely sorry to trouble Mr. Franklin Blake with another letter. Her extracts haven't been returned, and the expression of her matured views on the subject of the moonstone has been forbidden. Miss Clegg is painfully conscious that she ought, in the worldly phrase, to feel herself put down. But no. Miss Clegg has learned perseverance in the school of adversity. Her object in writing is to know whether Mr. Blake, who prohibits everything else, prohibits the appearance of the present correspondence in Miss Clark's narrative. Some explanation of the position in which Mr. Blake's interference has placed her as an authoress seems due on the ground of common justice, and Miss Clark, on her side, is most anxious that her letters should be produced to speak for themselves. Letter 6 Mr. Franklin Blake agrees to Miss Clark's proposal, on the understanding that she will kindly consider this intimation of his consent as closing the correspondence between them. Letter 7 Miss Clark feels it an act of Christian duty, before the correspondence closes, to inform Mr. Franklin Blake that his last letter, evidently intended to offend her, has not succeeded in accomplishing the object of the writer. She affectionately requests Mr. Blake to retire to the privacy of his own room and to consider with himself whether the training which can thus elevate a poor weak woman above the reach of insult be not worthy of greater admiration that he is now disposed to feel for it. On being favored with an intimation to that effect, Miss Clark solemnly pledges herself to send back the complete series of her extracts to Mr. Franklin Blake. To this letter no answer was received. Comment is needless. Signed, Drusilla Clark. Chapter 7 The foregoing correspondence will sufficiently explain why no choice is left to me but to pass over Lady Verinder's death with a simple announcement of the fact which ends my fifth chapter. Keeping myself for the future strictly within the limits of my own personal experience, I have next to relate that a month elapsed from the time of my aunt's decease before Rachel Verinder and I met again. That meeting was the occasion of my spending a few days under the same roof with her. In the course of my visit something happened, relative to her marriage engagement with Mr. Godfrey Applewhite, which is important enough to require special notice in these pages. When this last of many painful family circumstances had been disclosed, my task will be completed, for I shall then have told all that I know as an actual and most unwilling witness of events. My aunt's remains were removed from London and were buried in the little cemetery attached to the church in her own park. I was invited to the funeral with the rest of the family, but it was impossible, with my religious views, to rouse myself in a few days only from the shock which this death had caused me. I was informed, moreover, that the rector of Rising Hall was to read the service. Having myself in past times seen this clerical castaway making one of the players at Lady Verinder's whist table, I doubt, even if I had been fit to travel, whether I should have felt justified in attending the ceremony. Lady Verinder's death left her daughter under the care of her brother-in-law, Mr. Abelwhite the Elder. He was appointed guardian by the will, until his niece married, or came of age. Under these circumstances, Mr. Godfrey informed his father, I suppose, of the new relation in which he stood towards Rachel. At any rate, in ten days from my aunt's death, the secret of the marriage engagement was no secret at all within the circle of the family, and the grand question for Mr. Abelwatt Sr., another confirmed castaway, was how to make himself and his authority most agreeable to the wealthy young lady who was going to marry his son. Rachel gave him some trouble at the outset, about the choice of a place in which she could be prevailed upon to reside. The house in Montagu Square was associated with the calamity of her mother's death. The house in Yorkshire was associated with the scandalous affair of the last moonstone. Her guardian's own residence at Frising Hall was open to neither of those objections. But Rachel's presence in it, after her recent bereavement, operated as a check on the gaieties of her cousin, the Miss Abelwhites, and she herself requested that her visit might be deferred to a more favorable opportunity. It ended in a proposal, emanating from old Mr. Abelwhite, to try a furnished house at Brighton. 
His wife, an invalid daughter, and Rachel were to inhabit it together, and were to expect him to join them later in the season. They would see no society but a few old friends, and they would have his son Godfrey, travelling backwards and forwards by the London train, always at their disposal. I describe this aimless flitting about from one place of residence to another, this incessitate restlessness of body, and appalling stagnation of soul, merely with the view to arriving at results. The event which, under Providence, proved to be the means of bringing Rachel Verinder and myself together again, was no other than the hiring of the house at Brighton. My aunt Abelwhite is a large, silent, fair-complexioned woman, with one noteworthy point in her character. From the hour of her birth she has never been known to do anything for herself. She has gone through life accepting everybody's help and adopting everybody's opinions. A more hopeless person, in a spiritual point of view, I have never met with. There is absolutely, in this perplexing case, no obstructive material to work upon. Aunt Abelwhite would listen to the Grand Lama of Tibet exactly as she listens to me, and would reflect his views quite as readily as she reflects mine. She found the furnished house at Brighton by stopping at an hotel in London, composing herself on a sofa, and sending for her son. She discovered the necessary servants by breakfasting in bed one morning, still at the hotel, and giving her maid a holiday on condition that the girl would be enjoying herself by fetching Miss Cluck. I found her placidly fanning herself in her dressing gown at eleven o'clock. Drusilla, dear, I want some servants. You are so clever. Please get them for me. I looked round the untidy room. The church bells were going for a weekday service. They suggested a word of affectionate remonstrance on my part. Oh, aunt, I said sadly, is this worthy of a Christian Englishwoman? Is the passage from time to eternity to be made in this manner? My aunt answered, I'll put on my gown, Drusilla, if you will be kind enough to help me. What was to be said after that? I have done wonders with murderesses. I have never advanced an inch with Aunt Abelwhite. Where is the list, I asked, of the servants whom you require? My aunt shook her head. She hadn't even energy enough to keep the list. Rachel has got it, dear, she said, in the next room. I went into the next room and saw, saw Rachel again, for the first time since we had parted in Montagu Square. She looked pitiably small and thin in her deep mourning. If I attached any serious importance to such a perishable trifle as personal appearance, I might be inclined to add that hers was one of those unfortunate complexions which always suffer when not relieved by a border of white next the skin. But what are our complexions and our looks? Hydrances and pitfalls, dear girls, which beset us on our way to higher things. Greatly to my surprise, Rachel rose when I entered the room and came forward to meet me with outstretched hand. Oh, I'm glad to see you, she said. Drusilla, I have been in the habit of speaking very foolishly and very rudely to you on former occasions. I beg your pardon. I hope you will forgive me. My face, I suppose, betrayed the astonishment I felt at this. She colored up for a moment and then proceeded to explain herself. In my poor mother's lifetime, she went on, her friends were not always my friends, too. Now I have lost her. My heart turns for comfort to the people she liked. She liked you. Try to be friends with me, Drusilla, if you can. To any rightly constituted mind, the motive thus acknowledged was simply shocking. Here in Christian England was a young woman in a state of bereavement, with so little idea of where to look for true comfort, that she actually expected to find it among her mother's friends. Here was a relative of mine, awakened to a sense of her shortcomings toward others, under the influence not of conviction and duty, but of sentiment and impulse. Most deplorable to think of, but, still, suggestive of something hopeful, to a person of my experience in plying the good work. There could be no harm, I thought, in ascertaining the extent of the change which the loss of her mother has wrought in Rachel's character. I decided, as a useful test, to probe her on the subject of her marriage engagement to Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. Having first met her advances with all possible cordiality, I sat by her on the sofa at her own request. We discussed family affairs and future plans, 
always expecting that one future plan which was to end in her marriage. Try as I might to turn the conversation that way, she resolutely declined to take the hint. Any open reference to the question on my part would have been premature at this early stage of our reconciliation. Besides, I had discovered all I wanted to know. She was no longer the reckless, defiant creature whom I had heard and seen on the occasion of my martyrdom in Montagu Square. This was, of itself, enough to encourage me to take her future conversion in hand, beginning with a few words of earnest warning directed against the hasty forming of the marriage tie, and so getting on the higher things. Looking at her now, with this new interest, and calling to mind the headlong suddenness with which he had met Mr. Godfrey's matrimonial views, I felt the solemn duty of interfering with a fervor which assured me that I should achieve no common results. Rapidity of proceeding was, as I believed, of importance in this case. I went back at once to the question of the servants wanted for the furnished house. Where is the list, dear? Rachel produced it. Cook, kitchen maid, housemaid, and footman, I read. My dear Rachel, these servants are only wanted for a term, the term during which your garden has taken the house. We shall have great difficulty in finding persons of character and capacity to accept a temporary engagement of that sort, if we try in London. Has the house in Brighton been found yet? Yes, Godfrey has taken in, and persons in the house wanted him to hire them as servants. He thought they would hardly do for us, and came back having settled nothing. And you have no experience yourself in these matters, Rachel? None whatever. And Aunt Oblewhite won't exert herself. No, poor dear, don't blame her, Drusilla. I think she is the only really happy woman I have ever met with. There are degrees in happiness, darling. We must have a little talk some day on that subject. In the meantime, I will undertake to meet the difficulty about the servants. Your aunt will write a letter to the people of the house. She will sign a letter if I write it for her, which comes to be the same thing. Quite the same thing. I shall get the letter, and I will go to Brighton tomorrow. How extremely kind of you! We will join you as soon as you are ready for us. And you will stay, I hope, as my guest. Brighton is so lively, you are sure to enjoy it. In those words the invitation was given, and the glorious prospect of interference was opened before me. It was then the middle of the week. By Saturday afternoon the house was ready for them. In that short interval I had sifted, not the characters only, but the religious views as well, of all the disengaged servants who applied to me, and had succeeded in making a selection which my conscience approved. I also discovered and called on two serious friends of mine, residents in the town, to whom I knew I could confide the pious object which had brought me to Brighton. One of them, a clerical friend, kindly helped me to take sittings for our little party in the church in which he himself ministered. The other, a single lady, like myself, placed the resources of her library, composed throughout of precious publications, entirely at my disposal. I borrowed half a dozen works, all carefully chosen with a view to Rachel. When these had been judiciously distributed in the various rooms she would be likely to occupy, I considered that my preparations were complete. Sound doctrine in the servants who waited on her, sound doctrine in the minister who preached to her, sound doctrine in the books that lay on her table. Such was the triple welcome which my zeal had prepared for the motherless girl. A heavenly composure filled my mind on that Saturday afternoon, as I sat at the window waiting the arrival of my relatives. The giddy throng passed and repassed before my eyes. Alas, how many of them felt my exquisite sense of duty done! An awful question. Let us not pursue it. Between six and seven the travellers arrived. To my indescribable surprise they were escorted not by Mr. Godfrey, as I had anticipated, but by the lawyer, Mr. Bruff. "'How do you do, Miss Clark?' he said. "'I mean to stay this time.' That reference to the occasion on which I had obliged him to postpone his business to mine, when we were both visiting in Montagu Square, satisfied me that the old wardling had come to Brighton with some object of his own in view. I had prepared quite a little paradise for my beloved Rachel, and here was the serpent already. 
"'Godfrey was very much vexed, Drusilla, not to be able to come with us,' said my aunt Abelwhite. "'There was something in the way which kept him in town. Mr. Bruff volunteered to take his place, and make a holiday of it till Monday morning. "'By the by, Mr. Bruff, I am ordered to take exercise, and I don't like it.' "'That,' added Aunt Abelwhite, pointing out of window to an invalid, going by in a chair on wheels, drawn by a man, is my idea of exercise. If it's air you want, you get it in your chair, and if it's fatigue you want, I am sure it's fatigue enough to look at the man. Rachel stood silent at a window by herself, with her eyes fixed on the sea. Tired, love? I inquired. No, only a little out of spirits, she answered. I have often seen the sea, on our Yorkshire coast, with that light on it, and I was thinking, Drusilla, of the days that can never come again. Mr. Braff remained to dinner, and stayed through the evening. The more I saw him, the more certain I felt that he had some private end to serve in coming to Brighton. I watched him carefully. He maintained the same appearance of ease, and talked the same godless gossip, hour after hour, until it was time to take leave. As she shook hands with Rachel, I caught his heart and cunning eyes resting on her for a moment, with a peculiar interest and attention. She was plainly concerned in the object that he had in view. He said nothing out of the common to her or to anyone on leaving. He invited himself to luncheon on the next day, and then he went away to his hotel. It was impossible the next morning to get my aunt Abelwhite out of her dressing gown in time for church. Her invalid daughter, suffering from nothing in my opinion but incurable laziness inherited from her mother, announced that she meant to remain in bed for the day. Rachel and I went alone together to church. A magnificent sermon was preached by my gifted friend on the heathen indifference of the world to the sinfulness of little sins. For more than an hour his eloquence, assisted by his glorious voice, thundered through the sacred edifice. I said to Rachel when we came out, "'Has it found its way to your heart, dear?' And she answered, "'No, it has only made my head ache.' This might have been discouraging to some people, but— once embarked on a career of manifest usefulness, nothing discourages me. We found Aunt Abelwhite and Mr. Bruff at luncheon. When Rachel declined eating anything and gave us a reason for it that she was suffering from a headache, the lawyer's cunning instantly saw and seized the chance that she had given him. There is only one remedy for a headache, said this horrible old man. A walk, Miss Rachel, is a thing to cure you. I am entirely at your service, if you will honor me by accepting my arm. It was the greatest pleasure. A walk is the very thing I was longing for. It's past two, I gently suggested, and the afternoon service Rachel begins at three. How can you expect me to go to church again? she asked petulantly. With such a headache as mine. Mr. Bruff officiously opened the door for her. In another minute more they were both out of the house. I don't know when I have felt the solemn duty of interfering so strongly as I felt it at the moment. But what was to be done? Nothing was to be done but to interfere at the first opportunity, later in the day. On my return from the afternoon service I found that they had just got back. One look at them told me that the lawyer had said what he wanted to say. I had never before seen Rachel so silent and so thoughtful. I had never before seen Mr. Bruff pay her such devoted attention, and look at her with such marked respect. He had, or pretended that he had, an engagement to dinner that day, and he took an early leave of us all, intending to go back to London by the first train the next morning. "'Are you sure of your own resolution?' he said to Rachel at the door. "'Quite sure,' she answered, and so they parted. The moment his back was turned, Rachel withdrew to her own room. She never appeared at dinner. Her maid, the person with the cap ribbons, was sent downstairs to announce that her headache had returned. I ran up to her and made all sorts of sisterly offers through the door. It was locked, and she kept it locked. Plenty of obstructive material to work on here. I felt greatly cheered and stimulated by her locking the door. When her cup of tea went up to her the next morning, I followed it in. I sat by her bedside and said a few earnest words. She listened with languid civility. I noticed my serious friend's precious publications huddled together on a table in a corner. 
Had she chanced to look into them? I asked. Yes, and they had not interested her. Would she allow me to read a few passages of the deepest interest, which had probably escaped her eye? No, not now. She had other things to think of. She gave these answers with her attention apparently absorbed in folding and refolding the, the frilling on her nightgown. It was plainly necessary to rouse her by some reference to those worldly interests, which she still had at heart. "'Do you know, love,' I said, "'I had an odd fancy yesterday about Mr. Bruff. I thought, when I saw you after your walk with him, that he had been telling you some bad news.' Her fingers dropped from the trifling of her nightgown, and her fierce black eyes flashed at me. "'Quite the contrary,' she said. "'It was news I was interested in hearing, and I am deeply indebted to Mr. Bruff for telling me of it.' "'Yes,' I said, in a tone of gentle interest. Her fingers went back to the trifling, and she turned her head sullenly away from me. I had been met in this manner, in the course of plying the good work hundreds of times. She merely stimulated me to try again. In my dauntless zeal for her welfare, I ran the great risk and openly allude to her marriage engagement. "'News you were interested in hearing,' I repeated. "'I suppose, my dear Rachel, that must be news of Mr. Godfrey Avelwhite.' She started up in the bed, and turned deadly pale. It was evidently on the tip of her tongue to retort on me with the unbrilled insolence of former times. She checked herself, laid her head back on the pillow, considered a minute, and then answered in these remarkable words. I shall never marry Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. It was my turn to start at that. What can you possibly mean? I exclaimed. The marriage is considered by the whole family as a settled thing. Mr. Godfrey Applewhite is expected here today, she said doggedly. Wait till he comes, and you will see. But, my dear Rachel, she rang the bell at the head of her bed. The person with the cab ribbons appeared. Penelope, my bath, let me give her her due. In the state of my feelings at that moment, I do sincerely believe that she had hit on the only possible way of forcing me to leave the room. But the mere worldly mind my position towards Rachel might have been viewed as presenting difficulties of no ordinary kind. I had reckoned on leading her to higher things by means of a little earnest exhortation on the subject of her marriage. And now, if she was to be believed, no such event as her marriage was to take place at all. But ah, my friends, a working Christian of my experience— with an evangelizing prospect before her, takes broader views than these. Supposing Rachel really broke off the marriage, on which the Abelwhites, father and son, counted as a settled thing, what would be the result? It could only end, if she held firm, in an exchanging of hard words and bitter accusations on both sides. And what would be the effect on Rachel when the stormy interview was over? A salutary moral depression would be the effect. Her pride would be exhausted, her stubbornness would be exhausted, by the resolute resistance which it was in her character to make under the circumstances. She would turn for sympathy to the nearest person who had sympathy to offer, and I was the nearest person, brimful of comfort, charged to overflowing with reasonable and reviving words. Never had the evangelizing prospect looked brighter to my eyes than it looked now. She came down to breakfast, but she ate nothing, and hardly uttered a word. After breakfast she wandered listlessly from room to room, then suddenly roused herself and opened the piano. The music she selected to play was of the most scandalously profane sort, associated with performances on the stage which it curdles one's blood to think of. It would have been premature to interfere with her at such a time as this. I privately ascertained at the hour at which Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite was expected, and then I escaped the music by leaving the house. Being out alone, I took the opportunity of calling upon my two resident friends. It was an indescribable luxury to find myself indulging in earnest conversation with serious persons. Infinitely encouraged and refreshed, I turned my steps back again to the house, in excellent time to await the arrival of our expected visitor. I entered the dining-room, always empty at that hour of the day, and found myself face to face with Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. He made no attempt to fly the place. Quite the contrary. He advanced to meet me with the utmost eagerness. 
"'Dear Miss Clark, I have been only waiting to see you. "'Chance set me free of my London engagements today sooner than I had expected, "'and I have got here, in consequence earlier than my appointed time. "'Not the slightest embarrassment encumbered his explanation, "'though this was his first meeting with me after the scene in Montagu Square. "'He was not aware, it's true, of my having been a witness of that scene. "'But he knew, on the other hand, that my attendances at the mother's small clothes and my relations with friends attached to other charities must have informed me of his shameless neglect of his ladies and of his poor. And yet there he was before me, in full possession of his charming voice and his irresistible smile. "'Have you seen Rachel yet?' I asked. He sighed gently and took me by the hand. I should certainly have snatched my hand away, if the manner in which he gave his answer had not paralyzed me with astonishment. "'I have seen Rachel,' he said with perfect tranquillity. "'You are aware, dear friend, that she was engaged to me. Well, she has taken a sudden resolution to break the engagement. Reflection has convinced her that she will best consult her welfare and mine by retracing a rash promise and leaving me free to make some happier choice elsewhere. That is the only reason she will give.' and the only answer she will make to every question that I can ask of her. "'What have you done on your side?' I inquired. "'Have you submitted?' "'Yes,' he said, with the most unruffled composure. "'I have submitted.' His conduct under the circumstances was so utterly inconceivable that I stood bewildered with my hand in his. It is a piece of rudeness to stare at anybody, and it is an act of indelicacy to stare at a gentleman. I committed both those improprieties. And I said, as if in a dream, What does it mean? Permit me to tell you, he replied. And suppose we sit down. He led me to a chair. I have an indistinct remembrance that he was very affectionate. I don't think he put his arm round my face to support me, but I'm not sure. I was quite helpless, and his ways with ladies were very endearing. At any rate, we sat down. I can answer for that, if I can answer for nothing more. End of part 29「The Moonstone」Part 30 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Read by Christine The Discovery of the Truth First Narrative Chapter 8 I have lost a beautiful girl, an excellent social position and a handsome income, Mr. Godfrey began, and I have submitted to it without a struggle. What can be the motive for such extraordinary conduct as that? My precious friend, there is no motive. No motive, I repeated. Let me appeal, my dear Miss Clark, to your experience of children, he went on. A child pursues a certain course of conduct. You are greatly struck by it, and you attempt to get at the motive. The dear little thing is incapable of telling you its motive. You might as well ask the grass why it grows, or the birds why they sing. Well, in this matter, I am like the dear little thing, like the grass, like the birds. I don't know why I made a proposal of marriage to Miss Verinder. I don't know why I have shamefully neglected my dear ladies. I don't know why I have apostatized from the mother's small clothes. You say to the child, why have you been naughty? And the little angel puts its fingers into its mouth and doesn't know. My case exactly, Miss Clark. I couldn't confess it to anybody else. I feel impelled to confess it to you. I began to recover myself. A mental problem was involved here. I am deeply interested in mental problems, and I am not, it is thought, without some skill in solving them. Best of friends, exert your intellect and help me, he proceeded. Tell me, why does the time come when these matrimonial proceedings of mine begin to look like something done in a dream? Why does it suddenly occur to me that my true happiness is in helping my dear ladies, in going my modest round of useful work, in saying my few earnest words when called on by my chairman? What do I want with a position? I have got a position. 
What do I want with an income? I can pay for my bread and cheese and my nice little lodging, and my two coats a year. What do I want with Miss Verinder? She has told me with her own lips, this dear lady is between ourselves, that she loves another man, and that her only idea in marrying me is to try and put that other man out of her head. What a horrid union is this? Oh, dear me, what a horrid union is this? Such are my reflections, Miss Clark, on my way to Brighton. I approach Rachel with the feeling of a criminal who is going to receive his sentence. When I find that she has changed her mind too, when I hear her propose to break the engagement, I experience, there is no sort of doubt about it, a most overpowering sense of relief. A month ago I was pressing her repetitiously to my bosom. An hour ago the happiness of knowing that I shall never press her again intoxicates me like strong liquor. The thing seems impossible, the thing can't be. And yet there are the facts, as I had the honor of stating them, when we first sat down together in these two chairs. I have lost a beautiful girl, an excellent social position, and a handsome income, and I have submitted to it without a struggle. Can you account for it, dear friend? It's quite beyond me. His magnificent head sunk on his breast, and he gave up his own mental problem in despair. I was deeply touched. The case, if I may speak as a spiritual physician, was now quite plain to me. It is no uncommon event, in the experience of us all, to see the possessors of exalted ability occasionally humbled to the level of the most poorly gifted people about them. The object, no doubt, in the wise economy of providence, is to remind greatness that it is, and that the power which has conferred it can also take it away. It was now to my mind easy to discern one of these salutary humiliations in the deplorable proceedings on dear Mr. Godfrey's part, of which I had been the unseen witness. And it was equally easy to recognize the welcome reappearance of his own finer nature in the horror with which he recoiled from the idea of a marriage with Rachel, and in the charming eagerness which she showed to return to his ladies and his poor. I put this view before him in a few simple and sisterly words. His joy was beautiful to see. He compared himself, as I went on, to a lost man emerging from the darkness into the light. When I answered for a loving reception of him at the mother's small clothes, the grateful heart of our Christian hero overflowed it. He pressed my hands alternately to his lips. Overwhelmed by the exquisitive triumph of having got him back among us, I let him do what he liked with my hands. I closed my eyes. I felt my head in an ecstasy of spiritual self-forgetfulness, sinking on his shoulder. In a moment more I should certainly have swooned away in his arms, but for an interruption from the outer world, which brought me to myself again. A horrid rattling of knives and forks sounded outside the door, and the footman came in to lay the table for luncheon. Mr. Godfrey started up and looked at the clock on the mantelpiece. "'How time flies with you!' he exclaimed. "'I shall barely catch the train.' I ventured on asking why he was in such a hurry to get back to town. His answer reminded me of family difficulties that were still to be reconciled, and of family disagreements that were yet to come. "'I have heard from my father,' he said. "'Business obliges him to leave Rising Hall for London today, and he proposes coming on here, either this evening or tomorrow.' I must tell him what has happened between Rachel and me. His heart is set on our marriage. There will be great difficulty, I fear, in reconciling him to the breaking off of the engagement. I must stop him for all our sakes from coming here till he is reconciled. Best and dearest of friends, we shall meet again. With those words he hurried out. In equal haste on my side, I ran upstairs to compose myself in my own room before meeting Aunt Abelwhite and Rachel at the luncheon table. I am well aware, to dwell for a moment yet on the subject of Mr. Godfrey, that the all-profaning opinion of the world has charged him with having his own private reasons for releasing Rachel from her engagement, at the first opportunity she gave him. It has also reached my ears that his anxiety to recover his place in my estimation has been attributed in certain quarters to a mercenary eagerness to make his peace, through me, with a venerable committee, woman at the mother's small clothes, abundantly blessed with the goods of this world, and a beloved and intimate friend of my own. 
I only notice these odious slanders for the sake of declaring that they never had a moment's influence on my mind. In obedience to my instructions, I have exhibited the fluctuations in my opinion of our Christian hero, exactly as I find them recorded in my diary. In justice to myself, let me here add that, once restrained in his place in my estimation, my gifted friend never lost the, that place again. I write with the tears in my eyes, burning to say more. But no, I am cruelly limited to my actual experience of persons and things. In less than a month from the time of which I am now writing, events in the money market, which diminished even my miserable little income, forced me into foreign exile, and left me with nothing but a loving remembrance of Mr. Godfrey, which the slander of the world has assailed, and assailed in vain. Let me dry my eyes and return to my narrative. I went downstairs to luncheon, naturally anxious to see how Rachel was affected by her release from her marriage engagement. It appeared to me, but I own I am a poor authority in such matters, that the recovery of her freedom had set her thinking again of that other man whom she loved, and that she was furious with herself for not being able to control a revulsion of feeling of which she was secretly ashamed. Who was the man? I had my suspicions, but it was needless to waste time in idle speculation. When I had converted her, she would, as a matter of course, have no concealments from me. I should hear all about the man, I should hear all about the moonstone. If I had had no higher object in stirring her up to a sense of spiritual things, the motive of relieving her mind of its guilty secrets would have been enough of itself to encourage me to go on. Aunt Applewhite took her exercise in the afternoon in an invalid chair. Rachel accompanied her. I wish I could drag the chair, she broke out recklessly. I wish I could fatigue myself till I was ready to drop. She was in the same humor in the evening. I discovered in one of my friend's precious publications The Life Letters and Labors of Miss Jane Ann Stamper, 44th edition, passages which bore with a marvelous appropriateness on Rachel's present position. Upon my proposing to read them, she went to the piano. Conceive how little she must have known of serious people if she supposed that my patience was to be exhausted in that way. I kept Miss Jane Ann Stamper by me, and waited for events with the most unfaltering trust in the future. Old Mr. Abelwhite never made his appearance that night, but I knew the importance which his worldly greed attached to his son's marriage with Miss Verinder, and I felt a positive conviction, do what Mr. Godfrey might to prevent it, that we should see him the next day. With his interference in the matter, the storm on which I had counted would certainly come, and the salutary exhaustion of Rachel's resisting powers would as certainly follow. I am not ignorant that old Mr. Abelwhite has the reputation generally, especially among his inferiors, of being a remarkably good-natured man. According to my observation of him, he deserves his reputation as long as he has his own way, and not a moment longer. The next day, exactly as I had foreseen, Aunt Abelwhite was as near to being astonished as her nature would permit by the sudden appearance of her husband. He had barely been a minute in the house before he was followed, to my astonishment, this time, by an unexpected complication in the shape of Mr. Bruff. I never remember feeling the presence of the lawyer to be more unwelcome than I felt it at that moment. He looked ready for anything in the way of an obstructive proceeding, capable even of keeping the peace with Rachel for one of the combatants. "'This is a pleasant surprise, sir,' said Mr. Abelwhite, addressing himself with his decaptive cordiality to Mr. Bruff. "'When I left your office yesterday, I didn't expect to have the honour of seeing you at Brighton today.' "'I turned over our conversation in my mind after you had gone,' replied Mr. Bruff, "'and it occurred to me that I might perhaps be of some use on this occasion. I was just in time to catch the train, and I had no opportunity of discovering the carriage in which you were travelling. Having given that explanation, he seated himself by Rachel. I retired modestly to a corner with Miss Jane Ann Stamper on my lap, in case of emergency. My aunt sat at the window, placidly fanning herself as usual. Mr. Abelwhite stood up in the middle of the room, with his bald head much pinker than I had ever seen it yet, and addressed himself in the most affectionate manner to his niece. "'Rachel, my dear,' he said, I have heard some very extraordinary news from Godfrey, 
and I am here to inquire about it. You have a sitting-room of your own in this house. Will you honor me by showing me the way to it? Rachel never moved. Whether she was determined to bring matters to a crisis, or whether she was prompted to some private sign from Mr. Brough, is more than I can tell. She declined doing old Mr. Abloyd the honor of conducting him into her sitting-room. "'Whatever you wish to say to me,' she answered, "'can be said here, in the presence of my relatives, "'and in the presence,' she looked at Mr. Brough, "'of my mother's trusted old friend.' "'Just as you please, my dear,' said the amiable Mr. Abloyd. He took a chair. The rest of them looked at his face, as if they expected it, after seventy years of worldly training, to speak the truth. I looked at the top of his bald head, having noticed on other occasions that the temper, which was really in him, had a habit of registering itself there. Some weeks ago, pursued the old gentleman, my son informed me that Miss Farinder had done him the honor to engage herself to marry him. Is it possible, Rachel, that he can have misinterpreted or presumed upon what you really said to him? Certainly not, she replied. I did engage myself to marry him. Very frankly answered, said Mr. Abloyd, and most satisfactory, my dear, so far. In respect to what happened some weeks since, Godfrey has made no mistake. The error is evidently in what he told me yesterday. I begin to see it now. You and he have had a lover's quarrel, and my foolish son has interpreted it seriously. Ah, I should have known better than that at his age. The fallen nature in Rachel, the mother Eve, so to speak, began to chafe at this. Pray let us understand each other, Mr. Applewhite, she said. Nothing in the least like a quarrel took place yesterday between your son and me. If he told you that I proposed breaking off our marriage engagement, and that he agreed on his side, he told you the truth. The self-registering thermometer at the top of Mr. Abelwhite's bald head began to indicate a rise of temper. His face was more amiable than ever, but there was the pink of the top of his face, a shade deeper already. "'Come, come, my dear,' he said in his most soothing manner. "'Now don't be angry, and don't be hard on poor Godfrey. He has evidently said some unfortunate thing. He was always clumsy from a child, but he means well, Rachel, he means well.' "'Mr. Abelwhite, I have either expressed myself very badly, or you are purposely mistaking me. Once for all, it is a settled thing between your son and myself that we remain, for the rest of our lives, cousins and nothing more. Is that plain enough?' The tone in which she said these words made it impossible even for old Mr. Abelwhite to mistake her any longer. His thermometer went up another degree, and his voice went he next spoke, ceased to be the voice which is appropriate to a notoriously good-natured man. "'I am to understand, then,' he said, "'that your marriage engagement is broken off.' "'You are to understand that, Mr. Abelwhite, if you please.' "'I am also to take it as a matter of fact that the proposal to withdraw from the engagement came in the first instance from you.' "'It came in the first instance from me.' and it met, as I have told you, with your son's consent and approval. The thermometer went up to the top of the register. I mean, the pink changed suddenly to a scarlet. My son is a mean-spirited hound, cried this furious old worling. In justice to myself as his father, not in justice to him, I beg to ask you, Miss Verinder, what complaint you have to make of Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. Here Mr. Brough interfered for the first time. "'You are not bound to answer that question,' he said to Rachel. Old Mr. Abelwhite fastened on him instantly. "'Don't forget, sir,' he said, "'that you are a self-invited guest here. "'Your interference would have come with a better grace "'if you had waited until it was asked for.' Mr. Brough took no notice. The smooth varnish on his wicked old face never cracked. Rachel sent him for the advice he had given to her, and then turned to old Mr. Abelwhite preserving her composure in a manner which, having regard to her age and her sex, was simply awful to see. "'Your son put the same question to me which you have just asked,' she said. "'I had only one answer for him, and I have only one answer for you. I proposed that we should release each other, because reflection had convinced me that I should best consult his welfare and mine by retracing a rash promise, and leaving him free to make his choice elsewhere.' "'What has my son done?' 
persisted Mr. Abelwhite. "'I have a right to know that. What has my son done?' She persisted just as obstinately on her side. "'You have had the only explanation which I think it's necessary to give to you, or to him,' she answered. "'In plain English, it's your sovereign will and pleasure, Miss Garinder, to jilt my son.' Rachel was silent for a moment. Sitting close behind her, I heard her sigh. Mr. Braff took her hand and gave it a little squeeze. She recovered herself and answered Mr. Abelwhite as boldly as ever. "'I have exposed myself to worse misconstructions than that,' she said, "'and I have borne it patiently. The time has gone by when you could mortify me by calling me a jilt.' She spoke with a bitterness of tone which satisfied me that the scandal of the moonstone had been in some way recalled to her mind. "'I have no more to say.' she added wearily, not addressing the words to anyone in particular, and looking away from us all, out of the window that was nearest to her. Mr. Abelwhite got upon his feet and pushed away his chair so violently that it toppled over and fell on the floor. "'I have something more to say on my side,' he announced, bringing down the flat of his hand on the table with a bang. "'I have to say that if my son doesn't feel this insult, I do.' Rachel started and looked at him in a sudden surprise. Insult? she repeated. What do you mean? Insult, reiterated Mr. Abelwhite. I know your motive, Miss Verinder, for breaking your promise to my son. I know it as certainly as if you had confessed it in so many words. Your cursed family pride is insulting Godfrey, as it insulted me when I married your aunt. Her family, her beggarly family, turned their backs on her for marrying an honest man, who had made his own place and won his own fortune. I had no ancestors. I wasn't descended from a set of cutthroat scoundrels who lived by robbery and murder. I couldn't point to the time when the Abelwhites hadn't a shirt to their backs, and couldn't sign their own names. Ha ha! I wasn't good enough for the Heron Castles when I married, and now it comes to the pinch my son isn't good enough for you. I suspected it all along. You have got the hernclast blood in you, my young lady. I have suspected it all along. A very unworthy suspicion, remarked Mr. Braff. I am astonished that you have the courage to acknowledge it. Before Mr. Abelwhite could find words to answer in, Rachel spoke in a tone of the most exasperating contempt. Surely, she said to the lawyer, this is beneath notice. If he can think in that way, let us leave him to think as he pleases. From Scarlet, Mr. Abelwhite was now becoming purple. He gasped for breath. He looked backwards and forwards from Rachel to Mr. Bruff, in such a frenzy of rage with both of them, that he didn't know which to attack first. His wife, who had sat impenetrably fanning herself up to this time, began to be alarmed, and attempted quite uselessly to quiet him. I had, throughout this distressing interview, felt more than one inward call to interfere with a few earnest words and had controlled myself under a dread of the possible results, very unworthy of a Christian Englishwoman, who looks not to what is meanly prudent, but to what is morally right. At the point at which matters had now arrived, I rose superior to all considerations of mere expediency. If I had contemplated interposing any remonstrance of my own humble devising, I might possibly have still hesitated. But the distressing domestic emergency which now confronted me was most marvelously and beautifully provided for in the correspondence of Miss Jane Ann Stamper, Letter 1001, on Peace in Families. I rose in my modest corner and I opened my precious book. Dear Mr. Abelwhite, I said, one word. When I first attracted the attention of the company by rising, I could see that he was on the point of saying something rude to me. My sisterly form of address checked him. He started at me in hazen astonishment. As an affectionate well-wisher and friend, I proceeded, and as one long accustomed to arouse, convince, prepare, enlighten, and fortify others, permit me to take the most pardonable of all liberties, the liberty of composing your mind. He began to recover himself. He was on the point of breaking out. He would have broken out with anybody else. But my voice, habitually gentle, possesses a high note of so in emergencies. In this emergency, I felt imperatively called upon to have the highest voice of the two. 
I held up my precious book before him. I wrapped the open page impressively with my forefinger. Not my words, I exclaimed, in a burst of fervent interruption. Oh, don't suppose that I claim attention for my humble words. Manna in the wilderness, Mr. Ablewhite. Do on the perched earth. Words of comfort, words of wisdom, words of love, the blessed, blessed, blessed words of Miss Jane Ann's temper. I was stopped there by a momentary impediment of the breath. Before I could recover myself, this monster in human form shouted out furiously, Miss Jane Ann's temper be! It is impossible for me to write the awful word which is here represented by a blank. I shrieked as it passed his lips. I flew to my little bag on the side table. I shook out all my tracts. I seized the one particular tract on profound swearing, entitled, Hush, for heaven's sake. I handed it to him with an expression of agonized entreaty. He tore it in two, and threw it back at me across the table. The rest of them rose in alarm, not knowing what might happen next. I instantly sat down again in my corner. There had once been an occasion, under somewhat similar circumstances, when Miss Jane Ann's temper had been taken by the two shoulders and turned out of the room. I waited, inspired by her spirit, for a repetition of her martyrdom. But no, it was not to be. His wife was the next person whom he addressed. Who, 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 he said, stammering with rage, who asked this impudent fanatic into the house? Did you? Before Aunt Abelwhite could say a word, Rachel answered for her. Miss Clark is here, she said, as my guest. Those words had a singular effect on Mr. Abelwhite. They suddenly changed him from a man in a state of red-hot anger to a man in a state of icy cold contempt. It was plain to everybody that Rachel had said something, short and plain, as her answer had been, which gave him the upper hand of her at last. Oh, he said, Miss Clark is here as your guest in my house. It was Rachel's turn to lose her temper at that. Her color rose and her eyes brightened fiercely. She turned to the lawyer and, pointing to Mr. Abelwhite, asked it haughtily, What does he mean? Mr. Braff interfered for the third time. You appear to forget, he said, addressing Mr. Abelwhite, that you took this house as Miss Verinder's guardian, for Miss Verinder's use. Not quite so fast, interposed Mr. Abelwhite. I have a last word to say, which I should have said some time since. If this... Uh, he looked my way, pondering what abominable name he should call me. If this rampant spinster had not interrupted us. I beg to inform you, sir, that, if my son is not good enough to be Miss Verinder's husband, I cannot presume to consider his father good enough to be Miss Verinder's guardian. Understand, if you please, that I refuse to accept the position which is offered to me by Lady Verinder's will. In your legal phrase, I decline to act. This house has necessarily been hired in my name. I take the entire responsibility of it on my shoulders. It is my house. I can keep it or let it just as I please. I have no wish to hurry Miss Verinder. On the contrary, I beg her to remove her guest and her luggage at her own entire convenience. He made a low bow and walked out of the room. That was Mr. Abelwhite's revenge on Rachel for refusing to marry his son. The instant the door closed, Aunt Abelwhite exhibited a phenomenon which silenced us all. She became endowed with energy enough to cross the room. My dear, she said, taking Rachel by the hand, I should be ashamed of my husband if I didn't know that it is his temper which has spoken to you and not himself. You, continued Aunt Abelwhite, turning on me in my corner with another endowment of energy, in her looks this time instead of her limbs. You are the mischievous person who irritated him. I hope I shall never see you or your tracts again. She went back to Rachel and kissed her. I beg your pardon, my dear, she said. In my husband's name, what can I do for you? Consistently perverse in everything, capricious and unreasonable in all the actions of her life, Rachel melted into tears at those commonplace words and returned her aunt's kiss in silence. If I may be permitted to answer for Miss Verinder, said Mr. Braff, might I ask you, Mrs. Abelwhite, to send Penelope down with her mistress' bonnet and shawl? Leave us ten minutes together, he added, in a lower tone, and you may rely on my setting matters right, to your satisfaction as well as to Rachel's. 
The trust of the family in this man was something wonderful to see. Without a word more on her side, Aunt Abelwhite left the room. Ah, said Mr. Braff, looking after her, the Harncastle blood has its drawbacks, I admit, but as there is something in good breeding after all. Having made that purely worldly remark, he looked hard at my corner, as if he expected me to go. My interest in Rachel, an infinitely higher interest than his, riveted me to my chair. Mr. Bruff gave it up, exactly as he had given it up at Aunt Swearinder's in Montagu Square. He led Rachel to a chair by the window and spoke to her there. "'My dear young lady,' he said, "'Mr. Abelwhite's conduct has naturally shocked you, and taken you by surprise. If it was worth while to contest the question with such a man, we might soon show him that he is not to have things all his own way. But it isn't worth while. You are quite right in what you said just now. He is beneath our notice. He stopped and looked round at my corner. I sat there quite immovable, with my tracts at my elbow and with Miss Jane and Stamper on my lap. You know, he resumed, turning back again to Rachel, that it was part of your poor mother's fine nature, always to see the best of the people about her, and never the worst. She named her brother-in-law your guardian because she believed in him, and because she thought it would please her sister. I had never liked Mr. Abelwhite myself, and I induced your mother to let me insert a clause in the will, empowering her executors in certain events to consult with me about the appointment of a new guardian. One of those events has happened today, and I find myself in a position to end all these dry business details. I hope agreeably with a message from my wife. Will you honor Mrs. Bruff by becoming her guest, and will you remain under my roof and be one of my family until we wise people have laid our heads together and have settled what is to be done next? At those words I rose to interfere. Mr. Bruff had done exactly what I had dreaded he would do, when he asked Mrs. Abelwhite for Rachel's bonnet and shawl. Before I could interpose a word, Rachel had accepted his invitation in the warmest terms. If I suffered the arrangement thus made between them to be carried out, if she once passed the threshold of Mr. Bruff's door, farewell to the fondest hope of my life, the hope of bringing my lost sheep back to the fold. The bare idea of such a calamity as this quite overwhelmed me. I cast the miserable trammels of worldly discretion to the winds, and spoke with the fervor that filled me, in the words that came first. Stop, I said, stop, I must be heard, Mr. Bruff. You are not related to her, and I am. I invite her, I summon the executors to appoint me guardian. Rachel, dearest Rachel, I offer you my modest home. Come to London by the next train, love, and share it with me. Mr. Bruff said nothing. Rachel looked at me with a cruel astonishment, which she made no effort to conceal. "'You are very kind, Rosilla,' she said. "'I shall hope to visit you whenever I happen to be in London. But I have accepted Mr. Bruff's invitation, and I think it will be best for the present if I remain under Mr. Bruff's care.' "'Oh, don't say so,' I pleaded. "'I can't part with you, Rachel. I can't part with you.' I tried to fold her in my arms, but she drew back. My fervor did not communicate itself, it only alarmed her. Surely, he said, this is a very unnecessary display of agitation. I don't understand it. No more do I, said Mr. Bruff. Their hardness, their hideous worldly hardness, revolted me. Oh, Rachel, Rachel, I burst out, haven't you seen yet that my heart yearns to make a Christian of you? Has no inner voice told you that I am trying to do for you? What I was trying to do for you, dear mother, when death snatched her out of my hands. Rachel advanced a step nearer and looked at me very strangely. I don't understand your reference to my mother, she said. Miss Cluck, will you have the goodness to explain yourself? Before I could answer, Mr. Bruff came forward, and offering his arm to Rachel, tried to lead her out of the room. You had better not pursue the subject, my dear, he said, and Miss Cluck had better not explain herself. If I had been a stock or a stone, such an interference as this must have roused me into testifying to the truth. I put Mr. Bruff aside indignantly with my own hand, and, in solemn and suitable language, I stated the view with which sound doctrine does not scruple to regard the awful calamity of dying unprepared. Rachel started back from me, 
I blushed to write with a scream of horror. "'Come away,' she said to Mr. Bruff. "'Come away, for God's sake, before that woman can say any more. "'Oh, think of my poor mother's harmless, useful, beautiful life. "'You were at the funeral, Mr. Bruff. "'You saw how everybody loved her. "'You saw the poor helpless people crying at her grave over the loss of their best friend. "'And that wretch stands there and tries to make me doubt that my mother, "'who was an angel on earth, is an angel in heaven now. "'Don't stop to talk about it. Come away.' It stifles me to breathe the same air with her. It frightens me to feel that we are in the same room together. Deaf to all remonstrance, she ran to the door. At the same moment, her maid entered with her bonnet and shawl. She huddled them on anyhow. Pack my things, she said, and bring them to Mr. Bruff's. I attempted to approach her. I was shocked and grieved, but it is needless to say not offended. I only wished to say to her, May your hard heart be softened. I freely forgive you. She pulled down her veil and tore her shawl away from my hand, and, hurrying out, shut the door in my face. I bore the insult with my customary fortitude. I remember it now with my customary superiority to all feeling of offence. Mr. Bruff had his parting word of mockery for me, before he too hurried out in his turn. You had better not have explained yourself, Miss Clack. He said and bowed, and left the room. The person with the cap ribbons followed. It's easy to see who has set them all by the ears together, she said. I'm only a poor servant, but I declare I'm ashamed of you. She too went out, and banged the door after her. I was left alone in the room. Reviled by them all, deserted by them all, I was left alone in the room. Is there more to be added to this plain statement of facts, to this touching picture of a Christian persecuted by the world. No, my diary reminds me that one more of the many checkered chapters in my life ends here. From that day forth I never saw Rachel Verinder again. She had my forgiveness at the time when she insulted me. She has had my prayerful good wishes ever since, and when I die, to complete the return on my part of good for evil, she will have the life, letters, and labors of Miss Jane Anne's temper, left her as a legacy by my will. End of part 30「The Moonstone, part 31. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone, by Wilkie Collins. Read by Joel Portinger. The Discovery of the Truth. Second Narrative. Contributed by Matthew Bruff, Solicitor of Gray's Inn Square. My fair friend, Miss Clack, having laid down the pen, there are two reasons for my taking it up next, in my turn. In the first place, I am in a position to throw the necessary light on certain points of interest which have thus far been left in the dark. Miss Verinda had her own private reason for breaking her marriage engagement, and I was at the bottom of it. Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite had his own private reason for withdrawing all claim to the hand of his charming cousin, and I discovered what it was. In the second place, it was my good or ill fortune, I hardly know which, to find myself personally involved, at the period of which I am now writing, in the mystery of the Indian Diamond. I had the honour of an interview at my own office with an oriental stranger of distinguished manners, who is no other unquestionably than the chief of the three Indians. Add to this that I met with a celebrated traveller, Mr. Murthwaite, the day afterward, and that I held a conversation with him on the subject of the Moonstone, which has a very important bearing on later events. And there you have the statement of my claims to fill the position which I occupy in these pages. The true story of the broken marriage engagement comes first in point of time, and must therefore take the first place in the present narrative. Tracing my way back along the chain of events, from one end to the other, I find it necessary to open the scene, oddly enough, as you will think, at the bedside of my excellent client and friend, the late Sir John Verinder. Sir John had his share, perhaps a rather large share, of the more harmless and amiable of the weaknesses incidental to humanity. 
Among these I may mention as applicable to the matter at hand an invincible reluctance, so long as he enjoyed his usual good health, to face the responsibility of making his will. Lady Verinder exerted her influence to rouse him to a sense of duty in this matter, and I exerted my influence. He admitted the justice of our views, but he went no further than that, until he found himself afflicted with the illness which ultimately brought him to his grave. Then I was sent for, at last, to take my client's instructions on the subject of his will. They proved to be the simplest instructions I had ever received in the whole of my professional career. Sir John was dozing when I entered the room. He roused himself at the sight of me. "'How do you do, Mr. Bruff?' he said. "'I shan't be very long about this, and then I'll go to sleep again.' He looked on with great interest while I collected pens, ink, and paper. "'Are you ready?' he asked. I bowed, took a dip of ink, and waited for my instructions. "'Everything to my wife,' said Sir John. "'That's all.' He turned round on his pillow and composed himself to sleep again. I was obliged to disturb him. "'Am I to understand,' I asked, "'that you leave the whole of the property, of every sort and description, of which you die possessed, absolutely to Lady Verinder. Yes, said Sir John, only I put it shorter. Why can't you put it shorter, and let me go to sleep again? Everything to my wife. That's my will. His property was entirely at his own disposal, and was of two kinds. Property in land, I purposely abstain from using technical language, and property in money. In the majority of cases, I am afraid I should have felt it my duty to my client to ask him to reconsider his will. In the case of Sir John, I knew Lady Verinder to be not only worthy of the unreserved trust which a husband had placed in her, all good wives are worthy of that, but to be also capable of properly administering a trust, which in my experience of the fair sex, not one in a thousand of them is competent to do. In ten minutes Sir John's will was drawn and executed, and Sir John himself, good man, was finishing his interrupted nap. Lady Verinder amply justified the confidence which her husband had placed in her. In the first days of her widowhood she sent for me and made her will. The view she took of her position was so thoroughly sound and sensible that I was relieved of all necessity for advising her. My responsibility began and ended with shaping her instructions into the proper legal form. Before Sir John had been a fortnight in his grave, the future of his daughter had been most wisely and most affectionately provided for. The will remained in its fireproof box at my office, through more years than I liked to reckon up. It was not till the summer of 1848 that I found occasion to look at it again under very melancholy circumstances. At the date I have mentioned, the doctors pronounced the sentence on poor Lady Verinder, which was literally a sentence of death. I was the first person whom she informed of her situation, and I found her anxious to go over her will again with me. It was impossible to improve the provisions relating to her daughter, but in the lapse of time her wishes in regard to certain minor legacies left to different relatives had undergone some modification, and it became necessary to add three or four codicils to the original document. Having done this at once, for fear of accidents, I obtained her ladyship's permission to embody her recent instructions in a second will. My object was to avoid certain inevitable confusions and repetitions which now disfigured the original document, and which, to own the truth, grated sadly on my professional sense of the fitness of things. The execution of this second will has been described by Miss Clack, who is so obliging as to witness it. So far as regards Rachel Verinder's pecuniary interests, it was, word for word, the exact counterpart of the first will. The only changes introduced related to the appointment of a guardian, and to certain provisions concerning that appointment, which were made under my advice. On Lady Verinder's death, the will was placed in the hands of my proctor to be proved, as the phrase is, in the usual way. In about three weeks from that time, as well as I can remember, the first warning reached me of something unusual going on under the surface. I happened to be looking in at my friend the proctor's office, and I observed that he received me with an appearance of greater interest than usual. "'I have some news for you,' he said. "'What do you think I heard at the doctor's commons this morning? 
Lady Verinda's will has been asked for and examined already. This was news indeed. There was absolutely nothing which could be contested in the will, and there was nobody I could think of who had the slightest interest in examining it. I shall perhaps do well if I explain in this place, for the benefit of the few people who don't know it already, that the law allows all wills to be examined at Doctor's Commons by anybody who applies, on the payment of a shilling fee. "'Did you hear who asked for the will?' I inquired. "'Yes, the clerk had no hesitation in telling me. Mr. Smalley, of the firm Skip and Smalley, asked for it. The will has not been copied yet into the great folio registers, so there was no alternative but to depart from the usual course and to let him see the original document. He looked it over carefully and made a note in his pocket-book. Have you any idea of what he wanted with it? I shook my head. I shall find out, I answered, before I am a day older, and with that I went back at once to my own office. If any other firm of solicitors had been concerned in this unaccountable examination of my deceased client's will, I might have found some difficulty in making the necessary discovery. But I had a hold over Skip and Smalley, which made my course in this matter a comparatively easy one. My common-law clerk, a most competent and excellent man, was a brother of Mr. Smalley's, and, owing to this sort of indirect connection with me, Skip and Smalley had, for some years past, picked up the crumbs that fell from my table, in the shape of cases brought to my office, which, for various reasons, I did not think it worth while to undertake. My professional patronage was, in this way, of some importance to the firm. I intended, if necessary, to remind them of that patronage on the present occasion. The moment I got back I spoke to my clerk, and after telling him what had happened I sent him to his brother's office with Mr. Bruff's compliments, and he would be glad to know why Mrs. Skip and Smalley had found it necessary to examine Lady Verinda's will. This message brought Mr. Smalley back to my office, in company with his brother. He acknowledged that he had acted under instructions received from a client, and then he put it to me whether it would not be a breach of professional confidence on his part to say more. We had a smart discussion upon that. He was right, no doubt, and I was wrong. The truth is, I was angry and suspicious, and I insisted on knowing more. Worse still, I declined to consider any additional information offered to me, as a secret placed in my keeping. I claimed perfect freedom to use my own discretion. Worse even than that, I took an unwarrantable advantage of my position. "'Choose, sir,' I said to Mr. Smalley, "'between the risk of losing your client's business and the risk of losing mine.' quite indefensible, I admit, an act of tyranny, and nothing less. Like other tyrants, I carried my point. Mr. Smalley chose his alternative without a moment's hesitation. He smiled resignedly, and gave up the name of his client, Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. That was enough for me. I wanted to know no more. Having reached this point in my narrative, it now becomes necessary to place the reader on these lines, so far as Lady Verinder's will is concerned, on a footing of perfect equality in respect of information with myself. Let me state, then, in the fewest possible words, that Rachel Verinder had nothing but a life interest in the property. Her mother's excellent sense, and my long experience, had combined to relieve her of all responsibility, and to guard her from all danger of becoming the victim in the future of some needy and unscrupulous man. Neither she nor her husband, if she married, could raise sixpence, either on the property in land, or on the property in money. They would have the houses in London and in Yorkshire to live in, and they would have the handsome income, and that was all. When I came to think over what I had discovered, I was sorely perplexed what to do next. Hardly a week had passed since I had heard, to my surprise and distress, of Miss Verinder's proposed marriage. I had the sincerest admiration and affection for her, and I had been inexpressibly grieved when I heard that she was about to throw herself away on Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. And now, here was this man, whom I had always believed to be a smooth-tongued impostor, justifying the very worst that I had thought of him, and plainly revealing the mercenary object of the marriage, on his side. And what of that? you may reply. The thing is done every day. Granted, my dear sir, but would you think of it quite as lightly as you do, if the thing was done, let us say, with your own sister? 
The first consideration which now naturally occurred to me was this. Would Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite hold to his engagement after what his lawyer had discovered for him? It depended entirely on his pecuniary position, of which I knew nothing. If that position was not a desperate one, it would be well worth his while to marry Miss Verinder for her income alone. If, on the other hand, he stood in urgent need of realizing a large sum by a given time, then Lady Verinder's will would exactly meet the case, and would preserve her daughter from falling into a scoundrel's hands. In the latter event, there would be no need for me to distress Miss Rachel, in the first days of her mourning for her mother, by an immediate revelation of the truth. In the former event, if I remained silent, I should be conniving at a marriage which would make her miserable for life. My doubts ended in my calling at the hotel in London, at which I knew Mrs. Abelwhite and Miss Verinder to be staying. They informed me that they were going to Brighton the next day, and that an unexpected obstacle prevented Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite from accompanying them. I at once proposed to take his place. When I was only thinking of Rachel Verinder, it was possible to hesitate. When I actually saw her, my mind was made up directly, come what might of it, to tell her the truth. I found my opportunity when I was out walking with her on the day after my arrival. "'May I speak to you?' I asked. "'About your marriage engagement?' "'Yes,' she said indifferently. "'If you have nothing more interesting to talk about.' "'Will you forgive an old friend and servant of your family, Miss Rachel, if I venture on asking you whether your heart is set on this marriage?' "'I am marrying in despair, Mr. Bruff, on the chance of dropping into some sort of stagnant happiness which may reconcile me to my life. Strong language, and suggestive of something below the surface in the shape of a romance. But I had my own object in view, and I declined, as we lawyers say, to pursue the question into its side issues. Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite can hardly be of your way of thinking, I said. His heart must be set on the marriage at any rate. He says so, and I suppose I ought to believe him. He would hardly marry me, after what I have owned to him, unless he was fond of me. Poor thing! The bare idea of a man marrying her for his own selfish and mercenary ends had never entered her head. The task I had set for myself began to look like a harder task than I had bargained for. It sounds strangely, I went on, in my old-fashioned ears. "'What sounds strangely?' she asked. "'To hear you speak of your future husband "'as if you were not quite sure of your sincerity of his attachment. "'Are you conscious of any reason in your own mind for doubting him?' "'Her astonishing quickness of perception detected a change in my voice, "'or my manner, when I put that question, "'which warned her that I had been speaking all along "'with some ulterior object in view. "'She stopped, and, taking her arm out of mine, "'looked me searchingly in the face. "'Mr. Bruff,' she said, "'you have something to tell me about Godfrey Abelwhite. "'Tell it.' "'I knew her well enough to take her at her word. "'I told it. "'She put her arm again into mine "'and walked on with me slowly. "'I felt her hand tightening its grasp mechanically on my arm, "'and I saw her getting paler and paler as I went on, "'but not a word passed her lips while I was speaking.' When I had done, she still kept silence. Her head drooped a little, and she walked by my side, unconscious of my presence, unconscious of everything about her, lost, buried, I might almost say, in her own thoughts. I made no attempt to disturb her. My experience of her disposition warned me, on this, as on former occasions, to give her time. The first instinct of girls in general, on being told anything which interests them, is to ask a multitude of questions, and then to run off and talk it all over with some favourite friend. Rachel Verinder's first instinct, under similar in circumstances, was to shut herself up in her own mind and to think it over by herself. This absolute self-dependence is a great virtue in a man. In a woman, it has the serious drawback of morally separating her from the mass of her sex, and so exposing her to misconstruction by the general opinion. I strongly suspect myself of thinking as the rest of the world think in this matter, except in the case of Rachel Verinder. The self-dependence in her character was one of its virtues in my estimation, 
partly, no doubt, because I sincerely admired and liked her, partly because the view I took of her connection with the loss of the moonstone was based on my own special knowledge of her disposition. Badly as appearances might look in the matter of the diamond, shocking as it undoubtedly was to know that she was associated in any way with the mystery of an undiscovered theft, I was satisfied, nevertheless, that she had done nothing unworthy of her, because I was also satisfied that she had not stirred a step in the business without shutting herself up in her own mind and thinking it over first. We had walked on, for nearly a mile, I should think, before Rachel roused herself. She suddenly looked up at me with a faint reflection of her smile of happier times, the most irresistible smile I had ever seen on a woman's face. "'I owe much already to your kindness,' she said, "'and I feel more deeply indebted to it now than ever. "'If you hear any rumours of my marriage when you go back to London, "'contradict them at once, on my authority.' "'Have you resolved to break your engagement?' I asked. "'Can you doubt it?' she returned, proudly, "'after what you have told me?' "'My dear Miss Rachel, you are very young, "'and you may find more difficulty in withdrawing from your present position "'than you anticipate. "'Have you no one, I mean a lady, of course, whom you could consult?' "'No one,' she answered. "'It distressed me, it did indeed distress me, to hear her say that. "'She was so young and so lonely, and she bore it so well. "'The impulse to help her got the better of any sense of my own unfitness "'which I might have felt under the circumstances, "'and I stated such ideas on the subject as occurred to me "'on the spur of the moment to the best of my ability. "'I have advised a prodigious number of clients, "'and have dealt with some exceedingly awkward difficulties in my time, "'but this was the first occasion on which I had ever found myself "'advising a young lady how to obtain her release from a marriage engagement. "'The suggestion I offered amounted briefly to this— I recommended her to tell Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite, at a private interview, of course, that he had, to her certain knowledge, betrayed the mercenary nature of the motive on his side. She was then to add that their marriage, after what she had discovered, was a simple impossibility, and she was to put it to him whether he thought it wisest to secure her silence by falling in with her views, or to force her, by opposing them, to make the motive under which she was acting generally known. If he attempted to defend himself, or to deny the facts, she was, in that event, to refer him to me. Miss Verinder listened attentively till I had done. She then thanked me very prettily for my advice, but informed me at the same time that it was impossible for her to follow it. "'May I ask,' I said, "'what objection you see to following it?' She hesitated, and then met me with a question on her side. "'Suppose you were asked to express your opinion of Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite's conduct?' she began. Yes. What would you call it? I should call it the conduct of a meanly deceitful man. Mr. Bruff, I have believed in that man. I have promised to marry that man. How can I tell him he is mean? How can I tell him he has deceived me? How can I disgrace him in the eyes of the world after that? I have degraded myself by ever thinking of him as my husband. If I say what you tell me to say to him— I am owning that I have degraded myself to his face. I can't do that. After what has passed between us, I can't do that. The shame of it would be nothing to him, but the shame of it would be unendurable to me. Here was another of the marked peculiarities in her character disclosing itself to me without reserve. Here was her sensitive horror of the bare contact with anything mean, blinding her to every consideration of what she owed to herself— hurrying her into a false position which might compromise her in the estimation of all her friends. Up to this time I had been a little diffident about the propriety of the advice I had given to her, but after what she had just said I had no sort of doubt that it was the best advice that could have been offered, and I felt no sort of hesitation in pressing it on her again. She only shook her head and repeated her objection in other words. "'He has been intimate enough with me to ask me to be his wife. "'He has stood high enough in my estimation to obtain my consent. "'I can't tell him to his face that he is the most contemptible of living creatures after that.' "'But, my dear Miss Rachel,' I remonstrated, "'it's equally impossible for you to tell him that you withdraw from your engagement "'without giving some reason for it. "'I shall say that I have thought it over, "'and that I am satisfied it will be best for both of us if we part.' 
No more than that? No more. Have you thought of what he may say on his side? He may say what he pleases. It was impossible not to admire her delicacy and her resolution, and it was equally impossible not to feel that she was putting herself in the wrong. I entreated her to consider her own position. I reminded her that she would be exposing herself to the most odious misconstruction of her motives. "'You can't brave public opinion,' I said, at the command of private feeling. "'I can,' she answered. "'I have done it already.' "'What do you mean?' "'You have forgotten the moonstone, Mr. Bruff. "'Have I not braved public opinion there, "'with my own private reasons for it?' "'Her answer silenced me for the moment. "'It set me trying to trace the explanation of her conduct "'at the time of the loss of the moonstone, "'out of the strange avowal which had just escaped her. "'I might perhaps have done it when I was younger. "'I certainly couldn't do it now.' "'I tried a last remonstrance before we returned to the house.' She was just as immovable as ever. My mind was in a strange conflict of feelings about her when I left her that day. She was obstinate. She was wrong. She was interesting. She was admirable. She was deeply to be pitied. I made her promise to write to me the moment she had any news to send. And I went back to my business in London with a mind exceedingly ill at ease. On the evening of my return, before it was possible for me to receive my promised letter, I was surprised by a visit from Mr. Abelwhite, the elder, and was informed that Mr. Godfrey had got his dismissal, and had accepted it that very day. With the view I already took of the case, the bare fact stated in the words that I have underlined revealed Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite's motive for submission as plainly as if he had acknowledged it himself. He needed a large sum of money, and he needed it by a given time. Rachel's income, which would have helped him to do anything else, would not help him here, and Rachel had accordingly released herself, without encountering a moment's serious opposition on his part. If I am told that this is mere speculation, I ask, in my turn, what other theory will account for his giving up a marriage which would have maintained him in splendour for the rest of his life? Any exultation I might otherwise have felt at the lucky turn which things had now taken was effectually checked by what passed at my interview with old Mr. Abelwhite. He came, of course, to know whether I could give him any explanation of Miss Verinder's extraordinary conduct. It is needless to say that I was quite unable to afford him the information he wanted. The annoyance which I thus inflicted, following on the irritation produced by a recent interview with his son, threw Mr. Abelwhite off his guard. Both his looks and his language convinced me that Miss Verinda would find him a merciless man to deal with when he joined the ladies at Brighton the next day. I had a restless night, considering what I ought to do next. How my reflections ended, and how thoroughly well-founded my distrust of old Mr. Abelwhite proved to be, are items of information which, as I am told, have already been put tidily in their proper places by that exemplary person, Miss Clack. I have only to add, in completion of her narrative, that Miss Verinder found a quiet and repose which she sadly needed, poor thing, in my house at Hampstead. She honoured us by making a long stay. My wife and daughters were charmed with her, and when the executors decided on the appointment of a new guardian, I feel sincere pride and pleasure in recording that my guest and my family parted like old friends on either side. End of part 31The Moonstone, Part 32. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone, by Wilkie Collins, read by Joel Portinger. The Discovery of the Truth, Second Narrative. Chapter 2. The next thing I have to do is to present such additional information as I possess on the subject of the Moonstone, or, to speak more correctly, on the subject of the Indian plot to steal the diamond. The little that I have to tell is, as I think I have already said, of some importance, nevertheless, in respect of its bearing very remarkably on the events which are still to come. About a week, or ten days after Miss Verinder had left us, one of my clerks entered the private room at my office, with a card in his hand, and informed me that a gentleman was below who wanted to speak to me. 
I looked at the card. There was a foreign name written on it, which has escaped my memory. It was followed by a line written in English at the bottom of the card, which I remember perfectly well. Recommended by Mr. Septimus Luker. The audacity of a person in Mr. Luker's position, presuming to recommend anybody to me, took me so completely by surprise that I sat silent for the moment, wondering whether my own eyes had not deceived me. The clerk, observing my bewilderment, favoured me with the result of his own observation of the stranger who was waiting downstairs. "'He's a rather remarkable-looking man, sir, so dark in the complexion that we all set him down in the office for an Indian, or something of that sort.' Associating the clerk's idea with a very offensive line inscribed on the card in my hand, I instantly suspected that the moonstone was at the bottom of Mr. Luker's recommendation, and of the stranger's visit at my office. To the astonishment of my clerk, I at once decided on granting an interview to the gentleman below. In justification of the highly unprofessional sacrifice to mere curiosity which I thus made, Permit me to remind anybody who may read these lines that no living person, in England at any rate, can claim to have had such an intimate connection with the romance of the Indian diamond as mine has been. I was entrusted with a secret of Colonel Herncastle's plan for escaping assassination. I received the Colonel's letters, periodically reporting himself a living man. I drew his will, leaving the moonstone to Miss Verinder. I persuaded his executor to act on the chance that the jewel might prove to be a valuable acquisition to the family. And, lastly, I combated Mr. Franklin Blake's scruples and induced him to be the means of transporting the diamond to Lady Verinder's house. If anyone can claim a prescriptive right of interest in the moonstone and in everything connected with it, I think it is hardly to be denied that I am the man. The moment my mysterious client was shown in, I felt an inner conviction that I was in the presence of one of the three Indians, probably of the chief. He was carefully dressed in European costume, but his swarthy complexion, his long, lithe figure, and his grave and graceful politeness of manner were enough to betray his oriental origin to any intelligent eyes that looked at him. I pointed to a chair, and begged to be informed of the nature of his business with me. After first apologizing, in an excellent selection of English words, for the liberty which he had taken in disturbing me, the Indian produced a small parcel, the outer covering of which was of cloth of gold. Removing this and a second wrapping of some silken fabric, he placed a little box or casket on my table, most beautifully and richly inlaid in jewels on an ebony ground. "'I have come, sir,' he said, "'to ask you to lend me some money.' and I leave this as an assurance to you that my debt will be paid back. I pointed to his card. And you apply to me, I rejoined, at Mr. Luca's recommendation. The Indian bowed. May I ask how it is that Mr. Luca himself did not advance the money with that he require? Mr. Luca informed me, sir, that he had no money to lend. And so he recommended you to come to me. The Indian, in his turn, pointed to the card. "'It is written here,' he said. Briefly answered, and thoroughly to the purpose, if the moonstone had been in my possession, this oriental gentleman would have murdered me, I am well aware, without a moment's hesitation. At the same time, and barring that slight drawback, I am bound to testify that he was the perfect model of a client. He might not have respected my life, but he did what none of my own countrymen have ever done in all my experience of them. He respected my time. "'I am sorry,' I said, "'that you should have had the trouble of coming to me. Mr. Luker is quite mistaken in sending you here. I am trusted, like other men of my profession, with money to lend, but I never lend it to strangers, and I never lend it on such a security as you have produced.' Far from attempting, as other people would have done, to induce me to relax my own rules, the Indian only made me another bow, and wrapped up his box in its two coverings without a word of protest. He rose. This admirable assassin rose to go the moment I had answered him. "'Will your condescension towards a stranger excuse my asking one question?' said he. "'Before I take my leave?' I bowed on my side. Only one question at parting. The average, in my experience, was fifty. "'Supposing, sir, it had been possible and customary for you to lend me the money,' he said, 
in what space of time would it have been possible and customary for me to pay it back? According to the usual course pursued in this country, I answered, you would have been entitled to pay the money back if you liked in one year's time from the date at which it was first advanced to you. The Indian made me a last bow, the lowest of all, and suddenly and softly walked out of the room. It was done in a moment, in a noiseless, supple, cat-like way, which little startled me, I own. As soon as I was composed enough to think, I arrived at one distinct conclusion in reference to the otherwise incomprehensible visitor who had favoured me with a call. His face, voice, and manner, while I was in his company, were under such perfect control that they set all scrutiny at defiance, but he had given me one chance of looking under the smooth outer surface of him for all that. He had not shown the slightest sign of attempting to fix anything that I said to him in his mind, until I mentioned the time at which it was customary to permit the earliest repayment, on the part of the debtor, of money that had been advanced as a loan. When I gave him that piece of information, he looked me straight in the face, while I was speaking, for the first time. The inference I drew from this was, that he had a special purpose in asking me his last question, and a special interest in hearing my answer to it. The more carefully I reflected on what had passed between us, the more shrewdly I suspected the production of the casket, and the application for the loan, of having been mere formalities, designed to pave the way for the parting inquiry addressed to me. I had satisfied myself of the correctness of this conclusion, and was trying to get on a step farther and penetrate the Indian's motives next, when a letter was brought to me which proved to be from no less a person than Mr. Septimus Lucre himself. He asked my pardon in terms of sickening servility, and assured me that he could explain matters to my satisfaction if I would honour him by consenting to a personal interview. I made another unprofessional sacrifice to mere curiosity. I honoured him by making an appointment at my office for the next day. Mr. Lucre was, in every respect, such an inferior creature to the Indian. He was so vulgar, so ugly, so cringing, and so prosy, that he is quite unworthy of being reported at any length in these pages. The substance of what he had to tell me may be fairly stated as follows. The day before I had received the visit of the Indian, Mr. Lucre had been favoured with a call from that accomplished gentleman. In spite of his European disguise, Mr. Lucre had instantly identified his visitor with a chief of the three Indians, who had formerly annoyed him by loitering around his house, and who had left him no alternative but to consult the magistrate. From this startling discovery he had rushed to the conclusion, naturally enough I own, that he must certainly be in the company of one of the three men who had blindfolded him, gagged him, and robbed him of his banker's receipt. The result was that he became quite paralysed with terror, and that he firmly believed his last hour had come. On his side the Indian preserved the character of a perfect stranger. He produced the little casket, and made exactly the same application which he had afterward made to me. As the speediest way of getting rid of him, Mr. Lucre had at once declared that he had no money. The Indian had thereupon asked to be informed of the best and safest person to apply to for the loan he wanted. Mr. Lucre had answered that the best and safest person in such cases was usually a respectable solicitor. Asked to name some one individual of that character and profession, Mr. Lucre had mentioned to me, for the one simple reason that, in the extremity of his terror, Mine was the first name which had occurred to him. The perspiration was pouring off me like rain, sir, the wretched creature concluded. Oh, I didn't know what I was talking about, and I hope you'll overlook it, Mr. Bruff, sir, in consideration of my having been really and truly frightened out of my wits. I excused the fellow graciously enough. It was the readiest way of releasing myself from the sight of him. Before he left me, I detained him to make one inquiry. Had the Indian said anything noticeable at the moment of quitting Mr. Lucas's house? Yes, the Indian had put precisely the same question to Mr. Lucas at parting which he had put to me, receiving, of course, the same answer which I had given him. What did it mean? Mr. Lucas's explanation gave me no assistance towards solving the problem. My own unaided ingenuity, consulted next, proved quite unequal to grapple with the difficulty. I had a dinner engagement that evening, and I went upstairs in no very genial frame of mind, little suspecting that the way to my dressing-room and the way to discovery meant, on this particular occasion, one and the same thing.
Chapter 3 The prominent personage among the guests at the dinner party I found to be Mr. Murthwaite. On his appearance in England some months since, society had been greatly interested in the traveller, as a man who had passed through many dangerous adventures and who had escaped to tell the tale. He had now announced his intention of returning to the scene of his exploits, and of penetrating into regions left still unexplored. This magnificent indifference to presuming on his luck, and to placing his safety in peril for the second time, revived the flagging interest of the worshippers in the hero. The law of chances was clearly against his escaping on this occasion. It is not every day that we can meet an eminent person at dinner, and feel that there is a reasonable prospect of the news of his murder being the news that we hear of him next. When the gentlemen were left by themselves in the dining-room, I found myself sitting next to Mr. Murthwaite. The guests present being all English, it is needless to say that, as soon as the wholesome check exercised by the presence of the ladies was removed, the conversation turned on politics as a necessary result. In respect to this all-absorbing national topic, I happen to be one of the most un-English Englishmen living. As a general rule, political talk appears to me to be of all talk the most dreary and the most profitless. Glancing at Mr. Murthwaite, when the bottles had made their first round of the table, I found that he was apparently of my way of thinking. He was doing it very dexterously, with all possible consideration for the feelings of the host, but it is not the less certain that he was composing himself for a nap. It struck me as an experiment worth attempting to try whether a judicious allusion to the subject of the moonstone would keep him awake, and if it did, to see what he thought of the last new complication in the Indian conspiracy as revealed in the prosaic precincts of my office. "'If I am not mistaken, Mr. Murthwaite, I began, you were acquainted with the late Lady Verinder, and you took some interest in the strange succession of events which ended in the loss of the moonstone. The eminent traveller did me the honour of waking up in an instant, and asking me who I was. I informed him of my professional connection with the Herncastle family, not forgetting the curious position which I had occupied towards the colonel and his diamond in the bygone time. Mr. Murthwaite shifted round in his chair, so as to put the rest of the company behind him, conservatives and liberals alike, and concentrated his whole attention on plain Mr. Bruff of Gray's Inn Square. "'Have you heard anything lately of the Indians?' he asked. "'I have every reason to believe,' I answered, "'that one of them had an interview with me in my office yesterday.' Mr. Murthwaite was not an easy man to astonish, but that last answer of mine completely staggered him. I described what had happened to Mr. Luker, and what had happened to myself, exactly as I have described it here. "'It is clear that the Indian's parting inquiry had an object,' I added. "'Why should he be so anxious to know the time at which a borrower of money is usually privileged to pay the money back?' "'Is it possible that you don't see his motive, Mr. Bruff?' "'I am ashamed of my stupidity, Mr. Murthwaite, but I certainly don't see it.' The great traveller became quite interested in sounding the immense vacuity of my dullness to its lowest depths. "'Let me ask you one question,' he said. "'In what position does the conspiracy to seize the moonstone now stand?' "'I can't say,' I answered. "'The Indian plot is a mystery to me.' "'The Indian plot, Mr. Bruff, can only be a mystery to you, because you have never seriously examined it.' Shall we run over it together, from the time when you drew Colonel Herncastle's will, to the time when the Indian called at your office? In your position it may be of very serious importance to the interests of Miss Verinder that you should be able to take a clear view of this matter in case of need. Tell me, bearing that in mind, whether you will penetrate the Indian's motive for yourself, or whether you wish me to save you the trouble of making any inquiry into it. It is needless to say that I thoroughly appreciated the practical purpose which I now saw that he had in view, and that the first of the two alternatives was the alternative I chose. "'Very well,' said Mr. Murthwaite. "'We will take the question of the ages of the three Indians first. I can testify that they all look much about the same age, and you can decide for yourself whether the man whom you saw was or was not in the prime of life. Not forty, you think?' 
My idea, too. We will say not forty. Now look back at the time when Colonel Herncastle came to England, and when you were concerned in the plan he adopted to preserve his life. I don't want you to count the years. I will only say it is clear that these present Indians, at their age, must be the successors of three other Indians, high-caste Brahmins, all of them, Mr. Bruff, when they left their native country, who followed the colonel to these shores. Very well. These present men of ours have succeeded to the men who were here before them. If they had only done that, the matter would not have been worth inquiring into. But they have done more. They have succeeded to the organization which their predecessors established in this country. Don't start. The organization is a very trumpery affair, according to our ideas, I have no doubt. I should reckon it up as including the command of money, the services, when needed, of that shady sort of Englishman who lives in the byways of foreign life in London, and, lastly, the secret sympathy of such few men of their own country, and, formerly, at least, of their own religion, as happen to be employed in ministering to some of the multitudinous wants of this great city. Nothing very formidable, as you see, but worth notice at starting, because we may find occasion to refer to the modest little Indian organization as we go on. Having now cleared the ground, I am going to ask you a question, and I expect your experience to answer it. What was the event which gave the Indians their first chance of seizing the diamond? I understood the allusion to my experience. The first chance they got, I replied, was clearly offered to them by Colonel Herncastle's death. They would be aware of his death, I suppose, as a matter of course. And his death, as you say, gave them their first chance. Up to that time the moonstone was safe in the strong room of the bank. You drew the colonel's will, leaving his jewel to his niece, and the will was proved in the usual way. As a lawyer, you can be at no loss to know what course the Indians would take under English advice after that. "'They would provide themselves with a copy of the will from the doctor's commons,' I said. "'Exactly. One or the other of those shady Englishmen to whom I have alluded would get them the copy you have described.' The copy would inform them that the moonstone was bequeathed to the daughter of Lady Verinder, and that Mr. Blake the Elder, or some person appointed by him, was to place it in her hands. You will agree with me that the necessary information about persons in the position of Lady Verinder and Mr. Blake would be perfectly easy to obtain. The one difficulty for the Indians would be to decide whether they should make their attempt on the diamond when it was in course of removal from the keeping of the bank, or whether they should wait until it was taken down to Yorkshire, to Lady Verinder's house. The second way would be manifestly the safest way, and there you have the explanation of the appearance of the Indians at Frizzing Hall, disguised as jugglers, and waiting their time. In London, it is needless to say, they had their organization at their disposal, to keep them informed of events. Two men would do it, one to follow anybody who went from Mr. Blake's house to the bank, and one to treat the lower men-servants with beer, and to hear the news of the house. These commonplace precautions would readily inform them that Mr. Franklin Blake had been to the bank, and that Mr. Franklin Blake was the only person in the house who was going to visit Lady Verinda. What actually followed upon that discovery you remember, no doubt, quite as correctly as I do. I remembered that Franklin Blake had detected one of the spies in the street, that he had, in consequence, advanced the time of his arrival in Yorkshire by some hours, and that, thanks to old Betridge's excellent advice, he had lodged the diamond in the bank at Frizzing Hall before the Indians were so much as prepared to see him in their neighbourhood. All perfectly clear so far, but the Indians, being ignorant of the precaution thus taken, how was it that they had made no attempt on Lady Verinder's house, in which they must have supposed the diamond to be, through the whole of the interval that elapsed before Rachel's birthday? In putting this difficulty to Mr. Murthwaite, I thought it right to add that I had heard of the little boy and the drop of ink and the rest of it, and that any explanation based on the theory of clairvoyance was an explanation which would carry no conviction whatever with it to my mind. "'Nor to mine either,' said Mr. Murthwaite. "'The clairvoyance in this case is simply a development of the romantic side of the Indian character. It would be a refreshment and an encouragement to those men—' quite inconceivable, I grant you, to the English mind, 
to surround their wearisome and perilous errand in this country with a certain halo of the marvellous and the supernatural. Their boy is unquestionably a sensitive subject to the mesmeric influence, and, unto that influence, he has no doubt reflected what was already in the mind of the person mesmerizing him. I have tested the theory of clairvoyance, and I have never found the manifestations get beyond that point. The Indians don't investigate the matter in this way. The Indians look upon their boy as a seer of things invisible to their eyes, and, I repeat, in that marvel they find the source of a new interest in the purpose that unites them. I only notice this as offering a curious view of human character, which must be quite new to you. We have nothing whatever to do with clairvoyance, or with mesmerism, or with anything else that is hard of belief to a practical man, in the inquiry that we are now pursuing. My object in following the Indian plot, step by step, is to trace results back, by rational means, to natural causes. Have I succeeded to your satisfaction so far? Not a doubt of it, Mr. Murthwaite. I am waiting, however, with some anxiety to hear the rational explanation of the difficulty which I have just now had the honour of submitting to you. Mr. Murthwaite smiled. "'It's the easiest difficulty to deal with of all,' he said. "'Permit me to begin by admitting your statement of the case as a perfectly correct one. "'The Indians were undoubtedly not aware of what Mr. Franklin Blake had done with the diamond, "'for we find them making their first mistake on the first night of Mr. Blake's arrival at his aunt's house.' "'Their first mistake?' I repeated. "'Certainly. The mistake of allowing themselves to be surprised lurking about the terrace at night by Gabriel Betridge. However, they had the merit of seeing for themselves that they had taken a false step, for, as you say, again, with plenty of time at their disposal, they never came near the house for weeks afterward. Why, Mr. Murthwaite, that's what I want to know. Why? Because no Indian, Mr. Bruff, ever runs an unnecessary risk. The clause you drew in Colonel Herncastle's will informed them, didn't it, that the moonstone was to pass absolutely into Miss Verinda's possession on her birthday. Very well. Tell me which was the safest course for men in their position, to make their attempt on the diamond while it was under the control of Mr. Franklin Blake, who had shown already that he could suspect and outwit them, or to wait till the diamond was at the disposal of a young girl who would innocently delight in wearing the magnificent jewel at every possible opportunity. Perhaps you want a proof that my theory is correct. Take the conduct of the Indians themselves as the proof. They appeared at the house after waiting all those weeks on Miss Verinda's birthday, and they were rewarded for the patient accuracy of their calculations by seeing the moonstone in the bosom of her dress. When I heard the story of the colonel and the diamond later in the evening, I felt so sure about the risk Mr. Franklin Blake had run. They would certainly have attacked him if he had not happened to ride back to Lady Verinder's in the company of other people, and I was so strongly convinced of the worst risks still in store for Miss Verinda that I recommended following the colonel's plan and destroying the identity of the gems by having it cut into separate stones. How its extraordinary disappearance that night made my advice useless and utterly defeated the Hindu plot, and how all further action on the part of the Indians was paralyzed the next day by their confinement in prison as rogues and vagabonds, you know as well as I do. The first act in the conspiracy closes there. Before we go on to the second, may I ask whether I have met your difficulty with an explanation which is satisfactory to the mind of a practical man? It was impossible to deny that he had met my difficulty fairly, thanks to his superior knowledge of the Indian character, and thanks to his not having hundreds of other wills to think of since Colonel Herncastle's time. So far, so good, resumed Mr. Murthwaite. The first chance the Indians had of seizing the diamond was a chance lost, on the day when they were committed to the prison at Frizzing Hall. When did the second chance offer itself? The second chance offered itself as I am in a condition to prove, while they were still in confinement. He took out his pocket-book, and opened it at a particular leaf, before he went on. I was staying, he resumed, with some friends at Frizzing Hall at the time. A day or two before the Indians were set free, on a Monday, I think, the governor of the prison came to me with a letter. It had been left for the Indians by one Mrs. Macon, of whom they had hired the lodging in which they lived. 
and it had been delivered at Mrs. Macon's door in ordinary course of post on the previous morning. The prison authorities had noticed that the postmark was Lambeth, and that the address on the outside, though expressed in correct English, was, in form, oddly at variance with the customary method of directing a letter. On opening it, they had found the contents to be written in a foreign language, which they rightly guessed at Hindustani. Their object in coming to me was, of course, to have the letter translated to them. I took a copy in my pocket-book of the original, and of my translation, and there they are at your service. He handed me the open pocket-book. The address of the letter was the first thing copied. It was all written in one paragraph, without any attempt at punctuation, thus. To the three Indian men living with the lady called Macon at Frizzing Hall in Yorkshire. The Hindu characters followed, and the English translation appeared at the end, expressed in these mysterious words. In the name of the regent of the night, whose seat is on the antelope, whose arms embrace the four corners of the earth. Brothers, turn your faces to the south, and come to me in the street of many noises, which leads down to the muddy river. The reason is this. My own eyes have seen it. There the letter ended, without either date or signature. I handed it back to Mr. Murthwaite, and owned that this curious specimen of Hindu correspondence rather puzzled me. I can explain the first sentence to you, he said, and the conduct of the Indians themselves will explain the rest. The god of the moon is represented, in the Hindu mythology, as a four-armed deity, seated on an antelope, and one of his titles is the Regent of the Night. Here, then, to begin with, is something which looks suspiciously like an indirect reference to the moonstone. Now, let us see what the Indians did, after the prison authorities had allowed them to receive their letter. On the very day when they were set free, they went at once to the railway station, and took their places in the first train that started for London. We all thought it a pity at Frizzing Hall that their proceedings were not privately watched. But, after Lady Verinder had dismissed the police officer, and had stopped all further inquiry into the loss of the diamond, no one else could presume to stir in the matter. The Indians were free to go to London, and to London they went. What was the next news we heard of them, Mr. Bruff? They were annoying Mr. Luker, I answered, by loitering about his house at Lambeth. Did you read the report of Mr. Luker's application to the magistrate? Yes. In the course of his statement he referred, if you remember, to a foreign workman in his apartment, whom he had dismissed on suspicion of attempted theft, and whom he also distrusted as possibly acting in collusion with the Indians who had annoyed him. The inference is pretty plain, Mr. Bruff, as to who wrote the letter which puzzled you just now, and as to which of Mr. Luker's oriental treasures the workmen had attempted to steal. The inference, as I hastened to acknowledge, was too plain to need being pointed out. I had never doubted that the moonstone had found its way into Mr. Luker's hands, at the time to which Mr. Murthwaite alluded. My only question had been, how had the Indians discovered the circumstance? This question, the most difficult to deal with of all, as I had thought, had now received its answer, like the rest. Lawyer as I was, I began to feel that I might trust Mr. Murthwaite to lead me blindfold through the last windings of the labyrinth, along which he had guided me thus far. I paid him the compliment of telling him this, and found my little concession very graciously received. "'You shall give me a piece of information in your turn before we go on,' he said. "'Somebody must have taken the moonstone from Yorkshire to London, and somebody must have raised money on it, or it would never have been in Mr. Luker's possession. Has there been any discovery made of who that person was?' "'None that I know of. There was a story, was there not?' about Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite, I am told he is an eminent philanthropist, which is decidedly against him to begin with. I heartily agreed in this with Mr. Murthwaite. At the same time I felt bound to inform him, without, it is needless to say, mentioning Miss Verinder's name, that Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite had been cleared of all suspicion, on evidence which I could answer for as entirely beyond dispute. "'Very well,' said Mr. Murthwaite quietly. 
let us leave it time to clear the matter up. In the meanwhile, Mr. Bruff, we must get back again to the Indians, on your account. Their journey to London simply ended in their becoming the victims of another defeat. The loss of their second chance of seizing the diamond is mainly attributable, as I think, to the cunning and foresight of Mr. Lucre, who doesn't stand at the top of the prosperous and ancient profession of usury for nothing. By the prompt dismissal of the man in his employment, he deprived the Indians of the assistance which their confederate would have rendered them in getting into the house. By the prompt transport of the moonstone to his bankers, he took the conspirators by surprise before they were prepared with a new plan for robbing him. How the Indians, in this latter case, suspected what he had done and how they contrived to possess themselves of his banker's receipt are events too recent to need dwelling on. Let it be enough to say that they know the moonstone to be once more out of their reach, deposited under the general description of a valuable gem in a banker's strong room. Now, Mr. Bruff, what is their third chance of seizing the diamond, and when will it come? As the question passed his lips, I penetrated the motive of the Indian's visit to my office at last. "'I see it!' I exclaimed. "'The Indians take it for granted, as we do, that the moonstone has been pledged, and they want to be certainly informed of the earliest period at which the pledge can be redeemed, because that will be the earliest period at which the diamond can be removed from the safekeeping of the bank.' "'I told you you would find it out for yourself, Mr. Bruff, if I only gave you a fair chance. "'In a year from the time when the moonstone was pledged, the Indians will be on the watch for their third chance. "'Mr. Lucre's own lips have told them how long they will have to wait, "'and your respectable authority has satisfied them that Mr. Lucre has spoken the truth. "'When do we suppose, at a rough guess, that the diamond found its way into the money-lender's hands?' "'Towards the end of last June,' I answered, "'as well as I can reckon it.' "'And we are now in the year forty-eight. "'Very good. "'If the unknown person who has pledged the moonstone "'can redeem it in a year, "'the jewel will be in that person's possession again "'at the end of June forty-nine. "'I shall be thousands of miles away from England "'and English news at that date, "'but it may be worth your while to take a note of it "'and to arrange to be in London at the time.' "'You think something serious will happen?' I said. I think I shall be safer, he answered, among the fiercest fanatics of Central Asia than I should be if I crossed the door of the bank with a moonstone in my pocket. The Indians have been defeated twice running, Mr. Bruff. It's my firm belief that they won't be defeated a third time. Those were the last words he said on the subject. The coffee came in, the guests rose, and dispersed themselves about the room, and we joined the ladies of the dinner-party upstairs. I made a note of the date, and it may not be amiss if I close my narrative by repeating that note here. June 49. Expect news of the Indians towards the end of the month. And that done, I hand the pen, which I have now no further claim to use, to the writer who follows next. End of section 32The Moonstone, Section 33. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone, by Wilkie Collins. Section 33, Second Period, Third Narrative. Contributed by Franklin Blake. Chapter 1. In the spring of the year, 1849, I was wandering in the east, and had then recently altered the travelling plans which I had laid out some months before, and which I had communicated to my lawyer and my banker in London. This change made it necessary for me to send one of my servants to obtain my letters and remittances from the English consul in a certain city, which was no longer included as one of my resting places in my new travelling scheme. The man was to join me again at an appointed place and time. An accident, for which he was not responsible, delayed him on his errand. For a week I and my people waited, and camped on the borders of a desert. At the end of that time the missing man made his appearance, with money and the letters, 
at the entrance of my tent. "'I am afraid I bring you bad news, sir,' he said, and pointed to one of the letters, which had a mourning border around it, and the address on which was in the handwriting of Mr. Bruff. I know nothing, in a case of this kind, so unendurable as suspense. The letter with the mourning border was the letter that I opened first. It informed me that my father was dead, and that I was heir to his great fortune. The wealth which had thus fallen into my hands brought its responsibilities with it, and Mr. Bruff entreated me to lose no time in returning to England. By daybreak the next morning I was on my way back to my own country. The picture presented of me by my old friend Betridge at the time of my departure from England is, as I think, a little overdrawn. He has, in his own quaint way, interpreted seriously one of his young mistress's many satirical references to my foreign education, and has persuaded himself that he actually saw those French, German, and Italian sides to my character, which my lively cousin only professed to discover in jest, and which never had any real existence, except in our good friend Betridge's own brain. But, barring the drawback, I am bound to own that he has stated no more than the truth in representing me as wounded to the heart by Rachel's treatment, and as leaving England in the first keenness of suffering caused by the bitterest disappointment of my life. I went abroad resolved, if change and absence could help me, to forget her. It is, I am persuaded, no true view of human nature which denies that change and absence do help a man under these circumstances. They force his attention away from the exclusive contemplation of his own sorrow. I never forgot her, but the pang of remembrance lost its worst bitterness little by little, as time, distance, and novelty interposed themselves more and more effectually between Rachel and me. On the other hand, it is no less certain that, with the act of turning homeward, the remedy which had gained its ground so steadily began now just as steadily to drop back. The nearer I drew to the country which she inhabited, and to the prospect of seeing her again, the more irresistibly her influence began to recover its hold on me. On leaving England she was the last person in the world whose name I would have suffered to pass my lips. On returning to England she was the first person I inquired after, when Mr. Bruff and I met again. I was informed, of course, of all that had happened in my absence. In other words, of all that has been related here in continuation of Betridge's narrative, one circumstance only being accepted, Mr. Bruff did not, at that time, feel himself at liberty to inform me of the motives which had privately influenced Rachel and Godfrey Ablewhite in recalling the marriage promise on either side. I troubled him with no embarrassing questions on this delicate subject. It was relief enough to me, after the jealous disappointment caused by hearing that she had ever contemplated being Godfrey's wife, to know that reflection had convicted her of acting rashly, and that she had effected her own release from her marriage engagement. Having heard the story of the past, my next inquiries, still inquiries after Rachel, advanced naturally to the present time. Under whose care had she been placed after leaving Mr. Bruff's house, and where was she living now? She was living under the care of a widowed sister of the late Sir John Verinder, one Mrs. Meridew, whom her mother's executors had requested to act as guardian, and who had accepted the proposal. They were reported to me as getting on together admirably well, and as being now established for the season in Mrs. Meridew's house in Portland Place. Half an hour after receiving this information I was on my way to Portland Place, without having had the courage to own it to Mr. Bruff. The man who answered the door was not sure whether Miss Verinder was at home or not. I sent him upstairs with my card, as the speediest way of setting the question at breast. The man came down again with an impenetrable face, and informed me that Miss Verinder was out. I might have suspected other people of purposely denying themselves to me, but it was impossible to suspect Rachel. I left word that I would call again at six o'clock that evening. At six o'clock I was informed, for the second time, that Miss Verinder was not at home. Had any message been left for me? No message had been left for me. Had Miss Verinda not received my card? The servant begged my pardon. Miss Verinda had received it. 
The inference was too plain to be resisted. Rachel declined to see me. On my side, I declined to be treated in this way without making an attempt, at least, to discover the reason for it. I sent up my name to Mrs. Meridew, and requested her to favour me with a personal interview at any hour which it might be most convenient to her to name. Mrs. Meridew made no difficulty about receiving me at once. I was shown into a comfortable little sitting-room, and found myself in the presence of a comfortable little elderly lady. She was so good as to feel great regret and much surprise, entirely on my account. She was at the same time, however, not in a position to offer me any explanation, or to press Rachel on a matter which appeared to relate to a question of private feeling alone. This was said over and over again, with a polite patience that nothing could tire, and this was all I gained by applying to Mrs. Meridew. My last chance was to write to Rachel. My servant took a letter to her the next day, with strict instructions to wait for an answer. The answer came back, literally, in one sentence. Miss Verinda begs to decline entering into any correspondence with Mr. Franklin Blake. Fond as I was of her, I felt indignantly the insult offered to me in that reply. Mr. Bruff came in to speak to me on business before I had recovered possession of myself. I dismissed the business on the spot, and laid the whole case before him. He proved to be as incapable of enlightening me as Mrs. Meridew herself. I asked him if any slander had been spoken of me in Rachel's hearing. Mr. Bruff was not aware of any slander of which I was the object. Had she referred to me in any way while she was staying under Mr. Bruff's roof? Never. Had she not so much as asked, during all my long absence, whether I was living or dead? No such question had ever passed her lips. I took out of my pocket-book the letter which poor Lady Verinda had written to me from Frizzing Hall on the day when I left her house in Yorkshire, and I pointed Mr. Bruff's attention to these two sentences in it. The valuable assistance which you rendered to the inquiry after the lost jewel is still an unpardoned offence in the present dreadful state of Rachel's mind. Moving blindfold in this matter, you have added to the burden of anxiety which she has had to bear by innocently threatening her secret with discovery through your exertions. Is it possible, I asked, that the feeling towards me which is there described is still as bitter as ever against me now? Mr. Bruff looked unaffectedly distressed. "'If you insist on an answer,' he said, "'I own I can place no other interpretation on her conduct than that.' I rang the bell, and directed my servant to pack my portmanteau, and to send out for a railway guide. Mr. Bruff asked, in astonishment, what I was going to do. "'I'm going to Yorkshire,' I answered, "'by the next train. "'May I ask for what purpose?' Mr. Bruff, the assistance I innocently rendered to the inquiry after the diamond was an unpardoned offence in Rachel's mind, nearly a year since, and it remains an unpardoned offence still. I won't accept that position. I am determined to find out the secret of her silence toward her mother, and her enmity toward me. If time, pains, and money can do it, I will lay my hand on the thief who took the moonstone. The worthy old gentleman attempted to remonstrate to induce me to listen to reason, to do his duty toward me, in short. I was deaf to everything that he could urge. No earthly consideration would, at that moment, have shaken the resolution that was in me. I shall take up the inquiry again, I went on, at the point where I dropped it, and I shall follow it onward, step by step, till I come to the present time. There are missing links in the evidence, as I left it, which Gabriel Betridge can supply. And to Gabriel Betridge I go. Toward sunset that evening, I stood again on the well-remembered terrace, and looked once more at the peaceful old country house. The gardener was the first person whom I saw in the deserted grounds. He had left Betridge an hour since, sunning himself in the customary corner of the back yard. I knew it well, and I said I would go and seek him myself. I walked round by the familiar paths and passages, and looked in at the open gate of the yard. There he was, the dear old friend of the happy days that were never to come again. 
There he was in the old corner, on the old beehive chair, with his pipe in his mouth, and his Robinson Crusoe on his lap, and his two friends, the dogs, dozing on either side of him. In the position in which I stood, my shadow was projected in front of me by the last slanting rays of the sun. Either the dogs saw it, or their keen scent informed them of my approach. They started up with a growl. Starting in his turn, the old man quieted them by a word, and then shaded his failing eyes with his hand, and looked inquiringly at the figure at the gate. My own eyes were full of tears. I was obliged to wait for a moment before I could trust myself to speak to him. CHAPTER Two. Betridge, I said, pointing to the well-remembered book on his knee. Has Robinson Crusoe informed you this evening that he might expect to see Franklin Blake? By the Lord Harry, Mr. Franklin, cried the old man, that's exactly what Robinson Crusoe has done. He struggled to his feet with my assistance and stood for a moment, looking backward and forward between Robinson Crusoe and me, apparently at a loss to discover which of us had surprised him most. The verdict ended in favour of the book. Holding it open before him in both hands, he surveyed the wonderful volume with a stare of unutterable anticipation, as if he expected to see Robinson Crusoe himself walk out of the pages and favour us with a personal interview. "'Here's the bit, Mr. Franklin,' he said, as soon as he had recovered the use of his speech. "'As I live by bread, sir, here's the bit I was reading the moment before you came in. Page 156, as follows. "'I stood like one thunderstruck, or as if I had been an apparition. "'If that isn't as much as to say, expect the sudden appearance of Mr. Franklin Blake. "'There's no meaning in the English language.' said Betridge, closing the book with a bang, and getting one of his hands free at last to take hold of the hand which I offered him. I had expected him, naturally enough under the circumstances, to overwhelm me with questions. But no, the hospitable impulse was the uppermost impulse in the old servant's mind when a member of the family appeared, no matter how, as a visitor at the house. "'Walk in, Mr. Franklin,' he said, opening the door behind him with his quaint old-fashioned bow. "'I'll ask what brings you here afterwards. I must make you comfortable first. There have been sad changes since you went away. The house is shut up, and the servants are gone. Never mind that. I'll cook your dinner, and the gardener's wife will make your bed. And if there's a bottle of our famous Latour Claret left in the cellar, down your throat, Mr. Franklin, that bottle shall go. Oh, I bid you welcome, sir. Oh, I bid you heartily come.' said the poor old fellow, fighting manfully against the gloom of the deserted house, and receiving me with a sociable and courteous attention of the bygone time. It vexed me to disappoint him, but the house was Rachel's house now. Could I eat in it or sleep in it after what had happened in London? The commonest sense of self-respect forbade me, properly forbade me, to cross the threshold. I took Betridge by the arm and led him out into the garden. There was no help for it. I was obliged to tell him the truth. Between his attachment to Rachel and his attachment to me, he was sorely puzzled and distressed at the turn that things had taken. His opinion, when he expressed it, was given in his usual downright manner, and was agreeably redolent of the most positive philosophy I know, the philosophy of the Betridge school. "'Miss Rachel has her faults. Oh, I've never denied it,' he began and riding the high horse now and then is one of them. She has been trying to ride over you, and you have put up with it. Lord, Mr. Franklin, don't you know women by this time better than that? You have heard me talk of the late Mrs. Betridge. I had heard him talk of the late Mrs. Betridge pretty often, invariably producing her as his one undeniable example of the inbred frailty and perversity of the other sex. In that capacity he exhibited her now. "'Very well, Mr. Franklin. Now listen to me. Different women have different ways of riding the eye horse. The late Mrs. Betridge took her exercise on that favorite female animal whenever I happened to deny her anything that she had set her heart on. So as sure as I came home from my work on these occasions, so sure was my wife to call up to me from the kitchen stairs and to say that, after my brutal treatment of her, she hadn't the heart to cook me my dinner.' I put up with it for some time, just as you are putting up with it now for Miss Rachel. 
At last my patience wore out. I went downstairs, and I took Mrs. Bettridge, affectionately, you understand, up in my arms, and carried her, holus bolus, into the best parlour, where she received her company. I said, "'That's the right place for you, my dear,' and so went back to the kitchen. I locked myself in, and took off my coat, and turned up my shirt-sleeves, and cooked my own dinner. When it was done, I served it up in my best manner, and enjoyed it most heartily. I had my pipe and my drop of grog afterward, and then I cleared the table and washed the crockery, and cleaned the knives and the forks, and put the things away, and swept up the hearth. When things were as bright and clean again as bright and clean could be, I opened the door and let Mrs. Betridge in. "'I've had my dinner, my dear,' I said, "'and I hope you'll find I have left the kitchen all that your fondest wishes can desire.' For the rest of that woman's life, Mr. Franklin, I never had to cook my dinner again. Moral, you have to put up with Miss Rachel in London. Don't put up with her in Yorkshire. Come back to the house. Quite unanswerable. I could only assure my good friend that even his powers of persuasion were, in this case, thrown away on me. It is a lovely evening, I said. I shall walk to Frizzing Hall and stay at the hotel, and you must come tomorrow morning and breakfast with me. I have something to say to you. Betridge shook his head gravely. I am heartily sorry for this, he said. I had hoped, Mr. Franklin, to hear that things were all smooth and pleasant again between you and Miss Rachel. If you must have your own way, sir, he continued after a moment's reflection, there is no need to go to Frizinghall tonight for a bed. It's to be had nearer than that. There's Hotherstone's farm, barely two miles from here. You can hardly object to that on Miss Rachel's account. The old man added slyly, Otherstone lives, Mr. Franklin, on his own free old. I remembered the place the moment Betridge mentioned it. The farmhouse stood in a sheltered inland valley on the banks of the prettiest stream in that part of Yorkshire, and the farmer had a spare bedroom and parlour which he was accustomed to let to artists, anglers, and tourists in general. A more agreeable place of abode during my stay in the neighbourhood I could not have wished to find. "'Are the rooms to let?' I inquired. "'Mrs. Otherstone herself, sir, asked for my good word to recommend the rooms yesterday. "'I'll take them, Betridge, with the greatest pleasure.' "'We went back to the yard, in which I had left my travelling bag. "'After putting a stick through the handle and swinging the bag over his shoulder, "'Betridge appeared to relapse into the bewilderment which my sudden appearance had caused "'when I surprised him in the beehive chair. "'He looked incredulously at the house.' and then he wheeled about and looked more incredulously still at me. "'I've lived a goodish long time in the world,' said this best and dearest of all old servants. "'But the like of this I never did expect to see. There stands the house, and here stands Mr. Franklin Blake, and damn me if one of them isn't turning his back on the other and going to sleep in a lodging.' He led the way out, wagging his head and growling ominously. "'There is only one more miracle that can happen,' he said to me over his shoulder. "'The next thing you'll do, Mr. Franklin, will be to pay me back that seven and sixpence you borrowed of me when you were a boy.' This stroke of sarcasm put him in a better humour with himself and with me. We left the house and passed through the lodge gates. Once clear of the grounds, the duties of hospitality, in Betridge's code of morals, ceased, and the privileges of curiosity began. He dropped back so as to let me get on a level with him. "'Fine evening for a walk, Mr. Franklin,' he said, as if we had just accidentally encountered each other at that moment. "'Supposing you had gone to the hotel at Frizzingall, sir?' "'Yes.' Well, "'I should have had the honour of breakfasting with you tomorrow morning. "'Come and breakfast with me at Otherstone's farm instead. "'Much obliged to you for your kindness, Mr. Franklin, "'but it wasn't exactly breakfast that I was driving at.' "'I think you mentioned that you had something to say to me. "'If it's no secret, sir,' said Betridge, "'suddenly abandoning the crooked way and taking the straight one. "'I'm burning to know what brought you down here, if you please, in this sudden way.' "'What brought me here before?' I asked. "'The Moonstone, Mr. Franklin. But what brings you now, sir?' "'The Moonstone again, Betridge.' The old man suddenly stood still, and looked at me in the grey twilight as if he suspected his own ears of deceiving him. "'If that's a joke, sir,' he said, 
I'm afraid I'm getting a little dull in my old age. I don't take it. It's no joke, I answered. I have come here to take up the inquiry which was dropped when I left England. I have come here to do what nobody has done yet, to find out who took the diamond. Let the diamond be, Mr. Franklin. Take my advice and let the diamond be. That cursed Indian jewel has misguided everybody who has come near it. Don't waste your money and your temper in the fine springtime of your life, sir, by meddling with the moonstone. How can you hope to succeed, save in your presence, when Sergeant Cuff himself made a mess of it? Sergeant Cuff, repeated Bettridge, shaking his forefinger at me sternly, the greatest policeman in England. My mind is made up, my old friend. Even Sergeant Cuff doesn't daunt me. By the by, I may want to speak to him sooner or later. Have you heard anything of him lately? The sergeant won't help you, Mr. Franklin. Why not? There has been an event, sir, in the police circles since he went away. The great Cuff has retired from business. He has got a little cottage at Dorking, and he's up to his eyes in the growing of roses. I have it in his own handwriting, Mr. Franklin. He has grown the white moss rose without budding it on the dog rose first. And Mr. Begby, the gardener, is to go to Dorking, and own that the sergeant has beaten him at last. It doesn't much matter, I said. I must do without Sergeant Cuff's help, and I must trust to you at starting. It is likely enough that I spoke rather carelessly. At any rate, Bettridge seemed to be piqued by something in the reply which I had just made to him. You might trust a worse than me, Mr. Franklin, I can tell you that, he said a little sharply. The tone in which he retorted, and a certain disturbance after he had spoken, which I detected in his manner, suggested to me that he was possessed of some information which he hesitated to communicate. "'I expect you to help me,' I said, picking up the fragments of evidence which Sergeant Cuff has left behind him. "'I know you can do that. Can you do no more?' "'What more can you expect from me, sir?' asked Bettridge, with an appearance of the utmost humility. "'I expect more from what you just said now.' "'Mere boasting, Mr. Franklin,' returned the old man, obstinately. "'Some people are born boasters. They never get over it to their dying day. I'm one of them.' There was only one way to take with him. I appealed to his interest in Rachel and his interest in me. "'Bettridge, would you be glad to hear that Rachel and I were good friends again? Oh, I have served your family, sir, to mighty little purpose, if you doubt it. Do you remember how Rachel treated me before I left England? As well as if it were yesterday. My lady herself wrote you a letter about it, and you were so good as to show the letter to me. It said that Miss Rachel was mortally offended with you for the part you had taken in trying to recover her jewel, and neither my lady nor you or anybody else could guess why. "'Quite true, Bettridge, and I come back from my travels and find her mortally offended with me still. I knew that the diamond was at the bottom of it last year, and I know that the diamond is at the bottom of it now. I have tried to speak to her, and she won't see me. I have tried to write to her, and she won't answer me. How, in heaven's name, am I to clear the matter up? The chance of searching into the loss of the moonstone is the one chance of inquiry that Rachel herself has left me.' Those words evidently put the case before him, as he had not seen it yet. He asked a question which satisfied me that I had shaken him. "'There is no ill feeling in this, Mr. Franklin, on your side, is there?' "'There was some anger,' I answered, when I left London, but that is all worn out now. I want to make Rachel come to an understanding with me, and I want nothing more.' "'You don't feel any fear, sir, supposing you make any discoveries.' in regard to what you may find out about Miss Rachel. I understood the jealous belief in his young mistress which prompted those words. I am as certain of her as you are, I answered. The fullest disclosure of her secret will reveal nothing that can alter her place in your estimation or in mine. Bettridge's last left scruples vanished at that. If I am doing wrong to help you, Mr. Franklin, he exclaimed, all I can say is, I am as innocent of seeing it as the babe unborn. I can put you on the road to discovery, if you can only go on by yourself. You remember that poor girl of ours, Rosanna Spearman? Of course. 
you always thought she had some sort of confession in regard to the matter of the moonstone which she wanted to make to you i certainly couldn't account for her strange conduct in any other way you may set that doubt at rest mr franklin whenever you please it was my turn to come to a standstill now i tried vainly in the gathering darkness to see his face in the surprise of the moment i asked a little impatiently what he meant steady sir proceeded betridge i mean what i say rosanna spearman left a sealed letter behind her a letter addressed to you where is it in the possession of a friend of hers at cobb's hole you must have heard tell when you were here last sir of limpin lucy a lame girl with a crutch the fisherman's daughter the same mr franklin why wasn't the letter forwarded to me limping lucy has a will of her own sir she wouldn't give it to any end but yours and you had left england before i could write to you let's go back betridge and get it at once too late sir to-night there are great savers of candles along our coast they go to bed early at cobb's hole nonsense we might get there in half an hour you might sir and when you did get there you would find the door locked he pointed to a light glimmering below us and at the same moment i heard through the stillness of the evening the bubbling of a stream there's the farm mr franklin make yourself comfortable for to-night and come to me to-morrow morning if you'll be so kind you will go with me to the fisherman's cottage yes sir early as early mr franklin as you like we descended the path that led to the farm end of section thirty three the moonstone part thirty four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the moonstone by wilkie collins read by joel portinger the discovery of the truth third narrative chapter three I have only the most indistinct recollections of what happened at Hotherstone's farm. I remember a hearty welcome, a prodigious supper, which would have fed a whole village in the east, a delightfully clean bedroom, with nothing in it to regret but that detestable product of the folly of our forefathers, a feather bed, a restless night, with much kindling of matches and many lightings of one's candle and an immense sensation of relief when the sun rose and there was a prospect of getting up. It had been arranged overnight with Betridge that I was to call for him on our way to Cobb's Hole, as early as I liked, which, interrupted by my patience to get possession of the letter, meant as early as I could. Without waiting for breakfast at the farm, I took a crust of bread in my hand and set forth, in some doubt whether I should not surprise the excellent Betridge in his bed. To my great relief, he proved to be quite as excited about the coming event as I was. I found him ready and waiting for me, with his stick in his hand. "'How are you this morning, Betridge?' "'Very poorly, sir.' "'I'm sorry to hear it. What do you complain of?' I complain of a new disease, Mr. Franklin, of my own inventin'. I don't want to alarm you, but you're certain to catch it before the morning is out. The devil I am! Do you feel an uncomfortable heat in the pit of your stomach, sir, and a nasty thumpin' at the top of your head? Ah, not yet. It will lay hold of you at Cobb's Hole, Mr. Franklin. I call it the detective fever, but I caught it first in the company of Sergeant Cuff. Hi, hi. And the cure in this instance is to open Rosanna Spearman's letter, I suppose. Come along, and let's get it. Early as it was, we found the fisherman's wife astir in her kitchen. On my presentation by Betridge, good Mrs. Yoland performed a social ceremony, strictly reserved, as I afterward learned, for strangers of distinction. She put a bottle of Dutch gin and a couple of clean pipes on the table, and opened the conversation by saying, what news from london sir before i could find an answer to this immensely comprehensive question an apparition advanced towards me out of a dark corner of the kitchen 
a wan, wild, haggard girl with remarkably beautiful hair, and with a fierce keenness in her eyes, came limping up on a crutch to the table on which I was leaning, and looked at me as if I were an object of mingled interest and horror, which it quite fascinated her to see. "'Mr. Bettridge,' she said, without taking her eyes off me, "'mention his name again, if you please.' "'This gentleman's name,' answered Bettridge, with a strong emphasis on gentleman, "'is Mr. Franklin Blake.' The girl turned her back on me and suddenly left the room. Good Mrs. Yoland, as I believe, made some apologies for her daughter's old behaviour, and Bettridge probably translated them into polite English. I speak of this in complete uncertainty. My attention was absorbed in following the sound of the girl's crutch. Thump, thump, up the wooden stairs. Thump, thump, across the room above our heads. Thump thump down the stairs again and there stood the apparition at the open door with a letter in its hand beckoning me out i left more apologies in the course of delivery behind me and followed this strange creature limping on before me faster and faster down the slope of the beach she led me behind some boats out of sight and hearing of the few people in the fishing village and then stopped and faced me for the first time stand there she said, I want to look at you. There was no mistaking the expression on her face. I inspired her with the strongest emotions of abhorrence and disgust. Let me not be vain enough to say that no woman had ever looked at me in this manner before. I will only venture on the more modest assertion that no woman had ever let me perceive it yet. There is a limit to the length of the inspection which a man can endure under certain circumstances. I attempted to direct Limping Lucy's attention to some less revolting object than my face. "'I think you have got a letter to give me,' I began. "'Is it the letter there in your hand?' "'Say that again,' was the only answer I received. I repeated the words, like a good child learning his lesson. "'No,' said the girl, speaking to herself, but keeping her eyes still mercilessly fixed on me. I can't find out what she saw in his face. I can't guess what she heard in his voice. She suddenly looked away from me and rested her head wearily on the top of her crutch. Oh, my poor dear, she said in the first soft tones which had fallen from her in my hearing. Oh, my lost darling, what could you see in this man? She lifted her head again fiercely and looked at me once more. Can you eat and drink? she asked. I did my best to preserve my gravity, and answered, Yes. Can you sleep? Yes. When you see a poor girl in service, do you feel no remorse? Certainly not. Why should I? She abruptly thrust the letter, as the phrase is, into my face. Take it! she exclaimed furiously. I never set eyes on you before. God Almighty forbid that I ever set eyes on you again. With those parting words, she limped away from me at the top of her speed. The one interpretation that I could put on her conduct has, no doubt, been anticipated by everybody. I could only suppose that she was mad. Having reached that inevitable conclusion, I turned to the more interesting object of investigation which was presented to me by Rosanna Spearman's letter. The address was written as follows. For Franklin Blake, Esquire, to be given into his own hands, and not to be trusted to any one else, by Lucy Yoland. I broke the seal. The envelope contained a letter, and this, in its turn, contained a slip of paper. I read the letter first. Sir, if you are curious to know the meaning of my behaviour to you while you were staying in the house of my mistress, Lady Verinder, do what you are told to do in the memorandum enclosed with this, and do it without any person being present to overlook you, your humble servant, Rosanna Spearman. I turned to the slip of paper next. Here is a literal copy of it, word for word. 
memorandum, to go to the shivering sand at the turn of the tide, to walk out on the South Spit until I get to South Spit Beacon and the flagstaff at the Coast Guard station above Cobb's Hall in a line together, to lay down on the rocks a stick or any straight thing to guide my hand exactly in the line of the beacon and the flagstaff, to take care in doing this that one end of the stick shall be at the edge of the rocks on the side of them which overlooks the quicksand, to feel along the stick among the seaweed beginning from the end of the stick which points towards the beacon for the chain, to run my hand along the chain when found until I come to the part of it which stretches over the edge of the rocks down into the quicksand, and then to pull the chain. Just as I had read the last words, underlined in the original, I heard the voice of Betridge behind me. The inventor of the detective fever had completely succumbed to that irresistible malady. "'I can't stand it any longer, Mr. Franklin. What does her letter say? For mercy's sake, sir, tell us what does the letter say?' I handed him the letter and the memorandum. He read the first without appearing to be much interested in it, but the second, the memorandum, produced a strong impression on him. "'The sergeant said it!' cried Betridge. "'From first to last, sir, the sergeant said that she had got a memorandum of the hiding-place, and here it is. Lord save us, Mr. Franklin! Here is the secret that puzzled everybody, from the great cuff downward, ready and waiting, as one may say, to show itself to you!' It's the ebb now, sir, as anybody may see for themselves. How long will it be till the turn of the tide? He looked up and observed a lad at work some little distance from us, mending a net. Tammy Bright! he shouted at the top of his voice. I hear ya! Tammy shouted back. When's the turn of the tide? In an hour's time. We both looked at our watches. "'We can go round by the coast, Mr. Franklin,' said Betridge, "'and get to the quicksand in that way, with plenty of time to spare. "'What do you say, sir?' "'Come along.' "'On our way to the shivering sand, I applied to Betridge "'to revive my memory of events, as affecting Rosanna Spearman "'at the period of Sergeant Cuff's inquiry. "'With my old friend's help, I soon had the succession of circumstances "'clearly registered again in my mind.' Rosanna's journey to Frizzing Hall, and the, when the whole household believed her to be ill in her own room, Rosanna's mysterious employment of the night-time, with her door locked and her candle burning till the morning, Rosanna's suspicious purchase of the japanned tin case and the two dogs' chains from Mrs. Yoland, the sergeant's positive conviction that Rosanna had hidden something at the shivering sand— and the sergeant's absolute ignorance as to what that something could be. All these strange results of the abortive inquiry into the loss of the moonstone were clearly present to me again when we reached the quicksand, and walked out together on the low ledge of rocks called the South Spit. With Betridge's help I soon stood in the right position to see the beacon and the Coast Guard flagstaff in a line together. Following the memorandum as our guide, we next laid my stick in the necessary direction, as neatly as we could, on the uneven surface of the rocks, and we then looked at our watches once more. It wanted nearly twenty minutes yet to the turn of the tide. I suggested wading through this interval on the beach instead of on the wet and slippery surface of the rocks. Having reached the dry sand, I prepared to sit down, and, greatly to my surprise, Betridge prepared to leave me. "'What are you going away for?' I asked. "'Look at the letter again, sir, and you will see.' A glance at the letter reminded me that I was charged, when I made my discovery, to make it alone. "'It's hard enough for me to leave you at such a time as this,' said Betridge. "'But she died a dreadful death, poor soul.' "'and I feel a kind of call on me, Mr. Franklin, "'to humour that fancy of hers. "'Besides,' he added, confidentially, "'there's nothing in the letter against your letting out the secret afterward. "'I'll hang about in the fir plantation and wait till you pick me up. "'Don't be longer than you can help, sir. "'The detective fever isn't an easy one to deal with under these circumstances.' "'With that parting caution he left me. "'The interval of expectation,' short as it was when reckoned by the measure of time, 
assumed formidable proportions when reckoned by the measure of suspense. This was one of the occasions on which the invaluable habit of smoking becomes especially precious and consolatory. I lit a cigar and sat down on the slope of the beach. The sunlight poured its unclouded beauty on every object that I could see. The exquisite freshness of the air made the mere act of living and breathing a luxury. Even the lonely little bay welcomed the morning with a show of cheerfulness, and the bared wet surface of the quicksand itself glittered with a golden brightness, hid the horror of its false brown face under a passing smile. It was the finest day I had seen since my return to England. The turn of the tide came before my cigar was finished. I saw the preliminary heaving of the sand, and then the awful shiver that crept over its surface, as if some spirit of terror lived and moved and shuddered in the fathomless depths beneath. I threw away my cigar and went back again to the rocks. My directions in the memorandum instructed me to feel along the line traced by the stick, beginning with the end which was nearest to the beacon. I advanced in this manner more than half way along the stick, without encountering anything but the edges of the rocks. An inch or two farther on, however, my patience was rewarded. In a narrow little fissure, just within reach of my forefinger, I felt the chain. Attempting next to follow it by touch in the direction of the quicksand, I found my progress stopped by a thick growth of seaweed, which had fastened itself into the fissure, no doubt, in the time that had elapsed since Rosanna Spearman had chosen her hiding place. It was equally impossible to pull the seaweed or to force my hand through it. After marking the spot indicated by the end of the stick which was placed nearest to the quicksand, I determined to pursue the search for the chain on a plan of my own. My idea was to sound immediately under the rocks, on the chance of recovering the lost trace of the chain at the point which it entered the sand. I took up the stick and knelt down on the brink of the south spit. In this position my face was within a few feet of the surface of the quicksand. The sight of it so near me, still deter disturbed at intervals by its hideous shivering fit, shook my nerves for the moment. A horrible fancy that the dead woman might appear on the scene of her suicide to assist my search, an unutterable dread of seeing her rise through the heaving surface of the sand and point to the place, forced itself into my mind and turned me cold in the warm sunlight. I own I closed my eyes at the moment when the point of the stick first entered the quickstand. The instant afterward, before the stick could have been submerged more than a few inches, I was free from the hold of my own superstitious terror, and was throbbing with excitement from head to foot, sounding blindfold at my first attempt. At that first attempt I had sounded right. The stick struck the chain. Taking a firm hold of the roots of the seaweed with my left hand, I laid myself down over the brink, and felt with my right hand under the overhanging edges of the rock. My right hand found the chain. I drew it up without the slightest difficulty, and there was the japanned tin case fastened to the end of it. The action of the water had so rusted the chain that it was impossible for me to unfasten it from the hasp which attached it to the case. Putting the case between my knees and exerting my utmost strength, I contrived to draw off the cover. Some white substance filled the whole interior when I looked in. I put my hand in and found it to be linen. In drawing out the linen, I also drew out a letter crumpled up with it. After looking at the direction, and discovering that it bore my name, I put the letter in my pocket and completely removed the linen. It came out in a thick roll, moulded, of course, to the shape of the case in which it had been so long confined, and perfectly preserved from any injury by the sea. I carried the linen to the dry sand of the beach, and there unrolled and smoothed it out. There was no mistaking it as an article of dress. It was a nightgown. The uppermost side, when I spread it out, presented to view innumerable folds and creases, and nothing more. I tried the undermost side next, and instantly discovered the smear of the paint from the door of Rachel's boudoir. My eyes remained riveted on the stain, and my mind took me back at a leap from present to past. The very words of Sergeant Cuff recurred to me, as if the man himself was at my side again, pointing to the unanswerable inference which he drew from the smear on the door. 
Find out whether there is any article of dress in this house with a stain of the paint on it. Find out who that dress belongs to. Find out how the person can account for having been in the room and smeared the paint between midnight and three in the morning. If the person can't satisfy you, you haven't far to look for the hand that took the diamond. One after another of those words travelled over my memory, repeating themselves again and again with a wearisome, mechanical reiteration. I was roused from what felt like a trance of many hours, from what was really, no doubt, the pause of a few moments only, by a voice calling to me. I looked up and saw that Bettridge's patience had failed him at last. He was just visible between the sand-hills, returning to the beach. The old man's appearance recalled me, the moment I perceived it, to my sense of present things, and reminded me that the inquiry which I had pursued thus far still remained incomplete. I had discovered the smear on the nightgown. To whom did the nightgown belong? My first impulse was to consult the letter in my pocket, the letter which I had found in the case. As I raised my hands to take it out, I remembered that there was a shorter way to discovery than this. The nightgown itself would reveal the truth, for, in all probability, the nightgown was marked with its owner's name. I took it up from the sand and looked for the mark. I found the mark and read, My own name! There were the familiar letters which told me that the nightgown was mine. I looked up from them. There was the sun. There were the glittering waters of the bay. There was old Bettridge advancing nearer and nearer to me. I looked again at the letters. My own name. Plainly confronting me. My own name. If time, pains, and money can do it, I will lay my hand on the thief who took the moonstone. I had left London with those words on my lips. I had penetrated the secret which the quicksand had kept from every other living creature, and, on the unanswerable evidence of the paint stain, I had discovered myself as the thief. End of part thirty four.